beautiful on the transition. Now it's on. And now. Microphone check. Hey, good morning, everyone who's already sitting down. Uh, thank you for being on time. Um, we love you very much. Um, if you are not sitting down yet, um, if you could start making your way, if you hear this announcement, if you could start making your way to the, to the stage um, and, and take a seat, uh, please do. Um, there are plenty of uh, seats here in the front and center, the prime seats, so please uh, do feel free to uh, fill in from the front. Um, Contrary to popular myth, uh, the kids who sit in the back are not the coolest kids in class. Learning is cool, kids. Um, I'll speak to you in a few. Good morning, Helsinki. Did somebody, no just, feedback. did somebody just say, woo? Thank you, one person. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a Thank conference you. in Finland, so we're not going to try to do the whole like... Oh my god, everyone get up, let's do some squats. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Kenzie Dodds. Let's do squats at 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, no, uh, hey. Uh, Brief round of introductions, everyone. Uh, my name is Jani. I'm a local hometown boy here in Finland. I'm coming from London because they couldn't find any Finnish people who were willing to stand on stage and speak to a microphone. My, my name is Sarah. I'm originally from Portugal and I live in Berlin because we all move away. Portuguese people are like cockroaches.
Yes, um, I will be your morning host and Sarah will be your afternoon host. Which I do think it says a lot about our cultures in general. I think so. Um, you know, getting a Portuguese person out of bed at this early is uh, a miracle, I would say. I Please give me more coffee. Yes. And then there's you. Um, let's start a round of introduction uh, from that. Could you come to the microphone and uh, say your name? No, I'm We're I'm kidding, all, we're I, kidding. I, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, I mean, unless you want to. Yes. Uh, but no, let's do a quick round of introduction. Can we have a, a show of hands here? Who is from Finland? Great. Um, so now if you, no, 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 please, please keep your hand up if you're from Finland. Now if you're not from Finland, uh, please uh, look around and see somebody who is holding their hand up and during the break, uh, go talk to them. Uh, Finnish people love it when you go uh, talk to them. Stand as close to them as humanly possible. Yes, uh, yeah, just really in their face. Like this. Yes. Um, uh, but yes, and, uh, and, and hands up who's not from, uh, not from Finland. Um, but please yell where you're from, everyone at the same time. Yes, three, two, one, go! I heard Sweden and I think I heard you, and you doesn't count as a country. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, welcome. Uh, how many of you who come from elsewhere got their travel and, and hotels paid by the employer? Uh, Great. Is, Good is that, job. Is that still the, the same employer from like two years ago from, you know, before pandemic? Did they pay you and then you quit and now you're here just uh, using past learning budget? Because that's what I would do. Um, I think, I don't think that's really possible. It's been three years. Oh. But yeah, it's a completely different world now. It is a completely different world. Yeah. Now. Oh. Weird. Oh, speaking of a different world, um, you know, there are, if anybody is, is uh, it feels more comfortable, um, there are masks and hand sanitizer there by the entrance or to the main stage, so please do uh, feel free to avail yourself of them. Also, if you want to use your computer, there are some tables at the bottom that have some power plugs if you want to use your computer or need for some reason. Nice. Um, if you're wondering why are these people speaking so much, we were told to uh, kill a little bit of time while people are Oh yeah. So now we tell you where we were born in the story of our lives. Yes. Uh, but no, um, we just did two days of workshops, uh, they were incredible. And you missed them if you didn't go. Um, and next year you have an opportunity to do them again. Um, learning is cool, kids. Um, we will have two days of incredible content um, to justify that learning budget use. Uh, 25 speakers. Um, I heard someone laugh. Yes, no, I know. That person is probably the same person who said We're They're probably earlier. from Portugal or Spain or something. Yes, no, I love you whoever you are. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 25 speakers over two days. Um, it's going to be uh, hopefully an, an incredible two days. Um, all this the is, yeah, everything is here, so you're in the right place. There's no other track, everything is in this arena yes. of knowledge. Exactly. So on the next break, uh, grab a coffee, sit your ass down, and Please uh, grab just, a coffee. Uh, you know, it's, uh, in, in Finland, we have this term called Kalavasul Keset. Um, Beautiful language. If, if you don't know what that term means, it's, uh, we don't have enough time to explain it. But, uh, Please do. No, we actually do have enough time, that's the issue. Um, I don't know how to translate that. Okay, but, well, continue. Uh, anyways. Um, so yeah, everything is here. If you're not in this room, you're currently in the wrong place and you should be coming in um, pronto. Um, all of our sessions will have a theme. Um, here are the, the themes. So we basically try to build upon sort of like a speaker's knowledge so you get like a holistic and a little bit more broader holistic, view. Holistic, wow. Holistic. What a fancy boy. I know. Um, you are now in the opening sessions. You can see all the other sessions over there. Um, you know, we had to shoehorn a couple of uh, talks into session titles that don't quite 100% fit. So uh, if a title of a session is not um, exactly to uh, your your interest, please check out the spe talks anyway because there might be some other things sprinkled. Yes, also in. please come. That would be nice. You're that already would, here. Exactly. You already paid for it. Yeah. It's also raining outside. It's sad. Yes. Oh, uh, the, the weather. Yes. So there will be no Q&A after the talks, but there will be a Q&A room that the speakers will be in in the break. So from each section, speakers will be in the Q&A room. I don't know where the Q&A room is, actually. Where is the Q&A room? I believe the Q&A room is third floor. Yeah, third floor. Third so. floor, Q&A room. So if you want to ask questions, you can go there. I would say that please go, like as a speaker, there's nothing more awkward than just standing there waiting for someone to come talk to you. Yeah, and if you don't have any questions, just go and give them a high five or, yeah. you know. Just tell, tell them, them their talk was great. If you didn't like it, don't tell them that. But if you liked it, just go there and tell them their talk was great. Exactly. Oh, talk by about the way, the is it three or three and a half floor? <laughs> the organizer doesn't know. Um, just keep walking up until you see the Q&A room. Yeah, until you see a huge line of people. <laughs> exactly. If you find yourself on the roof, do not keep going any further. Yes, also make sure it's not a bathroom. Yes. 
Um, then we have, of course, the unofficial hallway track, which is everything that happens in the hallways, because the, you know... The, the friends we make. The friends we make are... Along the, the hallway. Yes. Um, so we have this floor over here, and then we have the three and a half floor, so basically like, uh, you know, two floors up. Um, so on the breaks, you won't all fit into this space over here, so please do go up. And then, you know, during the lunch break, we will also have the cafeteria one floor um, down. There is another conference going on in the first floor, so don't go there unless you are sick of uh, talking about JavaScript and you want to talk about whatever they're talking about, in which case, please go crash their party. Um, yes. I don't think they have any food, though. I think they yes. only have coffee. Oh, and uh, also, go speak to the sponsors. Uh, the sponsor booths are, are all over the, the floors that we have. Um, we would like to thank our generous sponsors, our gold sponsors, Relics, our silver sponsors, uh, Elisa, Nitor, Gofor, and Supermetrics. And last but definitely not least, our bronze level sponsors, Moon Highway, Alma, Huva, Knowit, Utopia, and Solita. Um, thank you so much for these companies for particip participating. Um, you know, they keep the tickets affordable and these events happening. They keep the lights on, literally. Exactly, thank you. Um, and also, I, I haven't spoken to all of them, but I think they're all hiring, so, uh, you know, go, go. Speak Why would they them. be here if they weren't? That's true. Maybe they were hiring when they bought the sponsorship and now... Uh, that was three years ago, yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, it'll be awkward for them. Yeah. Um, uh, so there are two after parties. Unfortunately, the one today is already sold out. So if you didn't sign up, I'm very sorry. There will be like unofficial... No, I mean, they are unofficial. I don't know why I did quotes. Unofficial after parties that you can join the Slack. We'll tell you, we'll tell you where the Slack, you can find it, that you can do today. And there will be an after party tomorrow, which is the big conference after party, which everyone is very excited about. Yes. Two after parties. Yes, that, that'll, be in, uh, that'll be downtown Helsinki. And yeah, um, the, the official after parties, we, you know, unofficial after parties uh, will be posted on Slack now, but then there might also be new ones that get posted, so keep your eye out on yeah. the conference Slack. Um, and yeah, if you're in the party, or if you're uh, in, uh, in the hallway track and you don't know how to, how to um, you know, uh, approach a fin, um, you can always just talk about the weather. Um, we've been very lucky this weekend uh, with weather, or this week with weather, uh, in that we actually have something to talk about. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter. You can just... Though I do feel like that also works for everyone. Like, you can get to anyone and be like, this weather. Um, wait, is that universal? Yeah, that's universal. Uh, wait, does everybody also like coffee? No. Oh, okay, cool. Just, just the weather. Just the weather. Just the weather. Great. Um, have we killed enough time now? Do we? Do I have no idea. Okay, he's uh, gone now. The organizer is gone. We can do whatever we want. Okay. Wait. The bot. Oh, he's here. Okay. <laughs> four more minutes. <laughs> oh, I do. We do have another thing to say. So today and tomorrow there will be someone live drawing the talks, which is very impressive. I cannot pronounce their names, and I'm not going to try. Uh, but we will have someone drawing the talks, and if you're a speaker, you will be. Yeah, she's right there. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you know how to say her name? Uh, I know that her first name is Salla, and I know she has a very Finnish last name that I just forgot. Oh, I thought that the first and the last were all the first one. That's why I got so confused. So I, I can say Salla. Yeah. That's not too bad. There's a Liverpool player with that name. I can, I can football. <laughs> Are you talking about Salla? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, when you're at the after parties or in the hallway track, uh, one really courteous thing to do, uh, you know, to, to let people sort of feel included uh, is to, you know, use the Pac-Man formation. So when you, you know, standing in a circle, uh, just chilling, uh, you know, maxing, uh, playing b -ball. Just doing the Finnish silence. Exactly. Just leave a little, uh, uh, you know, room in the group for the ghost to enter. For uh, someone to do the Finnish silence with you. Exactly. And speaking of being inclusive and courteous, we have a code of conduct. If you want to read it all, it's, you just Google Berlin Code of Conduct. Um, and if you don't want to read it all, the TLDR is please be nice, don't be an ass. Treat people with respect, that's basically it. If you have any sort of issues, please report it to Info at React Finland. Or please talk to anyone who's wearing an orange... Oh, orange lanyard. That's what I said, orange. Oh, I fucked up, not mine. Yeah, I forgot mine at the hotel. Uh, but yeah, you can also come to me. Yeah. But anyone who's wearing an orange lanyard, please talk to them if you have any sort of issues. Exactly. And just to be clear, uh, the Berlin Code of Conduct is different from the Berghain Code of Conduct. That is uh, not the same thing, um, just so that we're clear. Um, speaking of lanyards, uh, if anybody is wearing a bright red lanyard, uh, please be courteous and try to avoid taking photos of them. It's essentially a signal that they don't like to be posted on, on the internet or you know, have face recognizing algorithms. Um, steal their face data? Overlords. Over, overlords. The overlords of Facebook. Yes. 
Um, so Made up. yeah, so if you do take a photo and you're looking at it, go, oh, this is the best photo I ever took. But then there's uh, a red lanyard on it. Uh, you know, try to blur their face or make them unrecognizable. Otherwise. Um, but if you don't see a red line here in the photo, please do post. Um, we are equally a party to the, to the nefarious machinery of, of internet content creation. So, you know, you can use the hashtag React Finland um, to, to post on, on, on Twitter. But everything, anything really. Anything really. If you want to write hashtag React Finland on your notebook where you take your notes, uh, I think that's also... A, that's adorable though. That's adorable. And say me and the heart and React Finland. Exactly. In fact, if you do that, I think you need to get offline more. I, you know, <laughs> just go outside. Um, Not now. The weather's quite crap. Right. And uh, yeah. The you, Slack, we promised you. Mm. So if you go on the website, you can find the Slack on the top right. Sorry, I, I switch right and left. And incredibly enough, I have a car license. You feel safe now. On the right, so you can join the Slack now there, and there will be info about the after party, and there will also be like you know other people and uh, chit chat. Nice. And uh, oh yeah, that was the end of our slideshow. Uh, anything that we didn't uh, mention right now, you can go to react-finland.fi. That has the day's program. That has all the information that we just gave you. We were just killing time, honestly. Here. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. I believe our, our our union mandated four minutes have now been uh, fulfilled. Our contract is up. We did it. We did it. And we okay. we will get lunch and cake just like the rest of you, having done our jobs now. Yes. Yes. We're free. Great. Uh, so Sarah, I bid the farewell until the afternoon. Thank you, sir. Um, get everybody give an applause to Sarah Vieira. <laughs> Great. Um, now I will invite our first uh, speaker, our keynote speaker, Jen Luker, to start setting up um, her laptop. Um, and while I do that, um, I, I did earlier tr make a joke about that we don't do any forced participation. Um, you know, that was not true. That was a lie. Um, I think one thing that is very important uh, for, you know, our speakers is to feel supported. You know, the speakers feed off of the audience's energy. Um, so, you know, just things like, you know, smiling, nodding, eye contact are good, but also a big applause in the beginning. So before um, I introduce Jen, can we just, can you just do like um, what you would consider like level five out of ten applause? Good. Can we bring that up a little bit to like six, seven? Good. At like level eight, I would expect some hooting and hollering maybe. Can we, can we do level eight? Can we go up, up, up? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, great, great, great. And can we do level nine? Okay, and bring it down to, okay, great. Thank you. You're ready. Um, you know what to do soon when, when I introduce Jen. Um, Jen, you're good? Great. So Jen is an engineering manager extraordinaire at NAV. Uh, she's traveled all the way from the United States to speak with us. Um, Jen is also, uh, personally for me, one of my favorite people. I used to work with Jen at Formidable um, way back when. And uh, honestly, I think you're in for a deep and thoughtful and meaningful session that hopefully will prepare you for all of the other great content that we will have today. So now let's all give a level 10 hooting and hollering, foot stomping, big finish hello to uh, Jen Loker. Good morning, everyone. Who is actually awake? All right, about half of you. I'm not sure this is gonna help you wake up any further, but we'll do the best we can. So, Kintsuki, stained glass, lotus flowers, and clocks. WTF, does this have anything to do with tech or you? Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, mostly what we're gonna be covering today is a lot of my life philosophies and some of my favorite conversation topics to share. Uh, this is how I've survived my very far too many engineering years, especially as a woman in tech in a male-dominated field. So hopefully you can get some gems out of this, and if not, we can have a grand argument later. You will never influence the world by being just like it. As an engineering manager and a hiring manager, I can hire any web dev. We stamp them out day in, day out, one after another, and you have the opportunity of being just like everyone else. But why would I hire you? 
if I can have anyone, why you? As we go through life, as we go through our education, our careers, we have stumbles, we have segues, we have times when we got lost, we have times when we got found, we got times when we found ourselves, we got times where we burnt out, we were exhausted, that project sucked, I had a really hard time with it, and now I have a phobia of, you know, photo submissions on every form whatsoever. Time zones, anyone? So in this case, you may not be broken, but at this point you may be just a little chipped. You've had some of those bumps, those scrapes, those problems, but for the most part, you're still a web dev, doing what everyone else does. We build forms for a living. But what happens when you break? What happens when you stumble so hard you question whether you should still be doing this? What happens if you had that weird stint where you were a Java developer? When it comes to Kintsuki, the beauty of it is that all of this pottery comes out of that factory, out of that shop. They all look the same, give or take. And yes, as we use them, they may get dropped, they may get chipped, they may get a little broken. But in the end, it's that brokenness that gives it history. It's those segues, those stumbles, those frustrations, learning why we have best practices, because you did it all of the wrong ways. Having someone frustratingly look at you who you didn't know was colorblind and tell you that the website you just developed was completely useless to them. And you question yourself. Those struggles become your story. And that's the beauty of Kintsuki. As we glue those pieces together with gold, as we learn from each of those situations, you become not just more beautiful, but also stronger. And that's why I hire you. It's not because you're like everyone else. It's because you've seen some shit. It's because you've been through things, you've learned, you've grown, you've developed. You have skills that the rest of my team doesn't. So not only am I hiring a web dev, but I'm hiring someone to make the rest of the team better. And it is not your sameness that makes you awesome. It's your brokenness and how you've put yourself back together. So that brings us to Lotus Flowers. A lotus flower grows in mud and muck. It is not naturally prone to grow in pristine, beautiful waters like we normally see it in ponds. The mud represents our suffering and pain and delusions, but there's an even deeper metaphor here. In pure water, a lotus flower will not grow it is in the mud that the nutrients are found. So again, you have this grimy, mucky water that life barely survives in. And a lotus flower plants itself and grows. And above this muck, this pristine white flower blooms. If it were not for this muck, it'd be like, I don't know, a daisy somewhere else. But because of the backdrop and the fact that you've bloomed into this pristine white flower on this awful, gross location, it makes you more beautiful. But you're not beautiful in spite of the mud and the muck. You're beautiful because of it. 
you wouldn't have grown here otherwise. So maybe where you came from, rough childhood, remote country, made all of the mistakes in high school, It's not just the technical diversity that matters, it's also the life that you've lived, the hard knocks you've been through. It makes you resilient. It means you can pick yourself up. You can put the pieces back together. You can fight through that really crappy project. You're willing to help your coworkers when they're having a rough time. You can relate. So when we say bring your whole self to work, which always seems to sound like lip service. We genuinely mean it. It's who you are as a person, not just who you are as an engineer, that again makes you valuable, makes you beautiful, makes you important, makes it why I hire you, why I believe in you, why I support you and mentor you, and give you the leeway you need when things are not going well. Because in the end, we are all people, and all problems that we deal with are people problems. Even the deep technical engineering ones that we fight with, where we're like going really deep into you know, coding for the coding, for the coding, for the transpiler, for the compiler, for the, you know, all the way down to binary. We're all still doing it in order to make it easier for people. Code is a solution to a problem, a people problem. The other fascinating thing about lotus flowers is that they purify the water around it. They make it habitable. They clear the muck, they clear the mud, they solidify the ground so the mud is not in the water, it's in the surface of the ground. Eventually, fish come. And these lotus flowers have these big fronds that protect them from the sun. So even in the dark muck where they used to live, they're now protected and in pristine water. So sometimes when good things are not happening around you, Perhaps you are the good that's supposed to be happening. Perhaps it's you that's going to influence someone else to survive another day, to fight through another problem, to avoid burnout, to prevent another chip or break. Because though Kintsuki may be beautiful, at some point, there's nothing left to glue together. Stained glass. People are like stained glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out, but when the darkness sets in, their true beauty is revealed only if there is light from within. So yes, again, we're dealing with a situation of brokenness. A window has broken. Or you really like being on the bleeding edge of technology, and we all know that when you're on the bleeding edge, you are the one that's bleeding. So we could either sweep it all up, toss it in the bin, and be on our merry way. Or you can look at this and realize that yes, we have bled because we've cut ourselves on the bleeding edge of technology and it really hurt, but we learned something new and we furthered tech as it stands. And realize that it has stained the glass. Our perspective has changed because of that experience. We now see it through red colored glasses or green, or blue, or yellow, 
because as we've cut ourselves, we've realized we can stain glass. So now we bring in our other experiences, our hobbies, our walks in the forest, that really good food we had yesterday. Inspiration for how the technology can grow and evolve, how it should look, how it should be interacted with and used, can come from anywhere. Sometimes it takes getting away from the computer and away from the code to finally get that inspiration. In World War II, uh, they tried to hire doctoral level women from colleges, specifically in math and sciences, to be cryptographers. And they found that it was not the doctoral students that made the best cryptographers. It was the elementary school teachers and the knitters and the quilters. It was those that had the hobbies outside of the world, outside of their domain, that made the best cryptographers. And sometimes it was very genuinely because they were adaptable or because they brought their own hobbies into their thought processes as they were looking at cryptography. And it changed their view. So as you're growing, as you're improving yourselves as engineers, don't forget that again, you are a whole person with other things that happen in your lives. And those other parts of your life can very well be what makes the difference between a good product and a bad one. It could be the difference between whether the next engineer has to fight really hard with that cryptic tech that you just wrote, or if you documented it, because documentation is a love letter to your future self. When we dim our light to make others feel more comfortable, the whole world gets darker. Sometimes we're in a room and everyone is talking about something and you don't quite get it or it's something you haven't had time to research. And that's when the imposter syndrome starts to set in. And you're starting to wonder, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to say? How do I have to ask a question? I have to interact somehow. I have to sound smart so that people will accept me. And that's you dimming your own light. That's you forgetting the fact that we are all overlapping Venn diagrams and we all have portions that are different than other people, that do not overlap. And just because the people in this room have a common thing that they're discussing doesn't change the fact that you still belong in that room. And in fact, those other perspectives, those other tech that you have experience in, those other experiences as a whole, can still have an impact on that room. It's just that you'll be bringing outside the Venn diagram parts inside to where everyone else just happens to be overlapping. To use Instagram as an example, we have this perfect pretty picture and it is our natural inclination to look at this perfect pretty picture of their living room and compare it to our back room that's piled with boxes and the kids toys and the 13th hobby that you know, you finally chucked in that room because it doesn't fit in your office anymore. So we're looking at their perfectness and, ex and comparing it to what we think of as our deepest flaws. When in all reality, if you just zoom out from that photo, you'd realize that they just managed to like scoot their lives just outside the photo. And you've got a kid hanging upside down from the ceiling somehow on the side. And you've got like SpaghettiOs on the wall. So just remember that in the end, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to anyone else. If you have to compare at all, compare today's self to yesterday's self. 
What have you learned? How have you grown? How have you become better? How have you become worse? And do you still want to continue on that path? The way we think about things is the way we feel about things, is the way we act about things, reinforces the way we think about things. I have this awful project that's coming up. It's gonna be a pain, it's gonna be really hard. I'm gonna to have to stay up late to make deadlines that I didn't get to set. It's gonna suck. How do you feel about this thing? How do you feel about this project now? Do you feel kind of grimy, really hesitant? Knot in your stomach, heart's a little too full, chest is tight. So how are you going to act about this thing feeling this way? You're going to begrudgingly do this thing. You're gonna force your way through it. You're gonna hit that screw with a hammer as hard as you can to try to make it work. And when you're all done with this project, the next project, you know it's gonna suck because you just experienced the fact that it sucked. I have a project. It's going to be a challenge. Conveniently, I have a coworker who has some experience in this area, not as much as would be nice, but I bet if we put our two heads together, we can figure it out. I haven't had a chance to work with them very much, so this should be fun. Now, how do you feel about that project? Curious? Kind of excited to hang out with your friend? Ready to fight through that problem together? So how do you act? Go tap that friend on the shoulder and be like, hey, I got a problem got to work through. And you put your two heads together and you fight and you argue and you discover something new and you learn, both of you. and you get it done. And now you have a new project. How do you feel about it? You just got to bond with a coworker. You solved cool problems. You learned new things. That's only going to reinforce the fact that this next project could be the same. Life is what our thoughts make it. The way we think about things is the way we feel about things is the way we act about things reinforces the way we think about things. We've all gone through these cycles. Some have gone well, some have gone poorly. Sometimes, no matter how much of a positive attitude you have, some of it really does suck. But are you going to let that disappointing, frustrating, exhausting moment ruin the rest of the project? Are you going to let that dictate the rest of your career? There are times when people give us feedback, advice, recommendations, <clears throat> and they can hurt. They can be very blunt, they can be direct, they can be cutting, and oftentimes they're not meant to be. It's just that they didn't give you the feedback in the way that you would prefer to receive it. So you can either look at this as they were mean and insulting, 
or you could look at this as they probably had the best of intentions and even if they didn't, it doesn't matter, I'm going to take it that way. The very best advice I was ever given. <clears throat> when someone gives you advice, nod, smile, say you'll consider it, and then do whatever you're going to do anyway. That advice could be good advice and you could take it. That advice could be bad advice and you could know the split second someone says it that it's bad advice. But telling them that you will consider it, that you'll just think about it. You'll mull it over for even that split second. Is usually enough to make them feel validated and also to allow you the room to make your own decision. So even if someone gave you feedback that was harsh, that you didn't think was fair, you don't have to take it, but you can think about it. You can decide whether they were right or not, because we are so stuck in our own minds and our own perspectives and our own views that it can be difficult to step out of that and see it from that different perspective. So don't discredit everything immediately just because of the way that it was delivered. Take a moment, think about it, sleep on it, come back tomorrow. You may find that it was good advice, or you may find that they had a bad day and you just happened to be in their path. I didn't mention tarot cards were also part of this talk. The tarot card of the Wheel of Fortune is near and very, very dear to my heart. And if you look at it, it's because you've got a queen at the top of that. And then you have the part where you're kind of going down, things are going wrong. And then you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. And then you're on your way up. Things are getting better. No matter what, this wheel always, always, always turns. Sometimes it turns in five minutes. Sometimes it turns in five years. But it never stops turning. Even at your worst, at the absolute rock bottom, there will always have a point where it goes up. Everything always works out in the end. If it hasn't worked out, it's not the end. And it may not work out the way that you wanted it to, intended to, planned to, but it does work out. So when I look at this, I actually think less of a wheel and more like a clock. And the reason I like the clock is because it has numbers. And it has hands that point to the top. On your way down, rock bottom, on your way up. And you can think about yourself this way. How are you as a whole person? Where are you sitting on this giant scale of a clock? Are you sitting at the top of the world and everything is great right now? Feeling good about yourself? doesn't necessarily mean you've got like the giant head and ego. It just means you're feeling good about yourself. So taking into account the fact that you've got the top of the world, nothing stays great forever, rock bottom, and then things are getting better on this clock, we can go deeper than that. Because you as a whole person are still made up of many different parts. We have the gears inside. So let's pretend for a moment that these gears also have clock faces. And each one of these gears, we'll say the three largest ones, represent the three largest influences on your life. Like your family, your career, your hobbies, your friends. 
whatever, all your enemies. You could be at 12 o'clock on family and at 6 o'clock at your career and at 9 o'clock on all your enemies. So where does that put you? Maybe at 10? Because maybe your family clock is larger than the rest and therefore how your family is doing matters more to you as a whole than the rest. And again, each of these gears spins individually and can interact. So your career gear could spin far more quickly than your family gear because maybe your family is more stable or your career is more stable and things aren't going that great at home because your kid is teething and your other kid is sick. So you can break down these gears and look at the individual pieces, like parents, siblings, children, spouse, extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, nieces, nephews. And you notice that the extended gear is touching both family and all my enemies. Great Uncle Fred, am I right? And on the career side, you've got coworkers, projects, your boss. And again, projects is touching both family and career because when you're at home, perhaps you're still thinking about the project. Perhaps you're still trying to fight through that problem and it's making you irritable and respond poorly to, again, the whining or the dog that just really wants to go for a walk and you just need this other line of code. You just want to solve one more bug. But these interact with these larger gears. You can break them down and figure out where you are on each one of these. Maybe the dog is sleeping. And so is the baby. And you're getting a lot done. So your project's doing great. But you really don't like your boss. They just did something really crappy. Maybe they gave you that advice or critique in a way that you didn't like. So understanding where each of these gears are in your life. Where they influence each other can be cool. And you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, that's nice and that's philosophical and how does that actually apply to me? <clears throat> Here's the deal. Say that your family, again, is doing great, but work is not doing so well. When it comes to the great balance that we're all trying to obtain in our work life experiences, this is a great time to say, you know what, maybe I could slack off a little bit on putting forth a huge amount of energy on my family because it's doing well and it's stable right now. I'm gonna put more of my energy into work. Or maybe work is going well, the project is going fine, you're working with a coworker, problems are being solved, you know they've got this handled. But you really need to be at home taking care of your family or your best friend just had something happen to them and you really need to invest that energy there. It's okay to step away from work a little bit, to slack off a little bit there because you have the ability to understand where your priorities are in your life. And you know, you've got your coworkers gear. That gear can break down into more gears of each individual coworker. Maybe you have three bosses of varying importance. Maybe that knitting project that never ends has a body, a front, a left side or right side, the collar, left sleeve, right sleeve, right cuff, left cuff. Like you could break that down pretty far. So it can it can very much go all the way down that fractal rabbit hole. But I say start with just understanding where your clock face is at. And once you understand that, 
and kind of gauge where you are and recognize that when you're at rock bottom, things will always go up. And when you're at the top, to stock up, store that energy, save those memories. Because though nothing may stay perfect forever, it doesn't discount that experience. Enjoy it a little bit longer while it's there, knowing that it won't last forever, but it will come around again. And then look at the three largest gears. Just start there. And in the end, through Kintsuki, through lotus flowers, through stained glass, through a very hint of a tarot, two clocks, I hope you can see your world in a new light. Thank you. Jen, can I give you a hug? Thank you, Jen. Um, Nicola, would you like to come and sit up here while, um, while I introduce you? I've been, I've been doing software engineering for something like 20 years, and if I had known half of that, half that time ago, I think both my career and my life would have been a lot happier. Um, so, Jen, that was truly, uh, truly incredible. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we have Nicola Corti. Um, Nicola is a longtime Kotlin engineer. He's an open source contributor. Um, he's a uh, podcaster, a runner, a baker. Uh, but uh, the way that he wanted to be introduced is just one of the many clever people who work on React Native at Meta. Um, and Nicola, are you ready? All right, everyone give it up for Nicola Corti. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming on stage. And uh, well, it's really hard to give a talk uh, just after this amazing keynote. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna deep dive a little bit more on the technical side of things. I also want to ask you, how many of you in the audience are actually using React Native, Expo, or doing any kind of mobile development? Not many. Uh, so well, um, today we're going to talk about bringing the new React Native architecture to the open source community. And as many of you haven't touched React Native, um, I hope you will still find um, interesting to know what we at Meta have been working on on the native side of things as far as it concerns React. Uh, mandatory slide about myself. Uh, my name is Nicola Corti. Uh, I'm an Android engineer on the React Native team. And you can find me online as Cortinico on Twitter and on GitHub. So um, for those of you who are not working on React Native, you might have, I don't know, read on some newsletter or on the buzz online uh, that there's this thing called the React Native new architecture. And you might wonder, what is it? Like, what is this thing? Like, well, it has new in the name, so it's definitely something that we are releasing. We worked a lot on that. And especially, like, if you go on YouTube and search React Native New Architecture, you will find quite some content. A lot of talk. Uh, specifically, I want to point out those. The first one is from React Conf in 2018. So, well, we use the word new, but is not that new. Like, we actually started working on a re-architecture of React Native uh, early in 2018. And the things kept on evolving. Uh, it took us quite some time to fully roll it out. And my colleague Joshua, last year at React Native EU, gave a talk, uh, which is also quite interesting, on how we rolled out such a critical refactoring of React Native internally. And yeah, as you notice from the years, a lot of time has passed. So let me tell you a little bit about the timeline of this re-architecture of React Native. We started in 2018, and we initially thought this would have been just a six-month 
kind of work. You know, just find the engineers, tweak a couple of things in the internals. Uh, but yeah, that's not the case. And specifically at our scale, uh, running an application like the Facebook app or other major applications where React Native and React are used so extensively that you, trust me, you will find every possible edge case. Also, product engineers have been squeezing every possible performance gain out of React Native, which made it really hard for us to you know, sort of change the engine while the plane was flying. But so here we are. End of 2021, the new architecture of React Native has been fully rolled out on uh, the Facebook app. And now what's next? Well, we don't want to take this for us. At Meta, we are highly committed to open source and releasing our technology to the broader community, as we're doing with React, PyTorch, React Native, and other popular libraries. So then we looked outside, and we said, like, how can we let the people outside of this company use this technology? I mean, it, technically, it was already on main, so you could use it, but we wanted to make it easier for people outside at Meta to use it. So let's see how we did it. But let's do one step back. And again, as I don't have many React Native engineers in the, in the room, you might wonder why. Like, why we even did this, this work. And if you know a little bit about, about React Native, you probably know what the bridge is. It's a component which is part of the old React Native architecture, which is responsible of doing a lot of uh, JSON communication between the JavaScript layer and the platform layer. We wanted to get rid of it, because a lot of the performance uh, drawback of React Native are caused by this component. Moreover, historically, React Native for Android and for iOS were born as two different projects. And we took a stance to rewrite a lot of the internals using um, shared language, which in this case is C++. This allowed, this allowed us to tweak and fix a lot of the differences in the rendering between the two platforms. And also, now we can finally share platform-specific optimizations. For example, we used to have some optimizations only on Android that could not be shared on iOS because we would have had to rewrite them from scratch. We also took a stance, and uh, one of the concerns that engineers reported over and over is the lack of type safety. So we introduced a new component called the CodeGen, which allows us to generate code starting from a specification that the developers provide. And this code is ta has type safety all, uh, on, 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 all the, on all the layers. And also, this uh, opened the door for a lot of new capabilities that will be built on top of the new render and the new architecture of React Native. So when I talk about the new architecture, I'm actually talking about a collection of components, which in the documentation we call pillars. So just working through those pillars, um, the first one that you will find referred over and over in the docs is the new render, codenamed Fabric. Then we also took a stance of rewriting a bit the native module system, so the mechanism that allows you to go from JavaScript to call platform-specific API of the host platform where you're running. The new native module system is called the Turbo Module. As I said before, we also took a stance and uh, we wanted to give type safety to our new, new model. So we implemented the CodeGen, which takes care of getting a spec file and input and producing uh, output which is meaningful for the platform. And finally, we have a last pillar, which is the bridgeless mode. Once everything is in place and you have all of your components and module on the new architecture, you can finally get rid of the bridge that we still keep for backward compatibility, like you might have libraries which are still not uh, migrated to the new architecture. But once everything is all together, you can finally turn off the bridge. So to let you touch, a little bit on how we envision this new architecture to look like, I want to deep dive on a little bit of code for the code gen. So the way how we think this whole mechanism will work is, as I said, the developer will give us a spec file. 
In this case, uh, we have uh, a, like just an interface with a function, which is answer the ultimate question, uh, which has an input, a string, uh, and returns a number. And the developer will just register this, uh, this module. The crucial part is here. Like, we have an information about like, uh, like a method, an intent. So here we're saying that we want to create something that both on Android and, in, and on iOS is able to answer the ultimate question. So the code gen will go from here and will generate a lot of boilerplate code that historically developers had to write manually. So on Android, it means that we will effectively create a Java abstract class with constructors and everything needed and an abstract method that the developer has to implement. So in this case, this is just, uh, again, answer the ultimate question, takes an input a string, and returns a Java double. For iOS, the thing is equivalent. We uh, do generate an Objective-C um, protocol. In this case, it's obviously typed with the types that are specific to the platform. So again, answer the ultimate question, which takes an NS string and returns an NS number. So with the new architecture, and working across different platforms, things are a little bit more complicated than just web. I always like joke with my colleagues on React because for them it's super easy. Like you just run on the browser. For us, it's quite more complicated. We need to we need to compile Java. We need to compile Kotlin. We need to compile C++. We need to compile Objective C. And there is the whole thing of JavaScript on top of it. So we had to ship a lot of changes to our build pipeline. Specifically, there is also another subtle difference because internally at Meta, we use Buck for building everything. While we can't expect that React Native engineers outside of Meta will use Buck for everything, you might want to use your own build system. Specifically, in open source, we want to make sure you can use the platform specific build tool. That means that on Android, you should be able to use Gradle. We built tooling on top of it, and we exposed uh, CMake files to let you build C++ files. For Java and Kotlin files, we extended our React Native um, Gradle configuration, providing a React Native Gradle plugin, which is going to be the entry point for all the uh, React Native logic, and is going to replace the old React.Gradle file we used to have uh, that grew quite, quite a lot and became like unmaintainable. For iOS, similarly, we spent a lot of time building custom CocoaPods logic. So on React Native iOS, you will integrate everything with CocoaPods, and now there are like custom Ruby scripts that takes care of uh, implementing the new architecture for you. I also want to talk a little bit about a couple of other changes that we're shipping with the new architecture, uh, which is uh, first, Hermes. Uh, Hermes is our in-house JavaScript engine. And historically, uh, well, while it worked very well for us internally, it was a bit harder to use externally. So as we are shipping a lot of changes, we thought like, hey, how about we make things easier to use and uh, more like connected each other so that they don't uh, break when they interact. So Hermes is currently the recommended engine for the new architecture. So when you find the, the documentation for the new architecture, you will find Hermes uh, is the recommended engine, please use it. Also, we shipped a change called the bundled Hermes. So since React Native 69, every version of React Native comes with its own JavaScript engine that we built for you. And we sort of uh, crafted it at the same time when we crafted the React Native version. So we know that the two engines are compatible with each other. And starting from React Native 070, Hermes is also the default engine for React Native. So all the new projects have been, uh, that you will create with the React Native CLI will contain the Hermes engine enabled. The Hermes team has been put a lot of effort on improving the engine and is also quite responsive on user feedback. So if, you're, if this doesn't work for your project, drop us a message. Um, another topic which is quite hot in the mobile space is modern languages. And engineers from all over the places ask us to support uh, more languages and make sure that our um, API looks nice. So on, on the website, well, obviously, a lot of people want to use TypeScript. 
And when we released the first iteration of the new architecture docs, uh, the number one comment was, I don't want to use Flow to write my specs. Which I totally understand. Like, you might have a fully TypeScript project, and we can't ask you to just add Flow for one file for your spec files. So I'm happy to announce that since React Native 68, um, we release support for TypeScript in the code gen. So now you can write TypeScript all over the places. Also, there is an ongoing effort for uh, providing better maintenance of our TypeScript types in React Native. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, we will have more to share on this side in the future. On the Android side of things, a lot of people have been asking us about Kotlin support. So luckily, thanks to how Kotlin is structured, uh, Kotlin is fully supported by React Native. You can write your Kotlin code, native Kotlin code, as you wish. Uh, but we wanted to make the documentation better. So we started a community effort to update our website to be bilingual. So now it's nearly completed, and I think 80% of the website fully is uh, translated to have examples in both Java and Kotlin. And you can expect the new app template to be updated to be in Kotlin, because we think that this is the way that the Android ecosystem will move forward, and we are going to follow this, this approach. On iOS, instead, well, number one requested language, obviously, is Swift. And here, well, sadly, the situation is a little bit more complicated due to interoperability between Swift and C++. Um, rest assured that we're looking into it. Um, but yeah, like, I don't have um, nothing to share on this point uh, at this stage. So let me tell you a little bit about timeline and versions. Uh, just to give you a, like, an idea of where we are and where we think we will go. So the, the first version of the new architecture was released in React Native 68, which was released beginning of this year. Uh, disclaimer, the new architecture is still considered experimental. We'll find banners on the website saying that we're serialing out, we are tweaking things, we are hearing your feedback, we want to know what does it work for you, what doesn't work for you. In 69, we shipped a lot of changes related to Hermes, as I said before. Plus, 69 is the first version of React Native which supports React 18. And I'm going to talk about React 18 a little bit more in the next slide. Then um, we, I think last week, we released React Native 70, which contains a lot of tooling uh, to help you use uh, the new architecture more uh, seamlessly. Specifically, Hermes as default, as I said before, but also auto linking for Android, which takes care of finding your Android uh, libraries and the linking on both the Java layer and the C layer. CMake support and unified code gen config. I will not deep dive too much into those, uh, those points. You will find them in the release notes for React Native 70. But those were highly requested features that will make the new architecture easier to adopt. On 71, there is a lot of work already lined up on main. And you can find it like if, if you just check the, the branch. But we are working really hard on simplifying the template. The number one concern after the TypeScript support uh, is that React Native engineers don't want to touch C++ code. And I can totally understand that. Like, no one probably wants to touch C++ code, unless you're doing something really like, you know, uh, hardcore. Uh, but yet, our architecture is written in C++, so we need to find a way to let you hook into this world. And we are working on simplifying the template as much as possible and streamline the C++ surface so that you will see only a couple of lines where you can register your libraries and do only the necessary configurations you need. And more to come, which is not landed on main yet. And I hope to, to have you know, opportunities to share that in the future. And what's beyond that? Well, to the infinity and beyond, I'm actually impressed by the amount of feedback we received from the community from 68 on. Like a lot of those changes have landed just because people shouted at us and said like, hey, this is not working. This, it's awesome, but let's make it more awesome. So I think this year and this time is awesome for people in the React community because 
we are hearing you so much. Like, we are here coming at conferences, doing AMAs, doing podcasts, whatever, online, just to hear what's in people's mind, what works and do what doesn't work for native. So, I mentioned I wanted to talk a little bit about, about React 18. So, I'm sure like a lot of you knows about React 18 then. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, new features uh, which are often referred as con concurrent React. And new APIs like use transition and so on. Uh, and while those are easy to use on web, we want to let people on mobile being able to use them as easily as on web. So a question that I get often asked is like, how do React and React Native interact each other? Like, who, which version can, can, can I bump? So React and React Native are, like, the, the versioning is tightly coupled. React Native ships with a version of React internally. So you can't just go in your package.json and bump the React version. Things will go wildly. So, um, and the versions are aligned in this way. If you are on React Native 68 or 67 or anything before that, you are essentially on React 17. We are hearing people that like they are on React Native 68 and they update React to 18 and nothing works. Or things works widely. Uh, that's not recommended. Like follow the version provided by React Native. If you want to use React 18, because now it's been out since a while and you want to try it, you want to use those new APIs and so on, you need to be on 69 on. So where is the catch here? The catch is those new APIs, like the old concurrent React set of features and start transition and so on, they work only if you have the new architecture enabled. If you are on 69 or 70, and you disable the new architecture, you are basically running in legacy mode. You are not, like, those APIs are empty for you. They will not have any effect. So it's crucial now that you start looking into the new architecture of React Native because you will lose the old React train that we keep on evolving. So please, if you have React Native application in, in your org, make sure, like, at least, bring them the voice that this thing is changing and they will have to look into the React Native new architecture sooner or later. Now, talking about docs and material, like how can you actually migrate and what we prepared for you. And, um, and yeah, like, I want to stress how like, docs are important for us. Like, it's, it's really all about the docs. Practically, the, the React Native architecture was available since React Native 64 or so, so like, quite a lot of time ago. And I remember hearing this podcast, like the React Native show, where uh, they, they shouted out to some libraries saying like, oh yeah, they're using the new architecture, how like, they use these new APIs, but there is no docs. Like, this new architecture is awesome, but if we don't explain to like, the, the whole community how to use it, it's basically useless. So that's why we spend a lot of time working on the official docs. You will find it on reactnative.dev in the new architecture section. We also have an entire new section called migrating to the new architecture, which has step-by-step -step migration guides and guides you on how to update your project. As we worked on this, we also took, uh, took quite some time to uh, update our internal documentation. You will find a new section called architecture which contains internal docs on how React Native works. For example, how the renderer works, uh, all the phases of our rendering pipeline, and so on. Uh, those kind of docs have been requested a lot by the community, and we never had the time to just write them and polish them. So now they're available. Please use them. They're more advanced, but people that work on the internals might find them useful. Uh, we worked on the new app template. As I said before, we're also trying to simplify that as much as possible. But the idea is that we envision the new app template as the entry point for the new architecture. So if you now in this audience want to try it, how would you do that? So with the React Native init command, you can just create a new project. And on iOS, the entry point is the pod install command. So we added a variable called new arc enabled one 
that allows you to enable the new architecture. And this will essentially set up your project to fully work with the new architecture. You can just run it with run iOS, as you will do normally. On Android, similar thing. We do have a file called Gradle Properties, which contain a similar variable, new arc enabled. It's set by default to false. So again, as I said before, new architecture is not enabled by default. We are still evaluating it. We are collecting feedback. We will turn it on at a certain point in the future. Uh, so you just change it to true, and you can run it with uh, run Android. When you run it, Metro, our bundler, will tell you on the console that things is running with fabric true and concurrent root set to true. So you have all the power of React 18 uh, on your engine then. Um, other initiatives that we worked on. First, the new architecture working group. So from the experience of the React 18 working group, we started the, a similar working group, which is like a discussion only GitHub repository where you can jump on and uh, share your ideas, ask questions, share your libraries, say if you're migrating to the new architecture, or directly just ask us questions. It's divided in sections uh, where, like, again, you can find uh, information about docs and so on. Uh, this uh, group is closed, uh, although we are accepting applications. So there is a link in, in the home page. You can just click on it, fill in, and we will like, evaluate your applications and, and add you. And then samples, because uh, a lot of people told us a lot of docs, but uh, let's show us something that actually runs. So we do have a couple of sample repository. The first one is the application sample, uh, which contains a collection of branches, which explains you step by step how to migrate an app from 67 to 68, or from 67 to 69, and so on, with commit by commit what we're doing and how we're turning on things. And similarly, uh, we have a library sample, sample repo, which explains uh, how to create a native module or a native components library, which is compatible with both architecture, because you might just want to release a library that works for everyone. And a lot of the popular libraries uh, we have in React Native are already migrated and already compatible with the new architecture. And a lot of are starting to, to keep up, like start working on it right now. Uh, but again, if you have a library or you have an application which is blocking you, let us know. And now, to wrap up, I really hope that in, I don't know, six months from now, one year from now, uh, or whenever, when I search React Native New Architecture on Google, I will just find your story. Like, um, tell us, tell us how it went. It went well, it went badly. Or, well, like, hopefully you will share us your success. But um, I think that historically, the React Native team uh, has been really engaged with the community. Um, but there is definitely a lot of space for, for improvements. And we are here to hear what we can do better. So I'm here today also to collect your feedback, your migration story. If you want to tell, tell, like, tell me about anything related to React Native, mobile, I'm more than happy to chat and hear your feedback. And with this, uh, well, I want to thank you very much for listening. And I also want to mention that, again, we're fully committed to open source and contributions to any of our tools being, OK. Uh, being Metro, Hermes, React, or React Native are more than welcome. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicola. Um, it's been a long time on this React Native train. I think the first app I shipped to production was 0 0.8 or something like that. Um, it looks, uh, looks incredible. Please go talk to Nicola. I know that a lot of people who are working on React Native projects um, are very excited and, and concerned about the future migration of, of all the apps and libraries. So please talk to him and uh, give him both feedback. And I'm sure that he's happy to help. Um, Ryan is setting up here. He's a, a, a very extraordinary man. He s speaks with not one, but two laptops. So we'll give him as much the time um, to set up. Um, 
Ryan reminds me of the good old days of JavaScript when we were fearlessly exploring new spaces um, and pushing the art of web development forward. Um, Ryan is currently working on open source projects um, at Netlify uh, that is also uh, committed to pushing the web forward. Um, he is the, one of the core team members at the web framework Marco and he is the creator of SolidJS, um, another JavaScript library, um, in some ways like React, but I'm sure that uh, the Ryan will, will explain that in a lot better detail than I can. Um, what else can one say when one has more time than one planned for? <laughs> um, how's everybody enjoying their morning? Good? Woo, I like that guy. Uh, uh, there's something really fun about uh, saying woo. I don't know what it is. It just fills one with joy. It just starts from, you know, from the bottom and just exhales. Um, come on, bro, help me out here. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so close. I just need to get this one off this one and onto this one. Um, All right. There he goes, yeah. my man. Apparently all the setup we did a few minutes ago completely does not transfer when I unplug the machine, so. Yeah. Can you like type on both uh, laptops simultaneously? Like do you have completely separate control of your left brain, right brain? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Okay, this, this will be some fun because it mm. seems to jump around a little bit. Okay, well, we're going to have some fun here. I know, take your time by all means. You know what, I'm quite comfortable up here. I have no problem. All right. Uh, Ryan, are we ready? Right. Yeah, all right. All right. Um, everyone, give it up. A big level 10 hooting and hollering welcome uh, to author of SolidJS, Ryan Carniato. As he said, my name's Ryan. I'm the creator of SolidJS, and today I'm going to present an introduction to it. Um, you're like, wait, isn't this a React conference? Um, I, I want to challenge our expectations of what the future of web frameworks will look like. And I don't mean purely looks. If you've ever seen Solid, which many of you probably haven't, um, it looks a lot like React. It has JSX, it has composable primitives. And you might be wondering, like, what am I doing here? Um, and really, it's not worth my time trying to promote it on features. Um, one framework adds a feature, the next framework adds it. It just kind of goes on. I think we're past that being a differentiator. Um, to cut it short, Solid has most of the features of React 18, um, just to kind of get, get an idea. Um, nor am I going to try and s uh, sell you on benchmarks and performance. Um, no matter how dominating a display in server and browser, I, 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 people tend, out to, tend to kind of tune out after a while. Like, it's a meme at this point, like blazingly fast. Like, um, I'm just going to say good performance and we'll move on. Okay, so I swear this is not a reenactment of a JavaScript framework conversation on Twitter, um, but I wouldn't blame people sometimes if it feels this way. Um, it wasn't so long ago when the mere mention of a new JavaScript framework brought anger. Um, and it's only been actually really recently um, that I've noticed that people have been a little bit more open to new ideas um, than they've been for a long time. Um, there's been this kind of sense, um, and this is kind of inside and outside of React, like this new paradigm changes happening, right? And um, it's often accompanied by some faint memory of a time when uh, React burst on the scene, conquering the jQuery hordes and thrusting the web development forward years in one swift stroke. And I don't know, is that really how it happened? Uh, history is written by the victors. And um, my memory of events is actually a little bit different. Um, the time before React was one full of innovation and exploration. Um, many of the pieces actually kind of already existed, but we hadn't really figured out how to put things together in the right way. We didn't have the right opinions on what we were doing. We just kind of were just playing with it. And I feel like right now, we're kind of back in one of those uh, scenarios again. So yeah, here's, the, here's my big headline. Um, modern front-end web for years has been about components. Uh, class components, function components, option components, web components, 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 components. And for good reason, components are essential building blocks that allow our uh, programs to be modular and composable, and we owe React for this change in mindset. However, in almost every JavaScript framework, um, components have runtime implications. 
the update model and the life cycles are like, tied together. And this has led to basically two views of the world. Um, either you're gonna have like a virtual DOM that diffs, or it's like tag template literals can run top down, or alternately you're gonna re rely really heavily on compilation. Um, you know, but in both cases the components still update top down. And when you're running things top down over and over again, at a certain point, you, you start thinking about like what, what, what needs to run, what, you know, what, what matters when it reruns or not. And this sort of begs the question, um, when or what do we memoize? Um, there's a great talk last year at React Conf uh, 2021 that addressed this exact topic. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal a few slides from there uh, here. So your first inkling might be to build a to-do app in a framework like React, kind of like this. Uh, declare some state, vent handler, wire it up. Um, but you know, if, if anything other than the to-do list changes, the to-do list still ends up re-rendering again, right? It's just kind of how it works. And this is okay, we have a virtual DOM, uh, make sure this isn't very expensive, um, but we still want to optimize. And as your program grows, you apply some optimizations and things start looking a bit like this. Maybe you add a filter and some props coming in from above, and then you kind of annotate things with memo and use memo and use callback and uh, get your dependency arrays and like everything's working exactly how you want it to now. Um, but it's a, a bit of a departure, like, okay, um, from where we started. And it kind of puts the onus on the developer. So what can we do about this? Well, compile it, right? Um, this m meme floated around Twitter about a year ago. I, I definitely felt the lack of de dependency array MV from some circles. And I mean, after all, wouldn't it be better just to express our intents with, with less code? Um, let's hold that thought for a moment, okay? Um, so back to our to-do list. Now, this is, this is like the most crazy slide from that presentation. And this is the compiled output. No one, no one writes that code. Um, but this was kind of like a pseudo code from what a React compiler would generate. And um, it actually isn't all that different from what a framework like Svelte actually generates. Um, uh, it's a bunch of shallow checks. There's this memcached object you see floating around. And basically, we can kind of check at every decision point to make sure that we don't do extra work. And the developer just writes a nice JavaScript and it just all works. But there's a common ground here. Basically, a user or an event updates the state. We mark the component as dirty. And then we rerun it and we check against some memoized values to reduce that work. It doesn't matter if the original code called set state or used an assignment equal sign, like spell react. It's, 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 it's actually amazingly similar from a mechanical standpoint. Um, but I, I'm, I'm here because I want, to, I want to throw this out here. What if we just didn't do any of this? What if we only ran what was needed to be run and didn't rely have that heavily on compilation? What if the boundaries of our components didn't dictate the performance of our web applications? To do that, I kind of need to go all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, so we're all the way back here. Hello, world. Um, um, you know, it, it wasn't very long before we kind of realized we could, you know, set a value to a variable and console log it, right? And then you're like, oh, we can set it again and console log it again. And then we're like, okay, this is not very dry, too much work, so let's extract that into a function. So now we have our greeting component, and we're pretty happy. We can change the name. We, sorry, not component, function. We can change the name. We can call greet, do it again, and whatnot. But at a certain point, we might be thinking, what if I always want to greet my friend whenever I change the name? And to do that, there's, there's, there's lots of ways of doing it, but m my personal favorite ways uh, is something called reactivity. And I, I, I want to talk about it because reactivity's been kind of it was around a long time ago, and then it started kind of spreading itself out again and kind of making a comeback. And basically, I, I would argue that almost all UI frameworks are reactive in a sense. Um, it's at the heart of it. You want your user interfaces to stay in sync. And the way I think about it is like a system of live equations, like a spreadsheet. See, a normal assignment represents a moment of time. Like, it means at the end of running this equation, A is the sum of B plus C. But if you change B or C, well, you, you have to do the sum again. But um, with reactivity, that relationship does hold through time. It means that A will always reflect the sum of B and C. It's, it's, it's a rule. And what I like talking about often is something called fine-grained reactivity. Um, some of you might have seen this before, like MobX um, and things like Vue, and Preact just released some signals uh, last week. Um, and 
I think it's really interesting because we're seeing a lot of this actually at the framework level because there's a lot of nice properties about this. Um, declarative, you know, relationships are set once and then executed. You describe the behavior rather than the implementation. And they're composable, they're easy to wrap. You can just, you know, build, up, build them up. And the most important thing is there's actually three primitives that you can basically build a whole system off of. Um, and I, I stole this right out of the MobX docs. It's great. Um, basically, there's like our observable state. I, I tend to call these signals. There is our derived state or computed values. And then there's our side effects, which um, could really be any kind of side effects. You know, obviously, I've been showing you console logs, but it could be rendering. And with these three, you can accomplish amazing things. So React hooks, right? Um, not exactly. Um, from a language perspective, you can consider this uh, React hooks or something like Svelte, let, and dollar signs. But both of those are tied to the component, right? You mark the component as dirty. And these composition patterns um, that I'm talking about have actually existed almost a decade earlier in JavaScript. Uh, in, like Knockout.js in 2010 had this. Reactivity is a system onto itself and has no connection to rendering or components. Um, and that's really, really important here. But it's probably easier for me just to try and show you this. First thing we need is a new primitive. Um, setting a simple uh, variable can't cause other code to run. So we need, we need something special, kind of like a promise here in order to do this. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you a signal. And all signal is is a getter function and a setter function. Oh, basically, it holds a value. Call it to get the value, set it to update the value. Um, and as you can see now, in our greet function, we actually have the call name as a function, but um, we're also just, and we're also setting um, friend when we update the name. But this doesn't do much on its own. So um, I'm gonna introduce a second primitive. Um, let's call it create effect. You, you start seeing some analogs here between like React hooks, but there's some differences here. And our create effect, um, basically we've moved our greet function into it. And now the idea here is whenever our friend name changes, we console log it. It runs initially, so it runs top down, and we sit, you know, console log hello John. But then later when we call set friend and update to Mary, it, it runs that effect again and logs it. And the real power is actually this is transitive. So if I wanted to make the friend name uppercase for some reason, I don't know why, but I decided to make it uppercase. Um, all we have to do is call the upper function inside of create effect. And because it's called underneath it using the call stack, we actually can still track that signal. If you notice, there's, there's no dependency arrays yet. So like, is this some kind of magic? Am I using a compiler here? No, this is completely runtime. And I mean, at one time people did really think this is magic, but what I love about this, honestly, is we can probably implement this easier than that interview question where someone asked you how to implement a promise. Because it's about 50 lines of code to actually get this concept. It's a little bit complicated, so this is probably the most technical part of my talk here. Um, bear with me for a moment, at least. But the way I kind of look at this is our signal here is just a read function and a write function. I'm just using closure here, and essentially you can see you update the value and you return the two functions. Of course, this doesn't do anything, so we need to do like a little bit more here. And the way we do that is we add this idea of subscribers, which is a set in this case. And Essentially, now, whenever we read it, we go, is anyone listening? And I'll exp show how that works in a minute. And if they are, add them to our subscription list. And then later on, someone writes the value, and then you just go through all the subscribers and tell them it's changed. It's, a, it's an event emitter, um, if you're familiar with those. Um, and then the other side, which is our effect, we've got a global stack. It's called, I'm calling it context here, but it's just, it's just a stack that's globally available. So when we get the current observer, we're just saying like, what's on top of the stack? And then we kind of go through the cycle, essentially. Every time we run our effect, we clean up any previous dependencies, we push ourselves onto the stack so that signals that we read during that call stack, like while it's running, can see us. Then we execute the provided function, and then we pop ourselves off the stack. That, that's it. This is all the code here. I'm, I'm going to put it side by side for a minute, um, try and kind of run through our example in our head a little bit. But essentially, we create our friend, which returns our read and write functions. And then we go to run that effect for the first time. And essentially, uh, the effect goes over into here, and it pushes, it, it runs that execute function immediately, which pushes itself onto the stack, and then it runs the function. So it starts running that console log. It calls upper. Upper 
in turn calls our friend's name, and then when it calls the read internally there, it sees that that effect is on the stack. So then it goes, oh, okay, adds it to its subscribers. Then we just clean, we run the rest of the function, log it out to the console, and it pops itself off. Sometime later, someone goes and updates the value, which at that point, the write function triggers, and in that list, we have our one effect. So we rerun our effect again, push ourselves back onto the stack, see the latest value, and do it all over again. That's, that's basically it. That's, that's all reactivity is. That's, and from there, we can build a foundation for other primitives. A lot of them are not essential, but you can use as needed. Um, here's a few examples, for example, that I just grabbed from Solid. Um, create memo, which is for expensive uh, computations. It's a derive values. Um, create store, which is for nested reactivity, um, uses proxies. And then create resource, which is a, kind of a simple data primitive designed for um, suspense and, uh, and concurrent rendering. It just takes a promise, returns kind of signal back. But at this point, what I'm describing actually isn't that different than a lot of solutions that might um, already exist out there. Vue, as I said, works this way. React with MobX works this way. Um, but the next step is actually where things actually get interesting. Um, and I'm gonna do some live coding, I know. That's lots of fun, but um, it's kind of funny to me that whenever we teach reactivity, it's always like some console log, like hello. So I've got a counter here. And I want to do something a little bit more substantial. So I'm going to try uh, coding live, and we'll just see how this goes. Um, so wish me luck. But uh, let's, let's make an element. Let's make an H1, let's say. And I'm going to use vanilla JavaScript here because I think it'll be more um, descriptive. So I'm going to make an H1, and I'm going to append this to the document. Uh, in this environment, I don't actually have um, hot uh, reloading really good because I'm, I'm like not using a framework. I'm just kind of... Um, Add limiting it, and actually I'm gonna turn off TypeScript because I'll probably do terrible stuff while I'm doing this. But essentially, my idea is we're just going to append our H1 to the page, and we're gonna set the content of our H1. Like, there's no reason you have to use create effect to synchronize state. You can use it to, you know, maybe tell the H1 that its text content should equal the string. And if all works well, here we go, we, we now have this working example. Now, the problem here is obviously this jump straight to count equals one, it happened too fast. You didn't actually see anything update. So let's add a but button, and to save myself some time typing, I already have this prepared. So now I just added a vanilla JavaScript button. This is all pure vanilla JavaScript, and that basically our runtime we just showed a few minutes ago. So here we go, we have our H1, we have an effect that updates the text content, and then we create a button, add some text for it, and then I added like an inline click handler, which sets the count to count plus one. So, and then we append both the H1 and the button to the screen, uh, to the body, sorry. So this is just pure vanilla, and this should just work. Here we go, we have a working counter component. The thing is, this is fine, and this seems fun, but no one writes code like this, it's too much. Like, uh, there's a reason we use frameworks. We don't all wanna just go in and do, do vanilla JavaScript. So wouldn't it be cool if we could like have some syntax and stuff to help us. Well, maybe we already do. Like, there's this thing called JSX, right? So like, what if we could just, you know, take our button and, what was it, click me, and what we, add a, a event handler to it, on click, and where is our event handler? Here we go, and drop it in, and then, we don't really need this anymore. We just assigned our button, which is just a DOM element here. Like, what if we could just compile JSX to what I just typed before? So then we still have a counter that works, right? Our button here is just a real DOM element. We don't have to necessarily have a VDOM. We just make it, it's a nice shorthand, right? And similarly here, for our H1 element, maybe we don't, um, you know, want to do all this stuff manually. So what if we could just take an H1 and with a, you know, a slight bit of compilation, essentially change it so that it's like this. And there's something a little fancy going on. Because we're calling a function, um, the compiler here goes, oh, I should wrap that in an effect. It could be dynamic. So that way we don't have to worry about writing create effect or anything. And suddenly, 
that kind of simple vanilla JavaScript. It's not, it's just compiling the JSX. We didn't compile the reactivity, we just compiled the JSX. And we, we, we still have a working counter component using JSX. And I can do a little better than this, because, I mean, again, who writes code like this? So maybe we should make it like a counter component or something, and we can kind of pull in all this stuff and just bring it up here, maybe like this, and, um, Let's just, for now, as I figure this out, uh, return our h1 and our button from our component. And do we have prettier in here? Yes, we do. Format document. Much better. And then we can just call our counter function, because it's just a function, and, and spread it in. And I mean, sure enough, this, this should still work, right? I'm just making DOM elements. Now they're in a function. There's, there's nothing fancy about it. Um, Basically, we click the click me, and just that one effect that updates that one text node here, that one number six here, is the only thing that, that runs. It's just our effect, right, um, that we had at the very beginning. So um, again, no one really writes code like this, so I feel like we can do better. We can probably get rid of these temporary variables, like we, we, we don't need the H1, and I can probably get rid of this button assignment here. And let's go to new line like this. And actually, no, honestly, why, why even use arrays? We probably could use something like a fragment, JSX fragment. And if I'd done this right and I format stuff again to make it look nice, our counter should still be working good. Um, and actually, this, this stuff at the bottom is kind of nasty. Um, so I'm, I'm going to import uh, a function here, maybe render from um, SolidJS uh, web, which is kind of like React DOM, same idea. And then we can kind of just go like render counter document dot body or whatever. And now we can just get rid of this stuff. And um, where are we? Yes, here we are. Loaded and our counter still works. So. This is starting to look kind of familiar. Like, I, I feel like I've seen something that looks like this before. Have, have you guys seen anything that looks like this before? Yeah? OK. Well, um, this is where things get kind of weird, because if I console log in the middle here and go, you know, counter, sure, we, we get our counter. And I hope you can see this. It's a little smaller. But if I click this button, well, wait, wait a second. It's not console logging it again. And that's because we only, I mean, this counter is just a function. You saw me write it. So it only runs once. We just have that one effect updating that one text node. So I, I can click this as many times as I want, and it's not going to rerun the component. Like, it's not even a component. It's actually just a function, if you think about it. So in a sense, um, you know, I mean, we, I can do whatever I want here. <laughs> you know, set interval. Let's, let's do something that will blow up the world. Um, let's, let's, let's set interval at every second, and let's grab the click handler there, too. Why not? Let's just use the same code. And, Drop it in here. Sorry, actually, I don't need the function thunk. Okay, sweet. So we have a, we have a, we have our thing counting up because it only ran once, um, and you know I can obviously click it. I, I don't know if you've ever tried this in React. Um, you're, you will crash your browser. Um, but I, I just just kind of just just throwing this out here because this is this is kind of cool. Um, but it, it's obviously very very different. I mean, it, it looks kind of similar, but it, it is very very different. But uh, what can we do with this? Because that, that's not really enough, right? So let's keep on going. Now let's put two counters on the page, okay? So I've, I'm returning a fragment, and I have counter one and counter two. And each of them, you know, if you look at the bottom, hopefully you can see this, it might not be blown up the best, but there's, there's a two beside that counter. And because we made two of them, and I click it, and I click it, and the counter thing doesn't update anymore, and they have their own independent state, because again, we can just get states by wrapping them into closure. So that is essentially, um, you know, state management, local state. It, it's a pretty easy pattern. But what if I want global state? Well, if you've been paying attention, it might occur to you that you could just do this. What if we just pull the state out? Because now you have both components uh, basically referencing the same object. And now we have global state because it's all the same thing, and nothing is re-rendering. In fact, the only thing re-rendering are those two text nodes for each counter that we started at the beginning. So you see, we, we, we're not in Kansas anymore. 
Um, I've got one more example for you um, for on the, this line is prop drilling. That's a lot of fun, right? So let's, let's instead of making it global, put it in our app component and pass it through. In this case, one count is just count and the other is count times two. And I'm gonna make it so that one button is plus one and one plus two. And if you look at our logs, we have app and then two beside the counter. Cause, so each component ran once. It doesn't really matter here because even as I click it and go up by one or go up by two, no console logs are rerunning. In fact, it doesn't matter how many components I have on the page, nothing re reruns. We're only updating those two text nodes. You know, you can use context. Like there's no performance consideration tied to components or context or any of that stuff. It just, it just, it just works. So this is super powerful stuff, at least from where I'm sitting. Um, so I'm gonna kind of pull this back around again. You might be going, okay, what's going on here? This, it's gotta be a little bit more than you showed me before. And it's true. When we see something that looks like a function call or a member expression because of proxies, we go, the compiler either wraps it in a, an effect, which we saw earlier with the DOM element. If it's a component, we just wrap it in a getter. So we just transform the props a little bit. And if you know anything about JavaScript getters, it just makes it lazy. So what we've done essentially is flatten the tree graph because we just call these functions when you're in that final effect. The whole component tree vanishes to the point that you just literally have the one placed in the DOM that updates. Okay, I, I, there, there's a trade-off here, and I gotta talk about this a little bit, because uh, if anyone's seen Solid, they're like, they're, they're like you, you use those weird control flow components. Because um, th there's a problem with, uh, we have with map. I already showed you, we use real DOM nodes, and we do these fine grain updates. The problem with map is, if I'm mapping to real DOM nodes, anytime the data changes, I'd have to remake all the DOM nodes. It's terrible. So I do need to memoize it. And I could, we could use a uh, helper function, but I actually kind of made a choice. I was like, why don't we just use a component for it? And, and people are like, ugh, ooh, where's my just JavaScript? Um, but I, I'm gonna argue that this is super, super composable and actually aligns really well. Um, what do I mean by that? Pretend now that you need a paginated component or a virtualized list or something. What do you do? in React, well, you import it. And then, like, it's the same pattern again, uh, right? Lists become paginated lists or virtualized lists. Uh, conditionals become suspense or error boundaries. We have those components in React. So it's not unexpected to use components for control flow. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically it. And with that, we can actually return to that demo at the beginning here that I wanted to show because I actually have that to-do app from uh, React Conf. And uh, it's, it's almost like the original version of that example, right? We created some state, we created an event handler. This looks a little bit different, albeit, but then we have our forward loop I showed you. We filter the list here and we pass the props. This is the final version that has all the interactivity on it. And at the bottom I'm logging stuff. So yeah, if I hit a checkbox, it, does update this count, if you can see, it's really small, but it, yeah, there it goes, it, it updates the count, because I am updating that. If I change the filtered list, it does trigger the filter, because no, nothing re-rendered on the, the items, it didn't bother triggering it. Obviously, if an item was hidden, then when I switch, it will also create one of those items again. Like, the work that needs to be done has to be done. But, you know, if I go to theme color, which you see, this is a prop, prop theme color, going through the component, because of what I've showed you already, it doesn't matter how many times I do this, no more console logs, because it's not updating anything that it doesn't need to. And this is super powerful, because like, what's not here? What are we missing? Where's the dependency arrays? Where's the use callback? Where's the use ref? Where's, where, where, where is all that, those things? It was actually really hard for me to make this demo to show off that anything changed, because so little changed. Like, in the to-do, I had to kind of jump a console log in the middle of a JSX binding to actually show that something changed. So I, I just want to put it out here because, again, we, we changed the mindset a bit. We can do a lot of things. Um, and that's what I call the reactive advantage, right? Components run once, no hook rules, no stale closures. Templates compile to real DOM nodes. So this is like a super low level abstraction over the DOM. Like you have that escape hatch. You can always just go like, just grab it. And most importantly, state is independent of components. Component boundaries are for your sake, how you want to organize your code not for performance. The performance is really good regardless. So, I mean, to summarize, I guess I'm just gonna go with this, right? And as for that compiler from earlier, 
If you aren't careful, you no longer have the language to represent certain ideas. If your whole world, for example, is a component, then how do you represent what lies outside of it? This is just illustrative, to be fair. Um, there are solutions for this. And compilation is an important tool, but I, I want to point out that it's not necessarily a silver bullet. Um, w there, there are trade-offs with this. And to me, all of this, everything I've been talking about is part of a larger trend. Um, I may have used solid today um, to illustrate this, but this is just the beginning. Reactivity has already been serving as a common language between UI frameworks. Solid View and I mentioned recently Preact are using fine-grained reactivity in their frameworks. And if you squint really hard, to a certain degree, React and Svelte are too. Um, they're not the same fine-grained reactivity, but they use the same language. Um, so I'm saying, why don't we apply this beyond component boundaries? We've seen this used to great effect with Solid. Um, View announced that they're actually working on a new compiler that generates code eerily similar to Solid. And um, I think this is just the beginning. There's other applications as well. Um, we're talking bleeding edge here. Um, I've been talking a lot about the cost of components for several years now, but recently we've seen it applied in amazing new ways. Components that um, need to rerun, like we've seen, means you need all the JavaScript in the browser even after server rendering. Um, and this is known as hydration, if you've ever come across it, when a server uh, rendered app uh, starts up. Um, we didn't have this problem in jQuery days. We invented this problem ourselves. This is, hydration is, is our fault. And, but you, we can, if we can get rid of runtime components, we can also eliminate hydration. Um, this has been realized, actually, by, uh, I mentioned I work on Marco. Um, um, the new, next version of Marco actually eliminates hydration, and another uh, framework, Builder.io is quick. Um, also has figured out to how to eliminate hydration. And this all comes down to going beyond components. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping very soon Solid joins that list as well. So it's not about VDOM or not, or about diffing or not. You could embed a whole VDOM inside a reactive system if you wanted. You could do concurrent rendering without a VDOM, and we do. It's about recognizing that our change model, while very much entwined with our UI representation, isn't the same thing. For this reason, the conversation around the world beyond components starts with reactivity, um, a system of change unto itself. Reactivity is already everywhere in JavaScript frameworks, from state management to compilation, but we can leverage it best if we fully embrace it and live in its declarative world. So maybe a revolution is not in the cards, maybe just a reactive renaissance, but who knows what new worlds are only a step away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I'm sure that you have many questions for Ryan, for Nicola, for Jen, so you can go speak to them now on the three and a half floor, so basically one whole floor up. Um, we're gonna do a coffee break. We're gonna start the next session about five minutes late, so the program since we start at 11, we're gonna start 11.05, so you have 20 minutes to do speaker Q&A, grab coffee, and I'll see you here in 20 minutes for our technique session. Thank you very much.
All right. I hope everybody has enjoyed their kahvia pulla. Uh, I don't know if, if there was pulla. I hope there was pulla. Pulla is my favorite, um, as you can tell. Um, yeah, let's please um, start taking our seats uh, for our next session. The theme of this session is called techniques. Um, I, I, I was not part of the program committee. I think the program committee had to work a little bit hard to create a theme on the on the on the on this particular session, but we did manage. Uh, we have three three great talks coming. First, we have uh, Esamati who will be joining us soon, uh, talking about type safe um, JavaScript or TypeScript end to end type safety. Then we have Caddy talking about what is good code, and then finally we have Kenneth Sutherland uh, sharing his lifelong wisdom. Um, I will be talking uh, a couple of more minutes until people sit down. So if you are sick of hearing my voice, do not blame me. Blame the people who are not yet sitting in their seats. Um, the blathering will continue until morale improves. Did anyone uh, make a new friend on the first break? Can I have a hand up who talked to somebody who did they not previously know on this break? Yes, incredible. This is the stuff. This is how friends are made. Maybe enemies, I don't know. Um, one of my great disappointments in life is that I don't have a nemesis. Um, if anybody is interviewing for a nemesis position, if anybody wants to be a, a lifelong enemy, um, I am open. All right. I think we've had quite enough of this. Um, in a moment, we will introduce uh, Esa Matti Suuronen. He is our first uh, Finnish speaker of the day. He joins us from Juvaskula in Finland. Um, it's a beautiful city, uh, a real summer town, as they say. Um, Esa Matti will be talking about end-to-end uh, -end type safety using um, Zod and uh, Zorm, the, the form library. Um, at this point, Esa Matti, why don't you come on the stage and uh, show, us, uh, show us your beautiful face. You're already set up, so there is no technical work to be done. Uh, Esa Matti, are you ready to, to wrestle dazzle? Yep. Great. Uh, is the microphone on? It is not. That is my mistake. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear Esa Matti now? Great. In the back as well. All right. Um, well, without further ado, uh, there has been much enough ado. Uh, everyone give big level 10 welcome to Esa Matti Suuranen. Thank you. So, my name is Esa Matti Suuranen. I'm coming from Jyväskylä, which is so I'm not quite local here in Helsinki, but not too far off, a little bit from north here. And here are the places you can see me on, on the internet. And this is the avatar I've used. So if you've seen this video game picture somewhere, that's me. And I work for Valo Digital OU, and my day job is building developer tools. And I mainly work on findkit.com, which is like this toolkit for making search experiences for websites. So it's like a tool for website developers. But I also tend to build quite often JS libraries. And I will be talking about one today. But before we go into it, I want to talk a little bit about TypeScript. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of TypeScript. I, I actually think it's the best thing that has happened to web developers maybe since jQuery, I think. But unfortunately, it's, it's not perfect. There are some caveats when you, you are using TypeScript. And even if you are using all the strict modes and stuff like that, you still can get any types in your code from a bunch of places, like when you are making API calls, reading files, passing JSON, maybe even reading your database, you can get any types. E even though the code, code looks really good, there's like no explicit any anywhere, no typecasts. And another one is like local storage. And there's um, what I call a feel-good fix for those any issues. And that's like just 
defining the interface or, or the type you want to use and just putting it in, in your code. And boom, you have the, any type is gone. You don't see it anywhere. And all your coding is easy because you get auto completion and everything works, right? But this code, of course, has some issues. Because just using type like that, it's basically a typecast. Which means if you, for example, in this case, if you deploy a new version of your app, where you change the local storage settings format, so the, which means in, in the new version, it will load the old versions, version of the settings. And now you have mismatched types. You have different type going on on runtime than what you have in TypeScript types. And this is how you get the undefined is not the function errors. And that's, this, is, this is sad, because that, this is the reason why we are using TypeScript, because we don't want to see that error anymore. And <clears throat> but there is some shit. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> press the wrong button. Do we have a solution for that? And I think we have a pretty good one. And it's called Jod. This is not the first library like this, but I think this is like the most ergonomic one of them all. How many of you have used this one? Can you raise hands? Quite many. How many of you use TypeScript? OK, I have something good for you. <laughs> <clears throat> so what Jot actually does, it allows you to define your types straight in JavaScript code. And you can actually use that as a parser and get the type version out of it. So you can actually infer the type from the JavaScript version of the schema definition. And how you would fix the previous example just by using, instead of using the interface, you'll use the Jot schema and just use that schema to pass the input data, which is in this case any type of objects from JSON pass, and then you just pass it again with Jod, and it will make sure that you have the real type. And this will actually draw an exception if the type doesn't match. Instead of having exceptions, you can also use safe pass version where you can actually use if statement to handle the type mismatch if you like to have to make some migrations or something like that. But how do we use Jod with forms? <clears throat> because Jod can only work with um, plain JavaScript objects, and the form element is not the JavaScript object. Or it is, but it's like a very complicated one. And we need the, like, the plain one. So let's take a simple example. This is like a login form or sign-up form. And we make a small judge schema for it and build on that. So how do we get the plain object out of it? So here's one way. We can just go through all the inputs in the form and build the object and run the judge schema on it. And boom, we have the properly typed object with, with us. But <clears throat> this is not re really nice, because there are like a bunch of edge cases in this code. There are like other elements that make the form data than inputs. So we have to handle those as well. But luckily, these days we have better solutions for this. New modern browsers, basically nowadays, everything but IE has this form data API, which is actually an iterable, which means that we can actually use another new newish API from entries. And this way, we can get the plain object out, out from the form. So we'll get the object we actually want from form like this. Please don't steal my password. And since we are using React, so how we can actually put this all together? <coughs> We can actually just keep using the normal form. This is like the standard form component, nothing special on it. And we just hook into the submit handler. And on that, we get access to the form DOM element. 
which we can pass to the form data and use the previous code to actually get the proper past data out of it. And after that, we can just handle the error situation or just let it pass through, let the form submit, or we can, if we are using making a single page app or something like that, we can just use fetch to send the data forward. And we use a little bit the React state. We put only the jot error object in the React state. And this is the only state we actually need to use at this point. Because that's, that's the only way we can render the errors on, on the forms. Because we don't really track any form state in the <coughs> React state, so we need to just take the request state out of it we want to use in, in React code. So when I figured that out, I was thinking that do I really need the form library anymore? We can, I just want to use George because that's what I use like in every project. But when I started thinking about forms more deeply, I realized that there's a bunch of other things going on with forms other than just validating that I have the correct data in the form, I actually need to make the form. <coughs> so, <coughs> but the good thing about this code is that it's actually quite performant because we are not tracking syncing input states directly to any React state, which causes re-renders. So when we read it directly from the DOM element, we can just skip all the React renders. But there are, of course, things that go into creating forms other than validating. And here are a few of them. Like, we actually need to set the name attributes on the elements, render the errors, make, do some server-side validation, because of course you need to, you cannot just do the clients and stuff. Maybe we want to do nested fields, conditional fields, we wanna like put the checkbox in and render some other fields as well. So, after th uh, thinking about this for a while, I came up with this library called React Charm, which builds on this foundation but tries to add only s small helpers on top of it, which actually make building the form easier and type safe. So here's how it works. It's uh, basically a one hook you can import from, from the library, and you pass in a form ID and the schema. And this, uh, this function uses some type inference to actually figure out what are the available fields in the schema. And this allows us to still use native HTML components, uh, like input elements, nothing custom here either. But we can actually write the <coughs> name attribute type safely. For example, here I made a typo on the password name field, <coughs> which it will tell us because it's type, type error. And we can continue the same, same idea for errors. So whenever the judge schema par parsing fails, it's gonna like put the error in the React state. And after that, we can use the same pattern to actually render the error on the form. If you look at the closer this error chain, it's actually using a render function. And this is actually rendered only when there's an error on the username field. So if there's no error, this doesn't render anything. It just returns null. So how about nested fields? How we can use them? It's basically the same thing. You can just just go through the nested fields and just use the property access and call the function at the end, and you will get the proper name attribute for your input field or whatever field. And same goes for the error rendering as well. So how this works? It's actually just generating a string like this, which is just passed into the <coughs> JSON object after, or just plain JavaScript object after that. 
and it's actually borrow some code from underscore or lodas. There's like this function called set, which actually can take a string like this and create the object from from it, which looks like that. And this is again something that we can pass on to Chod. And this actually supports infinitely nested objects and arrays, so we can create as complex form as we need to and still be type safe. And this, all of all these fields are like inferred from the Chod schema. So how about server-side validation? This, this example is from Remix. So this, is, this function is basically a post method handler. But it, React Charm doesn't really depend on any other framework. It's just using the browser APIs. And here's why, which is why we can use it with the Remix easily, because Remix is using browser APIs on the server side as well. So in Remix, if you, when you handle a form, you can get the form data object from the request object. And then we can just import pass form function from React Chrome, which is the same one it uses internally in the React hook. So we can get the <coughs> same validation on both sides. So we can use actually the same schema object on the server side and on the client side which is really nice because it, then the validation is synced. You can get real-time updates on the errors when you are using the form on the client side, and it's actually validated to be the same on the server side when you are actually putting it in, into a database. And the reason why we are using the pass form here is just to support for the nested, nested objects. If you were just doing like a simple one level object, we could use the same from entries stuff I saw earlier in here as well. But if you are not using Remix and you have only JSON, it's actually even simpler. But you then just have to submit the form content using fetch manually. But in the, on the server side, then you can just use the schema pass directly on the JSON object. We don't find a request. Well, how about server-side only validation? Because not all validation can happen on the client side. So for example, if this is a sign-up form, we want to check that the username is not already taken. And we cannot do that on the client side, because some evil guy could like skip that validation by hacking on your client side code. So to solve this issue, <coughs> Ustrom provides this custom issues property, and it takes basically uh, any JavaScript object which matches with the chart schema, I, I mean chart issue type, which is like path where the issue or the error happened, and the message, and the, when we are using custom issues, it has, has to use the custom, custom key for that. <clears throat> and these issues, uh, custom issues can be actually generated anywhere. You can create them on the client side, on the server side, and even, even in other languages. If you have like a Ruby on Rails app, you can generate this on Ruby code and just pass it on the client side and pass it to use Chrome, and it will render the error on the correct field automatically. But since we are talking about type safety, this is not good, very good yet, because this doesn't actually do any type checking. You can put in whatever on the paths. So for that, there's a, another helper called create custom issues, which takes in the schema object and again uses type inference to ensure that you are using correct keys. And it works pretty much the same as the other chaining objects. So you just call the function at the end to add an issue to the issues object. And so this is, again, the server side handler. And then we, at the end, we just return an array of the issues. And then on the client side, we just pass it to the use Chrome hook. And we, we get the username is not available error on the username input field, which is nice. And <coughs> 
in this code, this is a remix APIs. If you're not familiar, it's just returning the data from the server side. What about, what about third party red components and the custom UI? Because as, as I said earlier, we are not tracking any, any input states in, in React, which means that when we, <coughs> which means that we don't actually see the form data in the React side of things, and the other way around, uh, React Chrome doesn't see any React state. So if you have like, let's say React Select, which doesn't use input elements at all, it just uses some custom things. So how, how, do, I, how do we put the data form like this to React Chrome? Or in general, in any form. This is not, not like React Chrome APIs, it's just forms. So we need to put the data in the form. <clears throat> so in this example, we have a schema with colors, array of strings, and then we use the React Select component, and we add a little bit helper state here, where we have the array of colors and set a function for that. And just to, when we want to put the data on the form, but we have another UI for it, we need to use hidden inputs. So we just go through the colors and create hidden inputs and use the fields chain to actually generate correct name attribute so we can pass it to the object on the left. And this works basically for anything. You can create any plain JavaScript object like this. So you can adapt any, any component, whether it's some third party or your custom one, to actually any, any form. It doesn't have to be even reacting or react to something. Uh, well, how about custom uh, conditional fields? Because again, we come up with this issue that what if we want to like add, add some advanced fields, some settings form, and you want to put checkbox in when you want to like show, the, show those fields. But again, when the state is only in the form and not in the React, we need to somehow actually read those specific fields in, into React state. And for that, we have a hook called use value, which takes in the Chrome object and the name of the field we want to actually read. <coughs> and this uses the same fields chain, so the type checking is going on here as well. And this, this actually uses internally the React state. So this is where you can actually break the performance. But the thing is that this is opt-in. You can you only use this when you really need to, and everything is by default, not tracked. So a small recap. <clears throat> we don't track input state, states by default. We validate the form values directly from the form element and not, not from any reacting. We can use just schemas everywhere in the browser and the server, and from the judge schema, we can infer some type safety to name attribute generation, error rendering, and server side issue generation as well. <coughs> How about other frameworks? Since the code in this library is not actually very reactive, even, it's only one hook that just gets the form element and works from that. So it should be actually quite easy to port this library to other frameworks like Solid or even web components maybe, who knows. So if this seems interesting, you can ask me, come and ask, so we can figure out how to, how to actually implement this in other frameworks as well. Check out the readme. There's like a bunch of examples and some patterns how to, how to use this library. And And if you have any questions, feel free to reach me out on Twitter or in the Q&A session afterwards. And I really actually like to hear some questions, how to like use this in some specific situation, because there's not that, many, that much API in this library. But I think there's like patterns you can use to actually
create the handle the more complicated situations just using this API. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well done, sir. All right. Um, I, I really love that talk. I think you know, just the whole concept of end-to-end -end type safety with TypeScript is, is, is very much off the day. It's very du jour, but it's also very impactful. So if you're not already, if you're using TypeScript on the front end and you don't have an interface for, for, for sharing those types with, with your back end, I highly recommend investing into it, whether it's with something like gRPC, tRPC, GraphQL, or using uh, Zod uh, encoders and decoders uh, manually. Incredibly powerful stuff. But now, um, speaking of good practices and good code, uh, next we have Caddy Kraman talking about good code. Um, Caddy is the, a director of engineering at Formidable. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work with Caddy many years ago as well. Um, truly one of my favorite people. Um, and Caddy, are you ready? Yes. All right, take it away. Caddy Kraman. Thank you very much, and thank you for the amazing intro, Yanni. Uh, I'm really excited to be here in Finland uh, among so many fellow developers. And I'm actually especially excited about talking about good code. So this is something that I spend a lot of my time thinking about and something I'm trying to get better at. And I hope that a lot of you um, do as well. So um, I'm going to take you on a journey of discovery of good code and I'm hoping that by the end of this talk we will all come a little bit closer to glimpsing that elusive beast that is good code. So just to give you an idea of what the um, next 30 minutes is going to look like, um, I'm going to give you some food for thought on code goodness, on various aspects, how we do code, how we collaborate, and what the problems are with good code in JavaScript. And never fear, it's not going to be all wishy-washy. I'm actually going to give you two actionable things, so actionable suggestions that you could choose to adopt uh, tomorrow or today that hopefully could improve your code quality in your current project. So now you might, might be wondering, who is this person and why does she have so many opinions about code? So hi. Uh, my name is Caddy. I'm currently the head of mobile development at Formidable. We are a JavaScript consultancy, build things in React and React Native and GraphQL. Check out formidable.com. And uh, just with a caveat that obviously I don't believe that years of experience um, equate to skill, but uh, just to give you an idea of my developer journey and the basis from which I've arrived at the opinions that I have now, I just wanted to give you a history of what I've done as a developer. So I've had a job writing code for the past nine years. So just out of, out of university, I got my first coding job. And I've been continuously employed uh, for the past nine years. Um, I've never really had any more than um, two weeks between nine years ago and now where I haven't either written or read some code. And, um, Primarily, this has been in JavaScript. I think one thing to note is that I didn't start with JavaScript. JavaScript wasn't the first language um, that I wrote code in. It was actually the fourth, I think, or fifth. So I've, I've, I've dabbled in other languages, but I've kind of stuck with JavaScript because despite its faults, I love it. Uh, another thing to note is that I've almost always worked at software consultancies. So there's a blip in the middle there where I went to a startup and had that experience, but then I've kind of gone back onto the consultancy train. And why that's um, relevant is that especially um, the consultancies that I've been fortunate enough to work with and for um, have really valued code quality and maintainability and the idea that we are not building code just to make things work, but we're also building code that's maintainable for whoever's going to be taking over after we leave. Because as a consultant, you have the idea that you go and you do something and then you leave, but then someone else is going to maintain it. So I think about code quality a lot. And lastly, for the past four years or so, I've been in a role where I've been a tech lead or a manager. And why that's relevant is that it's kind of been up to me to 
uh, set the rules and enforce code quality rules for my team. Now, one thing about the word good in general is that it's relative. So from a philosophical standpoint, it's relative, you know, good and bad. But good code itself is relative. I mean, people have written books about it. Um, we could be here for hours, but we won't be, don't worry. Um, so just to tone this down into something that can be delivered in a talk, we're going to narrow down the parameters. So when we talk about good code, we're going to be talking specifically about good JavaScript code. So this is both front-end and on um, Node.js. Secondly, we're going to be talking about code where you have two or more developers working on it. So the rules are a bit different if you're working on something on your own. The, like, whether it's good or not is, is subjective to you. So specifically, the interaction of at least two people is important here. And lastly, we're going to be talking about a living code base. Now, what I mean by this is it's a code base that's actively moving, so features are being added, new people are being onboarded, the code is actively being worked on, improved, changed. Now, this is the question that actually prompted this whole talk. So I've done quite a few interviews for developers, and one question that I love asking is, what does good code mean to you? And the reason I love asking this is, um, it's really indicative to where the person is in their software, software developer journey, and also what problems they're currently experiencing on their current code base. Now, I don't think I'm brave enough to do an audience participation bit, but just have a think of what you would say. And I'm gonna show you some answers that I usually get. So people would usually say that good code needs to be readable and tested or testable and easy to understand, well-documented, reusable and consistent. And interestingly, something that I don't usually get as the first answer is that it does what it's meant to do and it's performant. It's almost like those things are implied, but when we think about good code and bad code, we don't really think about the code that we write, we think about the code that we read, because Obviously, we think that our own code is amazing. And I found, I mean, this is a chart based on no facts, just my opinion, but I have found that how much you care about code quality is definitely related to how much time you've spent working on old code. I don't just mean other people's code, I also mean your own code from two years ago. Because, I mean, I think a lot of us have experienced this thing where we go to a code base, we see a weird function, we think, who wrote that? And we, you know, do a little git blame just to see, and it was you. How do we write code? You've probably seen a variation of this loop. I mean, I've heard of this since I started coding. Um, that the way you write code, you obviously get some requirements. Number one, you make it work. Um, you take the requirements, you just make it do the thing that's on paper. Then number two, you make it clean. So you will pull all the magic numbers out to constants. You will remove all your console logs. You will um, like just tie things up, break it into little functions, just make it um, good for whatever standard you currently have. Number three, optimize. So at this point, you're going to look at uh, network request. Am I doing a bunch of network requests that could be combined into one? Am I doing a bunch of uh, file system reads that could, could be combined? Am I doing a bunch of loops over the same array? So this is optimization for both uh, memory and for clean code and for like network um, optimization. And number four is generalized. So at this point you will think, okay, is there anything reusable here that maybe I can pull into a util and maybe I'll test it separately or maybe I'll pull something into a type, right? And then these are the four loops that you go to. Now, the truth that we all kind of know uh, and the reason why there are so many variations of this is that the only point that really matters to most people is the first one. So make it work. So this is kind of all that most people care about. This is all that your client cares about, your stakeholder, the users. The users don't care if your code is tidy or not. They just want it to do the thing. And um, 
The rest is something that we can choose to do. We don't have to do. <clears throat> we can choose to do it if we care about the person who will be meeting, maintaining, to go, maintaining your code going forward. And one thing to note is that that person might be you. So the way that I think about it is that the first point is for the client, and then the rest of the, the rest of the points, two, and two three, and four, um, are for the future caddy. So conversely, what is bad code? And um, what you might have noticed that, that what we consider to be bad code is not code that's not performant, because that doesn't really come up that often. And it's not even code that doesn't work, because that would be broken code. We consider bad code to be code that we don't understand, and code that's difficult to maintain. So it will be, it will be code from us two years ago, or code from a developer that's just left, or code from a code base that you've just inherited. We will look at it, we don't understand it, and we think it's bad code. Now, I love this comic. Um, I spent a good hour trying to find it, so please enjoy it. I think this is very indicative of what it feels like to go into a new code base that you know, has a history. Uh, you'll be in a jungle, you're looking around, you don't know what anything is. There is a random structure that leads to nowhere. There are code comments that aren't helpful. There is like a very efficient road from A to B. And there are contraptions that you just don't understand the purpose of. But one thing to note is that no one writes bad code on purpose. I mean, I hope you don't. Like, chances are, unless you are chaotic evil, you're not going to wake up in the morning and think, you know what, today I'm going to really mess with the person who's going to maintain this. There was probably a reason for how it is. There was probably a reason for this weird workaround. But you just don't know what it is because that person maybe doesn't work on the code base anymore. Or just you don't remember. So the key takeaway here is that we need to communicate the history of the weird decisions in our code base. Speaking of keys, um, one thing that I actually do get a lot when I ask people about what they think good code is, is that they want it to be consistent. I think a lot of you will have the same opinion. So whether it's you know, double quotes or single quotes or constant functions or function functions or default exports or uh, named exports, you don't really care as long as it's the same across the code base. You, know, you could adapt, but it's going to be annoying where, where, when one file has a constant function, one is a function function, then you've got a React class somewhere, and it's going to frustrate you. So you would rather have a consistent thing that's maybe not your preference than your preference, but only 50% of the time. The problem with consistency in JavaScript is that there aren't consistent best practices. Best practices are subjective to you, your experience, uh, maybe what you've done in the past. What I think is good code right now for me is probably not what you think is good code from right now for you. Also, even if you decide that you're going to take the most popular code trend and go with that, code trends also change over time. So even if you look at React classes versus React hooks, or if you remember that phase with render props, um, you know, things get popular and then they go out of style. So even if you manage to boil down what's cool, what's in right now in JavaScript, what's considered good practices, and write your code like that, in two years' time, that will be out of date because the practices have changed, and therefore, your code is now bad. The other reason why it's really hard to have consistency in JavaScript is we have almost no rules. So JavaScript as a language is kind of a free-for-all. And lots of options is good, but too many op options makes it difficult to form decisions. That's why, as a JavaScript community, we are making rules for ourselves to help us make decisions. So this is why we have ESLint. This is why we have Prettier. This is why we have TypeScript. This is why we have all of these front-end frameworks, which basically make some code decisions for us, and then we can follow the best practices from them. 
So one thing that I, I talk about Elm a lot, actually, because uh, I find it fascinating. So if you've not heard of Elm, it's a, a front-end language. You can write websites in it. It compiles down to JavaScript, but it's nothing like JavaScript. And it is incredibly opinionated. There are very strict rules for code flows. So uh, Elm uses a, it's like a, it's, some, it's a form that's similar to MVC, so it's called model view action update. Pardon me. Uh, a model view action update loop um, where you have a model which describes your data, you have a view that displays the data, then the view can trigger actions, which will be you know, a button press, and then you have an update function that updates the model, which then updates the view and then goes in a loop. And you're probably all familiar with this because this is the architecture that Redux was inspired by, so it's exactly the same. But the whole language is, is built on top of it. It also comes with its own linter, so even though this might look odd to you, every single Elm project will look like this because the linter will enforce it. And also there's generally only one correct way to do things. So what they do in Elm is um, they promise no runtime exceptions because the Elm compiler forces you to address all the edge cases. Um, Now, the good thing about this is that this makes good practices universal. So chances are, if you are an Elm programmer, you've written an Elm project, you're proficient in it, and then you pick up another Elm, Elm program, you kind of already know what it's going to look like, the code indentation that's going to be the same, and also you know what the control flow is, because there's only one way to really do things. But the reason it hasn't picked up as much as it could have based on all of these amazing promises is that it has a huge learning curve, especially for JavaScript developers, because we're used to being able to be absolute cowboys. Now, on a slightly less extreme side uh, is an example from Python. So I've, I always liked Python as a programming language. Um, and Python actually does have some enforced um, annotation that's from the, um, from the language. So for example, Python doesn't have any braces. So the, um, for example, if you have an if statement, you would use spaces to show um, what's inside the if statement, which makes like the code flow a little bit readable. Uh, but actually what I really enjoyed from Python is the, uh, the Zen of Python. So this is a very well-known Easter egg in Python. So if you open a Python REPL, on your computer and you type in import this, then you'll get this little poem printed out, which is called the Zen of Python. And it was put in by um, an American programmer um, who was working on Python, who was a core contributor. And this poem is basically about the philosophy around the Python programming language, how it was built. And it's like specific, but also not. So this, it's got some things here that are applicable to all languages. So, you know, explicit is better than implicit. Readability counts. Errors shouldn't pass silently unless explicitly silenced. So I really like this, and I, I've, I've always wished we would have something like this in JavaScript. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible because of all the options we have. Um, because there are different communities of JavaScript and we would never agree there is no central governing body um, that could set the Zen of JavaScript and get everyone to follow it. Um, our good code is very personal to us, personal to our project instead. But thankfully, you have the absolute power to do the Zen of your code base. Um, because you are in control of what is good and what is bad in your code base, you can define what good code is in your code base. You can define the rules, you can agree on the rules, and the, what is good code for the code base is shipped with the code base. So the definition of good is part of your code base. All right, that's enough on the history. Now for the tips. Now, I'm, going, I'm basically boiling this down to two suggestions. Uh, again, you know, it's completely optional. As in JavaScript, you can do whatever you want. 
but these hopefully are aiming to address the two biggest problems, I think, that we have with good code, which are consistency and history. So this, I, I put it down as a lead dev suggestion um, because it's kind of up to the lead dev on a project to enforce this. And this comes from the Zeno Python. So it's to document and enforce style decisions in your code base. So you can think of it as the Zen of your code base. So something that um, I, I like doing when I start a new Greenfield project, because uh, a lot of the time it will be with people I've never worked with. They have uh, different levels of experience. They've um, got different views of what good code is. Maybe they've heard something that I will like, but I haven't heard of yet. And um, what I like to do is we get together with the whole dev team for an hour, maybe even two hours. And then we just talk about how we would like to do this project. I mean, technically me as a lead developer, I could just say, I set the rules, this is good code, we're doing this. But I found that it's much better if the whole team has the ownership of like, what we agree to be good code, what we agree to be um, the style decisions for this particular code base in this particular point in time. So we would have this talk, we will talk about, you know, we will talk about whether we use um, TypeScript or not, um, whether we use double quotes or single quotes, um, whether we use React classes or function components, and we document them. We add a section to the README uh, for code style decisions. Um, we make sure everyone's included, everyone's on board, everyone agrees to follow them. Then it's up to, up to the lead to set up linting or whatever code checks on CI to enforce what can be enforced, and also continuously improve the rules and refer back to them at code reviews. And one important part of this is also to walk through new joiners um, when they join the project. So I found that a lot of projects, you just have a big confluence page with all the, this is, this is all the links to all the repos, go for it. But I found that maybe half an hour or an hour of my time, one-on-one, -on -one, where I talk through what the philosophy is in our code base, show them the, um, the folder structure, um, anything odd in that particular code base, will give so much to that developer that they couldn't read just from a confluence page. And you can keep it simple. So it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, so there's an example of just a section of the readme with some code style decisions. This is not very complex. It's basically saying, you know, we're using index.js files. We don't use index.js files, sorry. We keep everything named. We use named exports. We, um, you know, use React functions, uh, things like that. So it's something that just on our initial call, that's what the team thought was valu valuable to agree on. And we wrote it down, and we agreed to follow it. And if someone comes on board, they have a suggestion, we talk about it, and we can change things as, um, as code styles change, as people's opinions change. But it's written down and everyone's on board. Now, if there's one thing, in my opinion, that you can do to make your code more maintainable, just one thing, it would be this. And it is to always explain in a code comment unusual decisions in your code. Now, this may be obvious, but sometimes it's worth reiterating things that may seem obvious. And what I mean by unusual decisions is the decisions that maybe frustrated you or annoyed you or you wish you didn't have to make. So, for example, uh, unusual API responses. I worked on a project once where the API didn't return a null or an undefined for an empty value, it returned a string with a space in it. And that is unusual, so I added a comment for that to explain why we had to have front-end code to handle this. Or due to our browser quirks, I think all of us have had to add some special CSS to make things work in Safari or Chrome or Opera, and it's just with that particular browser bug that you spend two days working on, and you've got some weird CSS there, and the next developer is going to come and go, why? <laughs> But if you have a code comment there, it will save them a whole lot of time and they don't think that it's a road to nowhere. And also due to complex and unusual business logic. So sometimes the client or whoever you report to just wants something that's weird. 
There's no way to do it cleanly with the API, and they're the ones paying the bills, and sometimes you just have to. At this point, I would just write a comment. I would even link to the Jira ticket, going like, sorry, this is weird, but this is why. And just to show you a couple of examples from my team's code base. So this is an example of a filter. So it's a particular price filter. So the filter has a range in it. So if I was designing an API, I would have an object with like a min and a max. Um, but that's not what this API does, unfortunately. It um, returns the min and max values as a string where you have min dot dot max. So in order to extract these values, in order to actually do the filters and display the filters, uh, we need to use a regex. And here's a con code comment to ex explain why. And here's another example. So this is due to a third party library. So there was like a weird side effect. If you close the li library inside the modal, it calls the onClose method twice. But we do some async stuff in the onClose method. So we want it to be called just once. So we added a little fallback, added a comment. And I mean, I work in React Native, so this is an example of, oh, something doesn't work properly on Android, so we had to do a workaround. And this basically explains why. And one thing, so you might um, think that um, you, there are some people in the world who are against code comments. And to be honest, I'm one of them. Um, I don't comment my code. I believe that code should be self-documenting. I believe that with the code flow and with the um, variable names and function names, you should be able to get a really good idea of what the code does. And if you can't, you should refactor it. But I do this. I comment things that are unusual, and that makes them stand out, and that makes them more useful. So in summary, here are my two tips. You decide what good code means for your project. Document the zen of your code base in your readme and enforce it. And secondly, every code base has a story. It has a history. It's had a life. Explain the things that are not obvious to the future you or the future developer. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be in the <laughs>
with our colleagues at work. I probably spend more time chatting to my colleagues than I do my other half at times. So I believe there is one thing you can do, and we'll come to that later. Now, the first thing I would do if I went back, I'd have to tell myself that getting a job after university, it's hard. It took me a year to get my first proper role. So what could I have done to make my journey get started sooner? What I should have done was after leaving uni, I should have spent more time getting into code. And what I mean by that is you can go online and there's lots of tutorials out there and like to-do lists and so on, but they're a bit boring. They're not going to keep you up all night doing that kind of stuff. You're much better off. Think of your hobbies, think of your pastimes, and if you can get something like that, that'll give you the passion, the drive, then go and develop something just on your own. Now, it may be that someone else has already done it. Don't bother with that. It has to be your idea, and then you develop that. And once you have your idea, I would thoroughly recommend going out and getting a whiteboard, pens, and a sticky note. Now, these are the kind of things that I certainly wasn't taught when I went to university. They teach you about how to code, but not how to do the practices around it. So you get your idea, then with that you split it down into a couple of epics, split those down into individual tasks, put them on your sticky notes, and put them up on your board, a physical board. In doing so, that gives you the sort of real satisfaction of moving it along from your to-dos to your dones. It also teaches you about best practices. How do you prioritize something? You know, you'll do a task, and I'd highly recommend, I know people, I've interviewed people, they don't even do this in their actual jobs. You know, people are moving from one job to another. So I thoroughly recommend, if you don't have an electronic version of this, get an actual physical board. It makes a difference. And in doing so, you can then get your behavioral practices. You can think about what you're doing. And when it comes to getting an interview, you'll have a real world example. Even though you've never done a job, this is a real world example. And they can ask you, well, how do you prioritize something? How do you teach yourself something? What happens when you've hit a blocker and then you've got to think about it again? You have to rejig things. These are ideal things to then get into uh, a position. Now, I did games at university. So my first job was in a games company with a AAA title doing Medal of Honor. Now, this is always super exciting as a developer. You know, what better things do I do than making games? So the place was in Scotland. They were doing the cooperative mode, and America were doing the single player mode. So but unknown to me, because I was a very naive programmer at the time, was essentially the place was going downhill very fast. But I didn't realize that. So the first few weeks, everybody had headphones on, you know, because they were in the zone. Why were they in the zone? Because there was literally thousands of bugs. When I went in, I was shown a spreadsheet, and there really was thousands of bugs. And because everyone had their headphones on, there was no support. I think my entire time in that place, I maybe had one, two meetings with management to see how I was getting on. So it was like a nightmare environment for a junior developer coming in. What on earth am I doing? This massive code base, which you know, you've never encountered before because at uni, you only get tiny little projects. So in that regard, you know, it was just terrible. And to make matters even worse, the entire team then left to go to America to join up the single player team. But I was getting married, so I couldn't go. So I was stuck in an office working American hours you know, it was fine, I was, I was just happy. I was getting pizza, takeaways each night, all on the company expenses. I was expected to, you know, they'd come back eventually and it'd all be all good. But no, it wasn't. So there's me sitting there. Yep, everything's fine. Essentially, the place is on fire, but I didn't realize it. And obviously, the game got released. Then the guys come back and then half of them got made redundant, including myself. So other than saying, you know, life sucks, what can you get out of that? So if a place feels like chaos, it probably is. So you have to look for an exit strategy. What I should have been doing was I should have been looking at the code, taking out chunks of it, because there's massive design patterns in there that I hadn't experienced. I should have been pulling them out, putting them into small individual units, and trying to debug them, put tests around them, and trying to just figure out what was going on so I could teach myself things to then bring on to another position. And then I was almost like coasting, which is not really what you want to do. In terms of learning, I'd say to anyone here that is a sort of manager or senior person, you've got to support your junior developers. Like, I don't understand why on earth you spend the time hiring, going through CVs, all that stuff, only to then completely ignore them and just leave them wondering what on earth are they doing. And headphones. I know developers love to have headphones to get in the zone to code, 
but in an office environment, they're really not the best thing for turning around and actually asking people ideas. So if you do have to have them, take them off and just go and ask someone, are you doing okay? And later on, there's one firm I worked with and they had a great solution to this, but we'll come to that later. And for you as the junior developer, there's never learning in isolation. So I would say never stop asking questions. You know, don't ask the same questions, but never stop asking questions. Because even as someone comes in and they speak to perhaps me, a senior developer, and ask questions, then I've got to remember something. Because if they're looking at the code, then obviously it's not clean code if they're not understanding it. And I might look at that and go, okay, that needs refactored. So it's good for people to be asking senior developers questions as well as you learning at the same time. So now we jump on like five years. Another couple of sessions have passed me by. I've gone through them. I'm now in a digital web agency. And one of the senior manager web developers has gone and created an app, but they didn't quite get the paradigm shift between web pages and application development. So I came in with my expertise and I was asked to make it work. So I looked at it and I said to them, well, this needs to be completely scrapped and rewritten. Now again, I didn't have the experience then to understand that when someone's been working on something for six months, nine months, even though they knew it wasn't good, they've got a personal attachment to that code. So me coming in and saying it needs to be scrapped was a no-go. So they said, no, you're not doing that. You need to refactor it. So that's what I did. But I shouldn't have done that. All too often as a developer, we just jump into the code. I shouldn't have. I should have stopped and taken note of something. And I should have done what I call a request for change, RFC, or a root cause analysis. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. I should have documented what was wrong with the existing app and the benefits of the new app. At the same time, I could talk to the stakeholders because that was already there. So the client had seen it. So I should have been asking them, what do they like, not like? And I put all these things in some sort of formal documentation, taken that to then management and said, this is your choices. And at the end of the day, that would make it much easier to decide the correct route. But I said, I didn't do that. I just made it work. Or at least I thought I just made it work. I got it rendering down, say, two minutes, down to a minute. And eventually, it was like almost a second. So at that point, I push it to production, and I'm happy with it. I give it to the client. He's still not happy. Like, what on earth? It works on my machine. You know, it's a common phrase. And although this was 15 years ago, I had this issue just a few months back, and I also heard the phrase, it works on my machine, just two days ago in the workshop. So it's as pertinent today as it was 15 years ago. So anyway, I went up to the client's office, and what did I see? They had these archaic machines. So it's any wonder it wasn't running. As a developer, you'll always have probably the best machine out there. You know, it's really powerful. You've got to remember your clients probably don't have that. So if you speak to your clients, you need to understand what they're running it on. So it's a key thing there, is just remember what the device will be that whatever it is you're creating is gonna be running on. So essentially, you need to take ownership. You know, I was the one with expertise coming in. I should have said, no, I'm not going to just tweak it. I'm gonna fix it properly. Speak to your customer or clients. Too often we don't really do that. We ignore the stakeholders or we just do what we want to do and stop to think about what you're doing. Now, a little bit later on in this firm, redundancy again, but this time I was more prepared for it. And this is where I got my big break, as I would say. So the work was drying up. What do I do? Well, I created my own website, just a blog post, and I was digging into the code. I was doing Adobe Flex at the time. It was really big. So I spent as much time doing little code snippets, tutorials, wizards, you name it. It'd be a bit like today, you looking at React 18 and seeing the latest hooks are coming out and making examples around those. So I'd thoroughly recommend you do that just so then you get to know the code inside and out. And that's what then gives you that knowledge to then go away. At this point, I either went into the contracting world because contractors generally jump into a, a bad situation and fix it. And by knowing code inside and out, you can get to do that. And then people will trust you with what they're doing. Now, past two stories have been kind of a bit depressing, made redundant in both of them, because, you know, that's what happens at times. I come to this place called a crazy place, and it's for a good reason, but it's all positive. Like, we look at this, this guy's got a gas mask on in the office. This is long before COVID was ever a thing. Like, why do you get a gas mask on? Again, we were at a mobile development company, and lots of tablets. This is our stand-up. Sometimes we work remotely, sometimes we didn't. Guy there with a balaclava on. Now, this was a Belfast, so if you know a bit of Belfast, you might understand why, but it's just a bit of fun. 
We'd go out to lunch together, whole team, go to the shops, come back, play some games, have food, chat. Sometimes did team days out, went fishing on a boat. And we also, this is a very important thing I would say, as a team overall, marking your milestones. Now, what we were doing in this place, it wasn't released yet, but we were marking certain milestones that were going along. So, you know, someone would bring in a cake, maybe a couple of bottles or something. We'd also celebrate those birthdays. Just little things before the day got going, a wee team thing, and that matters. So why am I saying it matters? Because development isn't always about coding. It's about building a collaborative environment where you can be friends with people and get along. Now, consider this. You've made a fix for something. You've done some task. You've pushed, it had been peer reviewed. It's gone up and it's about to go into release. That release also has some critical things the clients are looking for. And then a little bit while later, you realize there's a bug in the code. And you're like, oh no, what do I do? This thing has to go out. And I don't know how major this bug is. At that point, the correct thing to do is tell your team to say, spotted an issue, can we all do a huddle, do some programming, peer programming, whatever, fix it, figure it out. That's only possible if you're in an environment where you trust each other and you're not going to get blamed. If you're in a blame environment where people point fingers and say it's your fault, then what would happen and has happened is that person tries to hide it. Goes into production and then they go, well, it's not my fault, you peer reviewed it. You know, it's a bad situation, so you must have a collaborative environment, which leads on to my next kind of point about being kind. Now, this is obviously a very generalized sort of comment, be kind, but you can apply it to so many points in your daily life. Peer reviews, you know, if you're going to see some code, always put something nice into it. You know, if you see a nice method, a nice bit of clean code going on, just say, this is really nice. And the same thing, if you're seeing some code, you think, I really don't like that, and you're going to put 20 comments against it, just don't do it. Stand up, walk across the person, and just say, have you got two minutes? You know, and then maybe do some peer programming. And that way, you're both learning, you can see what their point of view is, and they can see what yours is. And it just makes it less combative. And that way, you get a much nicer environment. And the music, I mentioned the headphones. This place had a, what I would say is a really good solution. It doesn't work in every environment, but in this one it was perfect. They had one machine set up purely for Spotify. Now, what happened is the developer would come in and they put their favorite artists in. And the whole day, it would just play everybody's music. So no one had headphones on, but you still got your music. So if you needed to get in the zone, that was fine. But if someone needed to speak to you, again, that was fine. You weren't in your bubble with your headphones. So if you can try that and you're a headphone kind of wearing company, definitely try and get a separate machine just for that. Now, we reached the long run, 10 years in one place. Now, there's obviously way too much to squeeze in the remaining minutes here, you know, so it's like 10 years. So I'm currently at a place called JP Morgan and it's a massive firm essentially, but with it being massive, you do get plus sort of things and negative things. For example, you've obviously got lots of bureaucracy, red tape, multi-managers, you name it. But at the same time, you have the benefits. This company it pumps in literally billions into technology every year. You know, three billion in technical innovation alone. Like that's just massive. And the benefits of that is you get time to do something right. You know, there's obviously times you've broken something that happens. But if you get time to do it right, then hopefully it doesn't break too often. I work in the Glasgow office and it's gone from like 500 to two and a half thousand. You know, it's constantly expanding. You know, and if you ever did want to move from one place to another, you can do that. I've got colleagues that have gone from Glasgow down to like London or even New York for that matter. So we'll come on to my top tips from uh, working here. COVID has changed the office environment quite a bit. You know, in the past, you'd be in your chair, you'd swing around, I'd go to my colleague, hey Garth, I've got an issue, you've got two minutes. You can't do that as easily now because we're virtual. You know, some people do go in the office, some people don't. So how do we get around this? Our team, what we did was we had a separate machine. So I've got an office in my house and I've got a separate machine, which is purely for Zoom. So in the mornings, we'd have a put on Zoom, we'd have a catch up, just as if you're meeting in the kitchen for a cup of tea or whatever. You do that and you then have your stand up and you would leave it up the whole day. Now, yes, you put yourself on mute, but it's there. So if I want to turn around to my colleague, I can just turn around to my other machine and say, hey, Garth, you got two minutes. And if he does, then he just unmutes ourselves and we just have a chat. So it's the exact same, but it's virtual. 
But having a separate machine, which is not on your development machine, makes sure that you can have it on the whole time. And I would say that we're very visual people. You know, we need to have, we have a conversation, you need to see their, their expressions. So, and this goes against the grain for a lot of people, is having a webcam on the whole time. You feel a bit conscious, but after a while, you get used to it. And it was a great sort of leveler, leveler and kept us this sort of cohesive team, even though everybody was miles and miles apart. Another thing that we do is we do events. Here, you can be, we're seen digging some ponds in a wildlife park. Like, what on earth is that got to do with code? Nothing, really. But this had a direct impact the following week for me because I was chatting with guys as we're digging these holes, and then I needed a favour done in the office the next week. And if it wasn't for knowing these people, it might take me a couple of days to find the right people to get the task done. As it was, it was a five-minute job. Sorted. We also have smaller, random, fun things. Instigated a Friday question, but essentially people just ask one random question on a Friday morning, and then it has to be something you don't know the answer to. For example, one of the questions was, what's the deepest sauna in the world? Or how deep is the deepest sauna in the world? You know, and unless you're from Finland, you probably don't know the answer to that. And then later on in the afternoon, you give out the answer, and then people have a chat online and also in some of our text chat rooms. And what ended up happening was someone then shared a tip for an internal system, and then someone else shared a tip for one of the internal systems. And before you know it, there was half a dozen or more tips on our various systems that people didn't know about previous to this. So although this was just a random conversation with people having a bit of fun on a Friday afternoon, it led to a direct positive impact on the whole team. Now, depending on the size of the organisation, it's good to find a separate niche that isn't code. For example, and where I'm coming to with this is you can perhaps do local charity work. A lot of the guys go to schools and help children to code, which is ideal. You know, they might be interested in doing mentoring, how to do teaching. So again, graduates come into the office and you can take part in a programme to do the mentoring. Or hardware groups, maybe you're wanting to learn a different language. There's lots of multiple groups and you can lead these groups. So you're helping to spread your knowledge and do something outside of your day-to-day -day job. And it makes your job more fun. You know, like, what's better than getting paid to do what you enjoy and also helping others at the same time? For me, I did a bit of intellectual property. And what I've got up here was something that I didn't do this till perhaps the past three years or so. And some of us recognizing the work that I was doing. And I got a trip round the Isle of Wight, down the south of England, doing a yacht race, completely random, but purely because you're doing something extra and you're giving something back to people. You know, so finding your niche outside your day job, if you can do that, then just go for it. Now, coming on to this uh, one thing, as I said, you know, it took a while to sort of formulate this kind of idea, but this one thing I think that makes your work a little bit more interesting. So, interesting or interested. Now, what could I possibly mean by that? Essentially, social media perhaps has a, makes people focus more on themselves, and it kind of has negative consequences because people are trying to be interesting, whereas, you know, maybe she's more interested in people. You know, you'll probably know people that might want to say, go somewhere cool and take a photograph of coffee just to make themselves look interesting would it be much better to be interested in somebody and take them out for coffee. So it's one of those reverse benefit kind of things, a bit like Christmas. It's much better to give a present than it is to get one. And like one of the examples I had was when I was at the crazy place, there was one week I wasn't feeling too well, and one of the developers just gave me a gym pass so I can go get a swim and a sauna just to relax. Like he was genuinely interested in my well-being for no reason. He didn't want me to work more or whatever. He was just making sure that I was doing good. So. Being interested in people is one of these things where you can then just have a direct impact on your team. And your colleagues don't then just become colleagues, they're then your friends at the same time. And that's what you want. You want to become friendly with people so that when you go in on Monday morning, it's fun. Now, obviously all you guys here are interested in React and JavaScript, so you all have that in common. And I know the, the JavaScript, the software world, is quite a small world at times. The number of people I've bumped into along the way from a start of my career, I then see later on, you know. So I would challenge you to 
go and speak to people and just say hello to at least one person you don't know. And that one person you may find end up being your next colleague and your next friend. So and with that, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kenneth. I'm surprising you from this side. Uh, thank you, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I would also, if I could go back in history, I would tell my younger self something, but I don't think he'd listen. I think he'd say, fuck off, old man. What do you think you know? All right, uh, before we go for lunch, I have a very important mission that we need to solve together. Um, it is a distributed consensus problem. Um, our lunch is split into two rooms. On the second floor, we can fit about 300 people, and then the rest 70 people need to make their way to the basement where we have the same food. So how do we do this? I figured, do we sort it by height, you know, uh, you know, first letter of the alphabet? But no, you just have to figure it out. Um, this is the decentralized era of uh, internet, and uh, this is now your problem. And I assume this goes exactly as well as Web3 has so far. Um, so yeah. Go for lunch, uh, be back here in an hour, and if you have special dietary requirements, do not go into the basement, there is nothing for you there. All special diets are here in the second floor. Um, for Q&A, up to third floor, where the speakers will be for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you so much.
Pizza? Do you have a pizza? Do you need him? Yeah, he was Oh, um, Colin. He went to the hotel to change his jacket. Oh, yeah, he's not going to get that ticket. Oh, he's not? starts now. Oh, okay. If it works, it works. It has to work. It has to work. Was I okay or something? Hello everyone, now that it's the afternoon I'm back, I took a very good nap <clears throat> and I could go back to whatever we were doing. Did everyone have a good lunch? Thank you, thank you. I think that like all the time the website says like I hope like that your, your lunch is going to be terrible and every time I come here I'm like this is great. Like their food is great and their coffee is great. It's expensive but great. Okay, so we're now in the afternoon track. We have three amazing speakers coming up. <clears throat> the first speaker is Nick Graf. Nick came uh, all the way from Austria, which is actually not that far away. Get out. Get out of the stage. <laughs> and he's an ass. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so a couple of things about Nick. He apparently just ran an ultra marathon, which means he ran for 90 kilometers, which is 10 hours of running, which is like 10 more hours than I could ever run. So I do feel like that deserves a tiny applause. And I was like a week ago, and he's like walking now, like, like, like he didn't even run for 90 kilometers. What the hell is that? That's like all of Portugal, from top to bottom. It's like a third. Okay. Uh, so Nick came from Austria. He's currently working in his own products. Uh, he runs a noting app that's completely encrypted called Serenity. And he also does a bunch of courses, workshops, and everything. And I think the most incredible thing about Nick is that he's the only man that I know that can pull off a man bun without looking like a prick. And I think this is like even a bigger accomplishment than the ultra marathon. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> You're very Thank welcome. You. Enjoy. Um, as serious as Sarah, my talk will be. And I'm going to talk about the weird things about React. Um, so yeah, you already heard. I'm Nick. Um, I work on Serenity, end-to-end -end encrypted notes, documents. Um, looks like this. Uh, we're going to... There's an app already there, but currently rewriting everything, um, as you should. Um, and it, uh, yeah, basically I care about end-to-end -end encryption, privacy, and so on. So if you care about that too, come up to me later and, and we can talk um, about cryptography or whatnot. Um, I also do ACAD courses, uh, so you can find me uh, up there and uh, look for designing GraphQL schemas, for example. This will not go out of time. And um, I'm also a consultant or freelancer, depending who is asking. Uh, disclaimer, uh, this is not a complete list of weird things of React. So if you have something that bugs you, come up to me later, talk to me. I can uh, make an iteration of the talk and put it in there. And yeah, then let's start. Uh, so my journey actually started with 0 0.12 or 0 0.13 in React. and. Uh, then came 0 0.14, and everything was awesome. Like, I loved React. It was awesome. It was doing exactly what I needed and wanted. It was a UI library, not a framework, TM. And uh, then 15 came along. And that was a bit weird. Um, at this point, it's the first warning signs. Um, but on the other hand, they, they wrote this blog post that was, like, really, really long. It was long, long, long. So I felt like... Either this is dedication or a lot of guilt, um, but I don't care. Either way is fine for me. As long as they're committed, I run with it. Um, so I continued. And, oh, God, it takes a while. Um, so I went with 15, 16, 17, 18, and I'm still on React. So far, so good. The, and especially what I like about it is, so I wasn't concerned because what I like about it is every time I, I ran into a problem. There was a lot of information on the official docs, the twitter.com. 
Uh, you can always find information on Dan's uh, profile, on Sebastian's profile, Andrew, and so on and so on. It was, it's, it's just fantastic. And it, it's for real, you know? This, this is probably like a little bit seriousness. Um, so for example, do you know that flush sync from React DOM, you can actually force to, to flush everything? So in this example, uh, you can actually update your messages in the chat and then scroll to the last one. This works, you don't, you don't need an effect for it. It's fantastic. I actually missed that one. Someone in the, in the workshop told me about it. Uh, why did I miss it? Because it was on YouTube. It was tweeted on YouTube, but I don't watch all the YouTube videos that they are tweeting, so sometimes you miss it. But glad in the workshop was pointed out. And, but then another one, um, as for example, did you know, if you have a, a, a small component or application, that in this case, uh, there's a sum component which has a key on, which we can change on every button click. And the thing is that if you change the key, so for example, from ABC um, to J, GHI, it's really, it's remounting the component, the whole thing. It's, it's not in an array, in, not in a map, in a list or so. It's really, really cool. Um, where did I learn it? Exactly, Twitter. There's no mention of that in the talks. Oh no. But if you look at the last line, it's awesome. They're actually changing this. Um, they really make it better. Um, so initially, I didn't want to talk about it, but have you checked out the beta docs? They're awesome. And I didn't want to mention it because, like, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything. But I mean, if you Google for it, it's the first entry in Google. So um, fine to share, I hope. <laughs> and yeah, um, at this point, you might wonder you're in the state charts track. What is he talking about? Um, but on the other hand, I think you're too deep in and like getting up out is probably too weird now, so uh, enjoy the ride. Uh, let's talk about composition. So we're gonna jump around between different topics at this point. Um, composition. So the ones that are really long around um, uh, know about this. We had mix-ins in the past. This was, this was somewhat terrible. Uh, that was actually terrible. We had two-way data binding, you know, we're, we're coming from this sort of angular times, and you couldn't have a framework that didn't have two-way data binding. So of course, React had it as well. And we had Memo before Memo, pure random mixing, fantastic. Um, but then, yeah, uh, this came out, another blog post, and you realize, well, maybe not the best idea. And at this point, I felt like, maybe I'm part of an experiment? I'm not sure. It, it was a bit odd. Um, yeah. But anyway, you, you know, same as you in this talk now, I was, I was too deep into it and I just went along the ride. And then came higher order components and I was on the hype train. Loved the idea, I was, I was so fascinated by this. I, it was the first time I heard uh, about closures and functional programming and so on, it was fantastic. Um, and then in the end, when you build large applications, it was horrible, it was like unmaintainable. Uh, so we basically figured out we shouldn't do this. And if you look at the Recompose um, uh, uh, repository nowadays, yeah, they basically say don't, don't, just don't do it. Um, so we got rid of all the higher order components, well, not completely, but almost. Um, and yeah, and then came the, the one thing that I really hated from the beginning. Um, I really did, and I, I never said it loudly because you know you can't move against the community. Um, but random props, oh boy, the nesting here. It was deep and deep and deep and deep, and and you even had like people did random props when you didn't pass in any random props because just you, it was the feeling. And this was also the time um, when I started using like this colored uh, parentheses because <laughs> I couldn't stand it anymore. So in the end, I would say we tried everything. We really tried, and we ended up with folks. And I would say we can be happy. We, we, we found something, it works, we, it's pretty good. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad that I, I went along the ride and learned a lot about it, because maybe I would uh, challenge it at this point, but um, I think hooks are, are actually really interesting. Except when you talk to friends who are backend engineers or so, and then you start to explain them that we have stateful functions uh, at this point. And um, yeah, they're really, really cool, except you can't put them in a loop or in a conditional. Um, but apart from that, you're, it's awesome, and they're like, what? Um, 
but you're already so emotionally and, and like energized that you just continue on it. And yeah, because they, they actually helped us to get rid of non-extendable classes, um, which was the thing back then and like, what? Um, yeah, and then you just continue in emotions and you tell them about JSX. So we write our templates right into our business logic and yeah, then you lost a friend. Um, <coughs> yeah, but it was great. Um, so let me jump to the complete different topic again. Um, I love my named exports. There was this time I could do all my React components in, uh, with named exports and it was great. The, the auto completion was, was fantastic. I, I loved everything about it. And then came React Lazy. And I was like, oh God, why are you doing this to me? So basically, if you want to use React Lazy, you have to have um, the component exported as a default. And I was like, no, why are you doing this? Um, and yeah, I just was frustrated. And uh, you, you know, you, you try to, you're working with a team, and you, you try to come up with conventions. You're saying like, OK, we're only going to use name exports, uh, but for React components, we use default exports, and everything gets confusing. Except I very recently, and I haven't even tried it yet, learned that you can actually use named exports. It looks clunky, <laughs> but I'm going to go back to named exports if this works. I think it does. Um, except, again, using Next or Remix, they require you for all that the, their pages and routes to do named ex uh, default uh, exports again. So, yeah, maybe I give up. I don't know. Um, anyway, happens. Um, but the big question we'll be already talking about next here that I see uh, nowadays coming up now and then, um, and I really hope someone asks me this soon, uh, is should I go for React or Next.js? And I really, really hope someone does because if this happens to me, I'm going to be like this and then go for it. So, well, so React has GraphQL. That's really, really awesome to use. Next only has REST++ APIs, but it also has service rendering, so it's a tough choice. What do you think? <laughs> and yeah, I hope this happens soon. Um, and that said, we cannot blame Next. I mean, this is their landing page. They really, they really make it obvious uh, that they have a React framework. I mean, come on, this is, this is one of the biggest headlines I've ever seen. Uh, you, you cannot um, make it bigger. All right, let's jump to the next topic, TypeScript. So we have React types. Fantastic. I love TypeScript. I love typing. Um, it, it really, really helps me to, to stay sane. So uh, basically, with React types, um, you should do this. So you have a component, for example, and you have react.function component. And um, yeah, well, maybe not. You could also do FC as an alternative. So I really enjoy when there's multiple options. Um, I also thinking about the JavaScript proposal that we have fun, function, funky as uh, declarations for function names. But yeah, um, have to open the stage zero still. Uh, let's see. And then you learn that actually a lot of people that are Consider TypeScript experts, um, they all tell you, like, don't use it at all. What? Why, why, why we have React types if we shouldn't use it at all? So they are basically saying, well, it's bad. Mostly, this is like the, the most common argument, um, you have this implicit children. So that the children you can, to any component, you can pass them in or not, and React or uh, TypeScript will not complain at all. And basically, they're saying, like, yeah, you do. This instead, because then your children are not implicit, and you have to explicitly declare um, that if a component takes children or expects children, then you should pass it in. And I was like, okay, um, well, fine enough. Let's move the whole code base away from React FC. We do this, and uh, we are all good. And then, whenever you onboard someone and they have like they're just learning TypeScript or so. Um, they basically ask you, why? why? Why is this, the, when they discover the Reactive C thing and they're asking you why, and you're like, well, let's talk about something else. Um, yeah. And then, then came the, the savior, this pull request. 
I was so, so, so excited when I saw it the first time. So with React 18 types, they, they made a breaking change, they sneaked it in, um, because nothing in React regarding that change, but they, it's a good chance to, to do it. Um, so they get rid of the implicit children. Ba bam um, So what does this mean? Basically, if I'm having um, a component that accepts children, I have to explicitly declare now that these are children, if I'm expecting it. I, I can still make it optional, but like this, this is, uh, th there's a reason behind it. Because if you're doing this, TypeScript, TypeScript will not complain, will be happy, awesome, 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 but the component expects children, so if you don't pass them in, ta-da, TypeScript will tell you, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, and this exactly fits my mental model of what I'm expecting of a type system. You know, I took this Wikipedia um, uh, description. Uh, it basically tells the aim is to prevent operations expecting a certain kind of value from being used with values which that operation does not make sense. Yes, it should make sense, everything. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, and also the other way around. If I'm just leaving out the children, because I'm expecting, there's a component where I don't expect any children not doing anything with it. I basically wanna have this here. And if someone is using my component this way, they should get a TypeScript error or a warning or whatever. And so I was really, really happy. Wow, we could finally use React FC. Um, and then the best part, they even offered a code mod. So I don't know if you have, who has heard of a code mod? Raise your hands. Okay, half of the people. So code mod is basically like uh, tooling, CLI tooling, that you can run over your code base and it will fix your code base and basically fix all the breaking changes. So what does it do in, in this case? Um, so there's multiple changes that they, they had in this one um, types upgrade code mod. It basically um, fixes your, your uh, components with like React. Um, so it, it does this generics of generics and yeah, in the end basically, um, it should fix things. And what they're doing with this is the adding back children, because here it says like props with children. So I was like, wait a second. In my greeting component, which is not using children, what do you mean? Um, so I looked into props with children, what does it do? And then I thought like, have you learned nothing? <laughs> there are optional <laughs> children in there. It's like all these complaints and we're going back to this. Are you kidding me? Um, so like what is going on? I was like this. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, I didn't contribute. I never said anything. So I can only complain. Well, that's what it is. Um, but I have one suggestion, maybe for the next breaking change. How about we do this, props with optional children? It would make things slightly better. And what I can do now is I can use React FC and I can um, not use props with children at all. I, I would ban it from the code base. You will, yeah, I, I wish I could do, if you open a PR, then, then I would just write back you should think harder, but I will probably just write you an essay of like why this is the case, but yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Next topic, um, warnings. Warnings are awesome. Uh, React is really doing a great job with warnings. So um, I guess, who knows this warning? Like you, you, have, a, you have a state update, uh, exactly, yeah. So you're all not cleaning up your effects here, right? Um, but that's another topic, we, we come to that later. Um, so this is, it's kind of okay, nice, okay-ish, yeah. Um, it, it tells you at least what's going on and, and if you have time you can look into it and, and fix it. I mean it's, it's happening mostly on, only anyway uh, now and then. But the thing is, it's only good if you have control over it. If it's coming from a package, it's really, really annoying. And I wanna show you this, like this, this is for real. This is my day-to-day -day when I start coding. Um, this is my console log from, it's a React Native app um, with, with React Native Web. And then there's like just two components in there that just don't comply to some warnings. And you, I, I'm 
seconds to go down and find my first debug statement. This is really annoying. Um, yeah, so I was, I was like, oh God, why can I not get rid of this? And then I also recently learned that you can patch console log. And okay, the adult thing would have been to like now go into, an, into the app and, and fix this and, and filter out the, the console log and patch it. Um, but no, I felt like this is awesome for pranks. Um, so um, take this, this is really, really good. Um, so what, what, what is it doing? Basically, I, I show it to you, I copy paste it here. Um, so uh, console log it, you, you have to hide it in your code somewhere, sneak it into a PR. Be, uh, the larger the PR, the, 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 the better chances that you not get detected. And basically, when you then enter a console log, it will get hidden. And, and uh, right now it's 702 milliseconds. I don't wanna, like, I, I really wanna have numbers that are not easy to find. Um, and the thing is, yeah, you can see the guy with the mouse is really annoyed. Um, I know this is a bit off topic, but I think it's really important. There's no prank chair, so I have to put it somewhere here. Um, but, and I think that the, there, there's a lot of notion that we can put into it. So if you want to collaborate, let me know. Um, so I think like the, 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 the right time is, so when it's like shorter content, it, it should disappear uh, in a shorter time. I mean, it's larger content. So you want to you find the sweet spot where it's annoying, but they're not actually starting to look into it. <laughs> Um, yeah, good pranking. And of course, they, they sh don't make it easy for them. They should not find anything in your code base if, it, if they're looking for console, for log, or for clear. This is really, I, I put some effort into this, so, so make good use of it. Um, yeah, but back to my real problem. Um, I, I really wanted to put it in a lib and then open source it and publish it and so on, but preparing a talk is a lot of work, so uh, maybe next time. Um, yeah, I, I, I will definitely get rid of this problem. Um, all right, by the way, I did report one of them. The other one I couldn't re reproduce in an isolated setup. Um, so one is already fixed, but the release is not working for us because dependencies, oh, it's complicated. Um, but the other one, yeah, I, I will just patch, uh, whatever. So, um, getting to the last uh, big topic. Um, question, who of you is using strict mode? Who of you has an idea what strict mode is? <laughs> Half the hands, okay. <laughs> um, really? Uh, so strict mode is this thing that you can wrap your app around and basically it gives you warnings. Um, wait a second, raise again, who of you is using strict mode? Why? Okay, just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, well, so strict mode is really, really annoying. So um, uh, basically, if it's too annoying, just disable it. Um, I'm just kidding, but well, maybe seriously. Well, so what does it actually do? Um, there's this list on, on the React docs, not, not, not the twitter.com, but the, the really the react.org. Um, and they basically, they have this list and explanations. Um, mostly, so the first four are just about like legacy warnings um, that are annoying. Um, and to be honest, if you take care of your dependencies, uh, you probably, I mean, these are really outdated APIs. Uh, so I haven't seen them in, in, in months or years, maybe. Um, but the last two are interesting <laughs> because they, they came with React 18. Um, and they say detecting unexpected side effects and ensuring reusable state. So what I did doing is basically they making sure that when you start your application, they render everything twice, they run every effect twice, they, they basically do everything twice. And it gets really, really annoying. It has a purpose. Oh, by, by the way, only if you have strict mode and only if you are in development mode. So yes, that means if you're in development mode and have strict mode, your app will behave differently, basically, than in production. It's completely fine. Um, just kidding. <coughs> yeah, but the thing is, so it has this purpose that you basically start cleaning up your effects. You should do the proper cleanup. Um, 
And the purpose of it, that basically you want to, in the future, pre-render your components uh, so they can, can have like better user experience or take your, your stuff off screen from DOM and then put it back. Um, they, it, it has a good purpose. They, they, they're moving with this in, in, in some kind of direction. But the thing is, if you like, just get a friend of mine, like, they, he spent a day figuring this out. That it renders twice. I, it, the black uh, areas, yeah, the swear words that I had to comment out. And basically, there's no hint, no information, nothing. If you're in that situation in your browser and you, you, you get to that state where it's like, why is it rendering twice? Why is my effect running twice? There's no, no info at all. And I was like, come on. We have console log for everything. We have warnings for every little bit. And this one, we don't. And people, yeah, the people don't get it. You, you really don't need to point them to a link and, and, and show them, like, this is what's happening. And so in the, in the good old uh, uh, fashion of, like, oh, the good old times of React conferences, I'm happy to announce React Reduce Stress. Ta -da. <laughs> so what does it do? Well, by the way, this is, like, half serious, but it actually works. So, so I, I, I put a lot of love into it um, for one evening. Um, but so you can yarn install it. It's, it's really on npm and yarn and, and, and so on. Uh, you can start your app, then you go to your, your uh, uh, editor of choice, um, and you can import it. It's a default export. Sorry, I'm, I'm just still too used to it. <laughs> um, so you, you import reduce stress and you put it inside your strict mode. So next to your app, you, you can actually put it anywhere, um, except it, like, it really has to put in in, in a strict mode. Um, and what it will do is, this probably should go into the React core, but I will create an issue and see if they like this. Um, it gives you a warning hint. You are in strict mode, attention, your thing will render twice. Ta -da. And it gives you a link to go to, to read more, to understand what's actually going on. Um, yeah, uh, so this is React Reduce Stress. But let me explain a bit about the background. Um, it comes with uh, SMDS. Uh, never heard about it? Uh, well, it's the strict mode detection system. Mm -hmm. um, I found it uh, in the React code. Uh, so in their tests, how did they, how they, how they figure out the strict mode is on? They're basically catching console logs. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and. Uh, I hope the React code base is still the, the core classes. If not, I say it, it was code pilot and artificial intelligence doesn't uh, um, have any license, license issues, so awesome. The law, is just, the law is just better than React in any way. It's awesome. And I, I really did it, dark mode support. So the, the red is a, has a, a slight notion in, in dark mode. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of effort and of course we, only supporting modern browsers, uh, Firefox, uh, uh, Chrome, uh, Brave, Edge, uh, yeah, and we don't support uh, legacy browsers like Internet Explorer or Safari, obviously. Um, yeah, so to come to an end, because the next speaker wanna come along, uh, there's a lot more that I could talk about, but really we have to stop this now. Um, with all these gotchas in React, um, it had, it, it was a fantastic ride. I mean, I'm doing this, doing React since years. Um, and I learned a lot on the way, and I, I'm sticking around for the foreseeable future um, because it's still, it's still my framework of choice, uh, especially for native and so on. Like, I can do things that I could never imagine uh, a couple of years ago. And, and even with, like, I felt a bit like an, I was part of an experiment, learning all, a lot of weird things. Um, I still learned a lot, and I, I really enjoyed the ride. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue um, and complain, of course. Um, yeah. And but to, to have some conclusion for you as well, not only for me. Um, learn, have fun, and profit. So read the beta docs; they're really, really, really good. Uh, they're not complete, but there's a lot of like good examples. Uh, sneak in a console log prank, please. Um, and install React Reduce Stress. Um, and finally, you're getting to your stage charts. Thank you very much. I hope it was a pleasure. <laughs>
I don't know about you, but I love rent talks, and I'm really happy we have actually have two talks that are basically just rents. That fills my soul. So we had that rent, and now David is gonna just basically rent about state management. And because he wasn't here to do the tech setup, I have to just uh, you know tell you things in random shit to keep you entertained. Um, one time I remember that I was coding this React app and I was making like a fetch request and because he was on strict mode, I couldn't understand why he was making two fetch requests and he legitimately took me like two hours to understand he was strict mode and it was because Code Sandbox put strict mode by default. Because I didn't even put strict mode, it wasn't even my call. It was just there. And then two hours later I was like, oh, so I'm not stupid. And the computer said, no, this doesn't prove anything. And I was like, okay, that's valid, thank you. Um, so, our next speaker is David. He came all the way from Florida, where every day is moist day. <laughs> Apparently every day is 35 degrees and 90% of humidity. And now, because he didn't do his tech check, his computer is not working. No, I'm working on it, hold on. Is it working? No. <laughs> He's having issues. Because he wasn't here, because he decided to change clothes, didn't you, David? Uh, yeah. You wanted to look pretty for your talk. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, David came all the way from Florida and he's just setting up his, his computer right now. So right now, uh, David works at Stately, uh, which is a company he founded himself, like a, like a good boy. Founded his own company, look at an adult. He also owns a house, which is very impressive for anyone who's a millennial. And now he's like, I'm actually 45. And I'm like, oh, okay, never mind then. And it's, oh, thank God. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, so he's going to talk about state management. Is the CEO of Stately. And please welcome David. All right. Hello, everyone. So I was going to talk about use effect like I've been talking for the last few months, but if I just installed React Reduce Stress, then, you know, I wouldn't have had to talk about it at all. Use effect is terrible, don't use it. That's basically all of my talks. But now we're gonna talk about two types of state management, and honestly, use effect is not that terrible. So, uh, my name is David Korshid. I'm at David K Piano pretty much everywhere online. And uh, like Sarah said, I'm the founder of stately.ai where we think about state management all the time. So, uh, there's a lot of choices for state management out there today, like Immer, Redux, XState, which I maintain, MobX, Jotai, Recoil, Zustand, RxJS, the list goes on and on. There's so many choices. So my goal here today is to help you choose the best state management. And I promise I'm not biased at all, even though I created XState. So uh, we're, we're gonna talk about this and I'm gonna help you make a decision based on your needs, right? So first of all, why do we have state management in the first place? And uh, the reason is because before we had singletons and we had global mutable states and we all decided that global state and mutable state is just a really bad thing. But have you thought about why it's a bad thing? Well, the thing is that mutable state isn't actually a bad thing, not at all. In fact, none of our apps would work if we didn't have mutable states. It's shared mutable state that's bad. And the reason it's bad is because with shared mutable state, we have accidental complexity leaking in. It's because when you have something that could be mutated from multiple sources, now you don't know what is updating what. You can't isolate your logic. So your code becomes very hard to understand and it becomes very messy and your tests fail for no reason. So, uh, and also on a technical aspect, React works with immutable state because it's using referential checking to see should I update this component or this part of the component, like basically should I do a re-render? And so when you have mutable state, the references are the same, React's gonna say, oh, okay, yeah, it's the same object. And so that's a problem. So getting that out of the way, shared mutable state is the root of all evil and this is what causes accidental complexity in our code base. So again, you know, mainly because of React, but also because for developers, it makes it really hard to understand our code. So um, we could actually experience a lot of these problems with accidental complexity, even when we adopt better state management strategies. So uh, all of these state management libraries, including you know, just React itself, if you're using 
uh, the normal state hooks are subject to this complexity, and they love to use counter examples because that's the simplest thing you could do, right? So um, let's start with the use state hook. This is a very simple counter example, and if you are a lucky developer working for a company that all they do is make counters, then you're set. You could just use React hooks, you could use state all day long. So we have use state, you know, we have set counts where we could increment the count and decrement the count, and this is as simple as you could get in React. So why do we need state management solutions? Why do we need any of the other hooks? Well, it's because our requirements are never as simple as this. Let's say that we added a very simple requirement where we wanted to only count between 0 and 10. Okay, so now we have to add a few things, and because I put my logic in the event handler, I'm just going to put the, uh, the conditions right inside of there. It still doesn't look too bad. I could still fit it on one line, unless ESLint yells at me, and then I have to make it three lines because I need those curly braces for no reason whatsoever. But now, there's, uh, there's a problem. Because, um, you know, I, I might want to increment it and decrement it in other places, so it's a good thing to just move these into callbacks up here. And, uh, you know, if I'm super, super, um, you know, cautious about performance, I will wrap these in used memo, thinking that it will give me better performance. Spoiler alert, it will not, or at least it will, like, a very minuscule amount, and you're going to increase your memory usage, so performance or balances itself out there. Um, and also, look down here. Some developer on my team decided to add an input where I could change the state whenever I want on blur. So when I increment, sure, I won't be able to go above 10. When I decrement, I won't be able to go below zero. But now, you know, if you just type any number in here, you, uh, you could still go above 10, below zero. And um, yeah, so let's fix that problem. We could just put everything into change count and I forgot to highlight these, but now when we change counts, we are ensuring that we're only setting the counts to a value between 0 and 10. So did this solve our problem? Not really, because we still have this set count variable available. And if you take it out of there, then, you know, another developer might just add it in. So you're still culpable of, um, you know, just introducing impossible states in your app. So um, let's get a little bit smarter about this very simple counterexample, and let's actually use a reducer. You know, that big uh, nasty hook that we sort of eschew for use state, which is actually really useful because it does give meaning to uh, how we could update our state. So now I could clearly see there's three operations I could do. I could increment, decrement, set my state, and I could also ensure with this cool little math.min, math.max, that it stays between 0 and 10, no matter how high or low of a number I set. And then over here, all I have to do is send and uh, use an event object and just uh, send it over. By the way, if you didn't know about e.target.value as number, really, really useful. Stop trying to cast your strings as numbers from events. You could just use value as number. Um, it's extremely useful. All right, so use reducer. It is useful. But now let's say that we want to share the state with multiple components. So we would use context. So we would first create a context, and then we could read the counts from this context because we're passing it into a context provider in the value down here. OK, simple enough. You know, we just hoist this to the top of our app so that we could use it in our components. And um, now we actually don't have a way to send events to it, though. So we can't really increment or decrement. So that's a little bit of a problem. OK, so let's, uh, let's bring that in, too. So now um, I'm also passing in send. So I actually have that send along with the count. So what's the problem here? I mean, we have count, we have send. We could share it with all of our components. Well, if you've ever done any sort of state management with context before, you're going to get bitten by the fact that components are going to re-render unnecessarily. So instead, we're going to set up some sort of subscription because we don't actually want our components to re-render. We want to subscribe to the values from the components that actually care about the counts. So um, we're going to have some sort of store that we make. We could subscribe to that store. And we still have our send function, so we could send events to the store. And we're also keeping the state up to date just by subscribing 
to that store, and whenever we get get account, we're back to our good old friend use state in our components. So this ensures that only the component that cares about the count actually re-renders, which is great. But then there's another problem, and that's, you know, let's say that we have a component that only cares about even numbers, or only cares about if you're at the lowest or the highest value. So instead, we need to have some sort of selector mechanism because we want our components only to re-render when the specific state or uh, derivation of state that we need in the component uh, you know, is what we expect. So uh, right now I'm just reading counts, but you can imagine this transforming to uh, whether it's even or odd or min or max or something like that. And uh, you know, we have a small little use selector hook that's just making sure that we are only saving the state of you know, the, whatever we're selecting. And so with all that, we've solved our problems and we've recreated Redux, you know, the, the thing that we tried to uh, move away from. So that's, uh, that's one of the problems of state management when you're using hooks. And so I'm sure that anyone who's worked on an application complex enough knows that hooks are really not sufficient for more complex, and just, I, I'm not talking about like really complex state management, but anything more than a trivial level of state management. And so that's why we have a whole bunch of state management libraries, and I've separated them into two rough categories. So some are use state-like, where we're directly manipulating states, and some are use reducer-like, where we're indirectly manipulating states by dispatching events, or actions as it's called, you know, in Redux. Um, but let's, let's simplify this even further. So instead of it being use state and use reducer like, we have direct and indirect ways of managing this state. So let's go through a few libraries and see what the landscape looks like today. Uh, first we have recoil where we have this notion of atoms and so this is one of the direct ways of updating states. Uh, you would just um, you know, set text, you use recoil state. So it feels very much like use state and you could just manipulate it from everywhere. There's also a vault here, which is uh, not, not really exactly the same. You have this you know, uh, global-ish state, so you could use a snapshot of the state, and you could directly manipulate that state over here. It's using uh, a proxy to just uh, maintain observers in the components so that uh, it's only going to re-render when, um, you know, for, for the things that are actually reading the state. Uh, there's also MobX, which you know, has been around for a while. And so with MobX, it does have the notion of these actions like increase timer, but at the same time, you could still just directly manipulate the state and it's going to cause your component to re-render uh, when the state updates. So we could see that down here. We have mytimer.increase timer, which can feel like an event, but again, you could just directly manipulate the state too and get the same effect. And there's also Jotai or Yotai, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Uh, but this is very similar to Recoil, where you have atoms and you could just uh, read the atom and just, you know, of course, manipulate it from anywhere. You have this set text, for instance. So it feels very much like Recoil. And so these are the direct uh, state manipulation libraries, or at least uh, some of the more popular ones that I've seen. So now, indirect, event-based. There's a few options to choose from. There's Redux, and the example's actually uh, Pretty long, not as long as I thought. There's Redux Toolkit, which actually makes your old school Redux a lot simpler, and I do recommend using Redux Toolkit if you're coming from Redux. Um, you know, you have your reducers, your slices, and you would send events. So you grab dispatch from use dispatch, and then I didn't highlight it here, but you just dispatch events and the state updates, and you could read the state using selectors. There's also Zustand, Zustand. I'm terrible at pronouncing state management names. Uh, but it is sort of like Redux, uh, where instead of just having uh, different actions, you have these functions over here, and you read set, and then you could just um, you know, set the state within those actions. And you also have, um, I guess, a selector mechanism over here. These create a, uh, a hook, which is pretty cool. So you have use bear store, and then you could just read the values that you care about, and your components will re-render uh, you know, when that value changes. And so you could just um, grab, the, uh, grab the action in the same way that you read the state and uh, just uh, you know, manipulate the state that way. It's still an indirect way of manipulating the state because 
I think you can't really like directly change, for example, the number of bears. You have to either click increase population or remove all bears, which sounds very grim. Bears aren't that bad. Um, and of course, there's also xdate. So xdate, you create this machine definition. And honestly, like you don't need to think in finite states and nested states, parallel, whatever. You could use xdate pretty much the same as you would use sysgen or Redux, where you have this context with data, and then you have these, um, you know, these transitions where you could assign two contexts. So you know, you could add one, subtract one, and then you basically have the same mechanisms where, just like use reducer and Redux and sysgen, you could um, indirectly manipulate the state by sending events. So uh, there's also local versus global, but all of the libraries I mentioned are global capable, which means that you could use them in a global context and basically read the state and uh, you know, manipulate the state from anywhere in your React tree. And if you wanted a more local solution, then that's where use state and use reducer would come in handy. There's also multi-store versus single store. Uh, and I know that Redux and Zushan made, the, uh, made the, um, the decision to have only a single store uh, just because it's, um, I guess, easier to implement. You have this single source of truth, whereas you have uh, multi-store solutions, including X states, where you could have multiple stores, which means that you could use these bits of state at any level of your application, and um, you could have different concerns for different parts of your app. Whereas with Redux and Zushan, you have this idea of slices where um, you know, different slices would pertain to different responsibilities in your application. So uh, you know, they sort of more adhere to the single source of truth. But one important thing, and this is, you know, I I'm gonna mention a few important things in this talk, but one important thing that I want you to know is that single source of truth is actually a lie. There is no single source of truth in your app. And the reason is because Data, your state lives everywhere, and so um, you know you have to uh, just be able to read this data from everywhere. You have different things that you're communicating with, whether it's the DOM, whether it's some GraphQL API, whether it's some separate service or some separate library. Um, there, you, you can't assume a single source of truth. Uh, there's also effect management, which I'm not gonna get into. Uh, different state management libraries have different ways of managing effects, uh, but the other important thing I want to tell you is that effect management is state management. So instead of just thinking in terms of when I have an event that comes in, this is the next state that we get, it's important to think about what are the effects that happen as a result of my state transition or as a result of the state changing due to the, um, the event. Uh, there's also two types of uh, performance optimizations that libraries typically do whether it's selectors, which I consider a manual approach, doesn't mean bad, it's just manual, and observers, which is more of an automatic, magical approach. So that's another consideration to uh, keep in mind. So um, you know, I have less than 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna summarize a little bit. We've talked about a few things, directs versus indirect, single store versus multi-store, effect management, performance, but none of this actually matters. And these aren't really the things that I want you to think about when choosing a state management solution. So what are the important things? Well, the first thing is correctness. You want to make sure that your application logic is bug-free, accessible, doesn't have race conditions, adheres to specifications, and is verifiable, which means whatever user stories you're handed from your PM, does the logic actually match that? And is it going to introduce bugs or prevent bugs? Also, velocity. Whatever solution you choose, are you able to add, change, remove features quickly without removing bugs? Are you able to onboard your team quickly so that they themselves can add features and make changes uh, rapidly? And also maintenance, like how well can you map your application logic to documentation, performance? Uh, how could you, you know, better test your application logic? Do you have a single source um, where you could just isolate your logic and actually uh, unit tested, uh, integration tested, and all of that. So those are the three things. And so that's why, you know, I haven't really talked about state machines yet, but um, I, one of the reasons that I love state machines is because state machines allow you to express both the specification, like this user story over here, and allow you to go more into detail and refine the parts of your state machine with actual implementation logic. 
And so, uh, you know, that's why I created X dates. And so that's why um, in helping you deciding which state management is best for representing these kinds of flows, the real answer is the one that your team is the most comfortable with, right? Um, I, I don't mean to say that X state's the answer, it's, you know, not, but like, uh, we've been working on X state, um, and we have version five alpha that's, you know, hopefully coming out soon. And so we've been thinking about these problems too. And uh, one of the approaches that we're going to take is making X8 version five a lot simpler to onboard and also a lot more flexible so that you could interpret more than just state machines like promises, observables, reducers, and callbacks. And this has the benefit of you being able to visualize your entire application uh, architecture, like just how each of these parts talk to each other and even generate more visuals like sequence diagrams. And also, X8 works with a bunch of different libraries too. And this is one of the reasons why I've been thinking about these problems a lot. And you don't really have to choose between different state management libraries because um, X8 acts more like a state orchestrator rather than state management with all these libraries and two mystery ones that you're not going to see because conference Wi-Fi sucks. So um, in general, the way that we typically code applications is the easy way, you know? We have logic and event handlers, callbacks, and ad hoc logic just floating around. Uh, we have simple ways where, you know, we would just separate our application logic into reducers and maybe combine those reducers. And this allows us to have a simpler understanding of how everything works because everything is just an event. And then we have, you know, a simpler way where we could better organize the logic within our reducers but of course, this isn't really easy. It is a learning curve to use state machines. And uh, when your app gets really complex, that's when state charts come in, and that's definitely not easy. So um, overall, it doesn't matter like what you use. Um, what I really want to emphasize is that your application logic and the logic, uh, your view logic, are not always the same. In other words, a data flow tree is not the same as your UI tree. And it's just really good to keep those two things separate. So this separation can be achieved really with any state management library. Basically, you're separating your user interface from your store, and so you would send events to your store saying, the user did this thing, or this thing happened. And then from your store, you're just reading state. And that's it. I mean, there could be a lot of complexity in the user interface. There could be a lot of complexity in the store, but you could save yourself uh, and your team from failing to understand the code by separating those parts of complexity and having a very clean way of communicating between the two. So um, you could map your requirements to code, like this is what I would suggest for whatever state management solution you choose. Uh, basically have a very clear mapping of the user stories to code. Code in a view agnostic way, even if you don't plan, sorry, if you don't plan on changing state management libraries or changing frameworks or anything, just code in a view agnostic way. It really helps you enforce that separation. Uh, make your views dumb. We've heard about smart and dumb components. Make all of your components dumb because your components should just be things that read state and that send intentions from the user to some store or stores, whether you're using single or multi-store. Um, and then literally profit. Because uh, what I mean by profit, you know, and I'm thinking about this especially as a founder of a startup, is that the, um, the important parts of code are not really just how fast it is, how much ESLint likes our code, whether it's in TypeScript or not, but it's really the value that we're providing users. Are we able to ship features fast? Are we able to create intuitive user interfaces? Um, and are we able to maintain the code so it doesn't take forever to add new features? And this works with any state management solution. So of course, there's a bunch of important things, but I feel like these things are importanter on the right-hand side. And overall, just make it work, make it right, and make it fast. And um, you know, you're just going to have a better time uh, you know, just managing your state. So in summary, there's two types of state management. There's simple state management where your code becomes very easy to understand, no matter how complex it gets. And there's easy state management where your code is very quick for you to get up and running, uh, you know, just putting the logic in there, 
manipulating state wherever you want without any care of how it maps to application logic. So which one will you choose? Thank you, React and Lit. Thank you so much, David. Okay, so now we have another speaker from the same company, which means this conference is basically just a, a get or like a get together for the company at this point. Uh, so next up we have Farzad. He also works at Stately. And when I asked him, like, what do you want me to say about you? He said, I used to be an aerospace engineer. And then I said, that's impressive. And he actually said that was really boring. <laughs> so if making forms is not boring to him, but aerospace engineering is, I don't, I don't understand life anymore. So he's going to be talking about state machines and how do we map the idea of state machines into components in our React code base, which is something I'm actually very interested about. But uh, his computer is currently not doing the thing it's supposed to do. It just did the thing. Good job. OK, cool. Please give a very warm round of applause for Farzan. All right, hello. Uh, there's no running microphone, so I'm just going to have to stick myself here. Uh, just bear with me during the talk. Um, I'm Farzad, but... Oh, okay, yeah, actually, there's one. Yeah, I'm Farzad, and... Uh, yeah, this is good. Um, yeah, my name is Farzad, but actually, in Stately, they refer to me as the Steve Wozniak of Stately, just because I was employee number two. And I think me and Steve have a belly fat in common. Um, so that's good. Yeah, so if you like whatever I'm talking about here or just follow me because for the sake of David because we work in the same place uh, <laughs> That's my username on Twitter Paris is YZ and I usually rant a lot about the state management and stuff um, So we can learn together uh, if you want. Yeah, so today I'm here to talk about of course the state charts But I'm not trying to sell you any ideas or using state charts or even you know using state machines and stuff I just want to you know, we want to build something together. We want to do some live coding or live diagramming, which is exciting. I believe React is great, right? We are in a React conference, and it's the most reasonable thing to say. React is great. I feel like we made a huge leap forward when we came from jQuery to React. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion with Ryan, the creator of SolidJS last night at dinner, where he talked to me about the idea that Everybody thinks that we made like a jump from jQuery to React overnight, but it actually took us years. And I think that's correct. But I think what React did was that it was inspirational enough for most developers to go out there and scout the uncharted territories. And that's like we have a very innovative culture and a welcoming culture for different integrations into React. That's why we have things such as you know, React for mobile, React Native, which is cross-platform, which is great. We have React Inc, I guess, it's, if that's the correct name for the CLI rendering. You're using still like the uh, same components you're accustomed to using React on the web or mobile, and still render something using React in the command line. And there is React for WebGL, or there is like React 3JS fiber renderer from the Pomondras team, which is amazing because it's like you are using two normal components as if you were using React on the web and you get like a 60 frame per second freaking awesome animation on the web. Um, and there is also another project that was impressing just because React is so empowering and that is like you use React components to create videos using FFmpeg, which is just amazing. And I think all of that is because we, React is so welcoming. The React community is so rich and welcoming and one of the upsides of React community is that you have a lot of open source options out there, one of which could be just component libraries. We have Chakra UI, we have Blueprint, we have Material UI, Ant Design, whatever, whatever, and they're all great. But they're all kind of dealing with the same problems. We have a lot of complexity when dealing with component libraries. We have availability problems. Networks could be crappy. It might be surprising that only 15 or 20 percent of the people who can access networks these days on the web have 4G. The rest are either on 2G or 3G. So it really matters if you're developing things that are consistently working and are functional over different network availabilities. And people are dealing with like focus management just because the platform sucks at that. And it's really hard to you know move the focus between different components, and it's just like one of the hardest problems that people are dealing with when developing component libraries. There is a cross-browser problem that we've been dealing with from the first day of IE3, 4, whatever. 
and there is cross-framework because, of course, we could develop things that could work across different frameworks. And there is accessibility, which I, I'm not really knowledgeable about, but, <laughs> you know, it's a concern. I get it. It's serious, so that's good. But the component library developers know that these are challenging, and these are the day-to-day -day challenges they're trying to solve. That's why we have seen recent rise of the machine, people moving more towards using state machines and state charts for developing framework or platform agnostic components for component libraries, two of which would be ZagJS from the creator of Chakra UI, which is a set of components that are agnostic to almost anything, and they work across all the frameworks and the platforms and everything, and they're modeled using state charts. It's like a bunch of models uh, that work with any sort of integration. And there's Reach UI from the very creators of React Router, um, which is like a set of uh, accessible components, but the accessibility part is also heavily modeled using state machines. Actually, I want, just wanted to quote this from the official documentation of ZagJS. I'm just going to go on and read it to you. In Chakra UI React, we've experienced too many hiccups and bugs in the past related to how we coordinate events manage the state and side effects. Most of these bugs are associated with the orchestration within use effect, use memo, use callback, etc. And that means that there's a real problem to solve using a state machine, thankfully. The issues were replicated in our Chakra UI view pursuit as well, which means the problems are portable across different frameworks and created a maintenance hell for us. We're not going to read the rest of it. You get the idea, right? So, it's like there is a motivation to move more towards the state machines, and they're actually solving a real problem these days. In fact, this is, um, well, all the components in the ZagJS um, official website and documentation have a visualization just because the state machines give you a very nice way to visually see the behavior or the logic of your components. And also, there's a screenshot from the Reach UI, just, uh, you know, this is one of the state machines for their tooltip component. We might think tooltip is just basically toggling the show, you know, between going between the showing and hiding the state, but actually it's a lot more complicated. Um, quick poll here. How many of you, by show of hands, have heard about the state machines before? We're not counting David. All right, great. Oh, that's awesome. Then what am I talking about here? <laughs> uh, okay, so just for one person who didn't raise their hand, just for you, uh, finite state machines are a set of finite states. It's a bunch of states, finite states, like unique names of a certain snapshot of your UI or your software that we want to refer to. Hey, this is locked. Hey, this is unlocked. And the way we move between these states is using events or the intention word, which is perfect that David used in his talk. And we transition different, different states, and based on that, we react to that in our UI. An important thing when trying to model with the state machines is that you need to think in states. And that takes a little bit of time. There's a learning curve. Because we're accustomed to think about the states on the life side. We think a state is a collection of language primitives. We think there is a Boolean, there is a union, I don't know, there is like an array, there's a list, there's an object, and we call that a state, right? That's how you use use a state, you use reducer. But I think the better way to do that would be to think about the state as just a combination or as a union of different names or strings. We know that our component could be in the idle state. We, we know that it could be in the loading state instead of saying, I mean, how would we even talk about the state if, if we were on the left side? Um, okay, so my component is in the state of is loading true, accounts empty, and error null. That doesn't make sense. That's not humane. Let's do some live diagramming together to let these concepts sink. I'm going to show you something that I think is really, really, really cool. Hello? Yeah, it works. Great. Awesome. Let's make an interactive list together, OK? I, I, Believe me, I'm, I don't have this bad posture. It's just I can't really reach the live diagramming part here, so I have to type. Uh, on the right side, we have a Visual uh, Studio Code extension that we've been developing at Stately. 
and it lets you embed the visual editor that we've been working on for the past year, which helps you diagram the logic and the behavior of basically any software you're modeling. It could be a component. I chose components today for the talk just because I wanted something to fit into half an hour. But honestly, these concepts all apply to any part of the stack. It could be your workflows, your CI, your server. It could be your application. It could be anything. But for the sake of simplicity in this talk, we're just going to model something very simple. OK, we want to have a list that has a bunch of user stories. We want a bunch of features. We want to build selection into a list of numbers, a stack of numbers from like 1 to 20 or whatever. And then we want to build selection. So when we click on one of the items in the list, we want it to be selected. And we want it to have a blue background. Let's do that using diagramming. We're not going to write a single line of code for the logic. We're just going to provide the implementations. OK, let's name our diagram interactive list. And so since we're dealing with a selection, every state machine starts from an initial state. You can't just you know, get into the state machine out of the blue. You have to start somewhere. So we're going to call that nothing selected. OK. What will happen if something is clicked? All right, we're going to transition to a state called, let's say, oh, OK, not that one. OK, something. Select. Let me just get rid of this one. OK. And how do we get from nothing selected state to the something selected state? Of course, we're clicking on the item. But the more, like a better way to name that intention would be select single item. All right. That's great. And let's save this file, this magical file here. OK. I'm importing the machine generated by the diagram that we just built here, which was this file so that we can use that in our storybook instance here. And we see the list here. There is nothing happening when I click on the items. And we're going to build that together now. OK, so we have an interactive list component, a React component that gets a list of numbers as the prop. And we're trying to map over that, render them in an LI and button, and then on click of the button, actually select the elements. So to be able to glue the state machine generated from the diagram that we just built into the React component, we're going to use a hook called useMachine. And it's not anything magical, really. It's a hook that you can pass through state machines, but basically it works like use reducer. And the hook will give us the way to read the current state of the state machine and a way to send an event to it, which is basically dispatch. OK, let's see. There's a machine here, which is great. And we want this to be listed machine, which is awesome. All right. Um, there's a bit of hiccup. I'm sorry. Let's see. OK, it works. I'm not exporting it, of course. This is where you get prepared for the talk. All right, yeah. So we have the state and the send here. OK, so let's uncomment this. And all right, things have started to not work. All right, let's do this. I'm going to comment this part. There's a paragraph here that's going to tell me uh, the current state of the, um, the, the uh, state machine. So we're going to see what we're building together. Um, awesome, all right. Use machine, machine, and mm, children prop. You can. Oh, all right. I didn't. Thank you, though. All right. Never mind. Let's just get past this for now. All right. Let's do something. Let's say that whenever I, whenever I click on the uh, whenever I click on the. Um, on the list element here on the button, I want the element to be selected. For doing that, I'm going to have to send an intentional, like an explicit event to the state machine. Because in the state machine, everything is either a state or an event. And nothing changes or happens unless there is a trace of events for it. So we're going to send select single item, because that was the name of the event that we have on the right, uh, diagram on the right side. So the other thing that we should do here is that we need to add a data attribute, because I have that um, in my, um, in my uh, CSS. I'm telling it that if the element is selected, it should have a data that is selected HTML attribute. So in the state machine, not everything can be modeled as a uh, finite state. Some stuff should be just data. And we call that context, or the notion of extended state. Because then the list of numbers, for example, or the list of selected IDs just can't be modeled using a quantitative measure. 
which is going to be like defined at the state. So we're going to keep that in the uh, context of the machine. We're going to call that state.context. And if that includes the ID or the value of the element, we're going to you know, make this true so that data that's selected is, has a true value. And then it will have, like a, um, it will have a, a true value, so it gets blue. Uh, state.context, this is really, really weird, though. Where is use machine coming from? This is correct. All right, um, let's see. Um, if anybody can tell me what's wrong, I would appreciate that too. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so we have a state that context, or a state, oh, it's because we don't have a context in our machine. I'm sorry about that. That should have been generated. It's a bug, but it's fine. All right, let's, hmm, all right. It's because our state is, yeah, okay, so we have selection which should be empty, okay. Let's get past this. Come on. Um, bu 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 state the context of selection that includes. Hmm, that's nice. I promise you I practiced. All right, it's working. All right, now when I click on this, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so it should include that. Uh, and in our CSS, I'm telling it that if it has data selected true, it should have a background. But I'm not sure why it's not getting back. Maybe it's a cache. Sometimes it just caches a storybook. All right, let's see. Bear with me. I promise you, there's like some exciting stuff ahead of us. Um, all right, it's not working. Okay, let's just add a class name, maybe. Mm, let's see. Okay, so let's do one thing. Let's do a console log and debug this together. This is fun. I'm going to show you how easy it is to debug things with the state machines, or maybe convince you otherwise. All right, let's see. Yeah, something is selected. So we have, you know, we start from the nothing selected state. And actually, clicking on an item will take us to the something is selected. You can see the console like on the right side. So the transition is happening. So let's see what we have in the. Oh, yeah, actually, I haven't provided the action. Thank you, Sarah. OK, you see how we can, you know, probably she didn't know much about the state machines, right, Sarah? OK, great. So we're debugging this together. And she understood my intention of the logic, and she's helping me debug this. This is nice. So one thing you can do is that to tell the state machine on receiving an event, run something like, uh, like execute this action for me, select item. And the state machine would say, OK, this is just a string to me. I'm going to know that this is a serialized action. This is a name for an action. I don't know how to execute that. That's where you provide the implementation. To do that, the second parameter of the use machine is just the uh, object of the option, so you can provide actions to it. And then you're going to have to you know, pass an implementation to the same name that you have the actions in the diagram. So select item is going to be something that we're going to assign a value to the context. Assign is a special built-in type, which means, hey, I want to update the context of the machine. So it's like updating an object or something. So we're going to say selection. All right, great. And it can receive a function that has access to the current context of the machine and the incoming event. Because remember, we're sending an event to the machine to make changes. So I can tell it, hey, I want it to be an array with just the ID of the machine, uh, with just the ID of the list item. OK, and I have to send the ID here. So I would say that it's a V value from the list that I'm iterating on. All right, let's just refresh to make sure. Um, You're talking here? Like ID is equal to V. That's what you're trying to find. You're not finding anything. No, 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 no. We're passing the ID here. And if it includes. It includes. Is this a mock program? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come up here. It's fine. OK, we're going to do a duo. OK. Then here, get, give it up. Get, get your hand up. Give it up, Clapper. How do you do an equals here? Okay. No, 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 equals. No, 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 no. It's just going to be this. Includes just a V because the V is here. So it's just going to be a bunch of integers. Does You're it? loving this, right? Mm -hmm. You're loving this? this no. Session? No? OK. No. I'm sorry this is happening. It's fine. Oh, sorry. I thought you were using find. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm going to get OK, it. so we're not updating it. OK, uh, it's because I am not returning anything here, am I? Selection is here. The select item is here. Let's check for the typo. Select item. This is great. Ah, oh, I didn't save my machine. Nice. OK. I need to save my machine to reflect the change. And it's working. Awesome. All right. So 
Quick recap, quick recap. We're wasting the time. Okay, so what happened here is that we, we, um, we had a list, and we were transitioning from nothing selected to something selected, and we're sending an event, and we're running an action in React to that event. And the only thing that we need to provide here is the implementation for that action. Okay, let's build something else together. Again, another thing. All right, let's, on press of escape, Let's attach a uh, document, like an event handler to the document, say, if I'm pressing escape, I want to clear the selection. To model that here is that we're going to say that, hey, if something is selected, and now you want this to be deselected, we're going to add like a, oh, come on, it's not the time to, me, to crash on me. All right, let's do this. OK, so when something is selected, we're going to go to nothing is selected. We're on, on, in React to the event deselect all, and when deselect is happening, we're going to run an action that clears the selection. Okay. Now, what happens here is that let's save this for uh, you know to make sure. And okay, so we're, we have to send a um, you have to have a use effect to send that event that we're expanding in our uh, state machine. Uh, document that event handler uh, key down, and then we want an e and e if e dot uh, key. Um, it's uh, okay. If it's escape, then even prevent default is because nobody wants to, you know, do the default thing on escape. And then we're going to have to send an event, and this should be the same name here. So this is going to be select all. And what happens when we run the action select all? Well, we want this to be what was that? Uh, clear selection. So what clear selection does is again tries to you know, assign something to the selection value in the context, and we want that to be just an empty array. OK, makes sense? Let's try this out. It works. OK, this is not working. Uh, what was that? There you go. Thank you very much. This is more programming, by the way. That's Ah, it should be. Yeah, it, it is in the actions. Come on. Thank you. All right. <laughs> you see, I'm selling the idea of state machines to you, or maybe otherwise. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it might be this one. Okay, so let's see. And maybe it's a, it's a key. All right. So let's pray, press escape here. It's working. So escape is here. And then once uh, deselect all, let's make sure that this is the same name on the event. These. Thank you. All of this is planned. It's part of the big plan. <laughs> OK, it's working. Nice. Amazing. Hey, thank you. All right, let's do something else. OK, one other feature. All right. We want to add to the selection when I press the command on Mac OS or control on other devices. Okay? So that means that it's exactly like the file system in your operating system. It's like you want to select multiple elements in the list. All right. To do that, we're going to back to our um, on click here. And we want to say if the e dot meta key, which means like I'm pressing the command or the control key, then I'm going to send an event call add to selection. And what am I going to add to the selection? Again, the ID of this item. And let's put this in an else because we don't want to accidentally send double events to our machine. And let's go back to modeling here because we don't have that in our, uh, in our state machine. And the state machine will simply ignore something that doesn't live in its definition. OK. So if you want to add something, it doesn't make sense to add it to nothing is selected because add means we're appending and something else should have been selected previously. So we're going to add it here. This is called a self, uh, a, a, like a self event. It's like an event that you stay, you don't transition away from a state, but you actually just run an action on it. So let's call this add to selection. Because we still want to stay on the something selected state if we're adding to the selection. And we need to you know, run an action again. All right, let's save our machine again. All right. Great, all good. Let's provide the implementations here. We want our, so we, we have the UI part. We're sending that event, but we just need the action. Add to selection would be another assigned surprise. 
and this again would be selection. And again, we want a concat here. We're not going to reset or, or, or just you know, hard code a value here. So we're going to say ctx.selection.concat.e.id. So check. I think everything should work. Let's check it again. So escape works. And let's press this one. All right, it's working too. Awesome. Thank you. Now, let's do one other thing because we still have time. Let's, OK, when we, when we press Command A, as users, we are, you know, we're used to seeing everything selected in a list, right? That just happens everywhere. So let's do that here. If I press Command and A anywhere near the list, I want all of the items to be selected. That should be a global event handler and document. Maybe it's not great for accessibility, but OK, let's just move past it now. It's fine. We're attached, we attach it to the document. And please clean up your effects. It's not like I'm not cleaning my event listener here. You just have to do that as a best practice. Let's do that here. OK, so we're going to say another thing here, else if e.key equals a and e.metakey um, again, because we want command a. We have to, again, e.prevent default. Otherwise, it did just selects all the text. It's just gross. Selects all the text on the, um, in the um, on the page, and it's just the last thing I would want. All right, so let's do this. Send another event here. Uh, select all. This should work. We again need to add it to the model because the diagram doesn't have that yet. Selecting all should happen in both of the states. If I haven't had anything selected in the in the in the list, I still should be able to select all everything. If I had something previously, regardless of being multi-selected or single-selected, I still should be able to press Command and A and select everything. Therefore, this should be global. This should be hoisted on the parent, and in this case, the parent is just a machine itself. So we create an event on the parent. So wherever we are in the child state inside the machine on press of, on, on receiving of the event, okay, let's get that here, select all. We go to something is selected, and again, we need to add an action here, and that's called select all. Okay, let's save this and select all, which is working. So we need a, a missing action, select all. And what we need to do is to just assign everything to selection. Just basically items, right? The prop. Let's just refresh a few times because it caches sometimes. Um, normal clicking works. Escape, OK. Normal clicking, command. Still everything works. No regression. Let's do command A. Everything is selected. <laughs> Again, we're just sending events. You see, we're not providing anything in terms of logic, anything specific. We're not even dealing with appending or list management. We're just sending events, and everything kind of feels like atomic updates. OK, let's try another integration. What if I have normal selection, then multi-selection, and then command and A? OK, it works. OK, so everything good. Awesome, we don't have regression. All right, let's not cover the last one, because I don't want to run out of time. What happened here is that instead of coding, we just live diagrammed and everything was generated for us. But it's not like traditional code gen that you can't trust whatever the compiler or the code gen tool is generating. It's like you're diagramming a model of a behavior and logic, and we're just representing the code version of it so that you can execute the model inside a React component. It's not like we're magically generating everything. We do, but, <laughs> but we're generating something that you created. Okay, so we're not being smart about it. We're just trying to represent your logic in the text version, which, is ha which just happens to be the code. You provided the diagram to us, which is great, right? Okay, so let's do one other thing. What if we wanted to test something that is modeled using a state machine? Okay, a state machine is great. Everything is predictable, deterministic, awesome. What if I want to test it? In fact, XSH ships with one of the packages called XSH React, which, is, uh, which carries the concepts of model-based testing. And how that helps, it lets you create a test model out of a runtime model that you had for the logic of your component. So you don't have to really re recreate a logic just for the test or mock most of the time anything. You're just reusing the same machine. Let's see what happens here. OK, let's do console. Like, let's create a test model using the same, very same machine that we imported and had in the use machine in the React component, and call get simple path. What happens here is that a state machine is just a computing unit that lets you diagram stuff, connect a bunch of boxes and arrows, and in an underlying implementation, generate a graph of all the possibilities. 
It's like your favorite module bundler or your compiler that knows the graph of dependencies between your modules and how things are connected to each other. It's that for the logic. We know how to go from state A to state B. In an application level logic, we could tell you if you have everything modeled using a state machine or the critical parts, how many possible paths are there for getting from the beginning of the home page of an e-commerce app to the shopping cart? You usually don't know that. You usually just rely on manual QA or, or testing generated by the QA, and they have to come up with the scenarios and discover that. But with a state machine, you have all of that at your disposal because you modeled it once and the graph is right there. And because of the same graph algorithms and traversals, we know that if you create a test model, which will generate a graph that XSA tests understand, we can get the, all the simple paths for it. Let's just console like that. All right, so the, statement, the, the, the test model is telling me that there are seven different paths that are possible right now in the model of your uh, state machine. And I'm not going to you know, add dragging and stuff, but just imagine that you could drag something like a selection box and whatever that fit into that selection, we would select that as well. It's just a normal other feature. Um, if we added that, I just went ahead, took the liberty, and added that here so that I could tell you, if you added that, it would be just a very slightly simple change. It would be a slightly scaled version of your current state machine, but the test model would have told you out of seven or 34, like that's 34 is the generated path for something that had all the features that I wanted to implement, but since we're running out of time, we're just getting the seven generated ones. But imagine that you had a machine that wasn't the scale, that had just the bare bone MVP features, and you could generate like 34 paths out of it. I went ahead and add just a selection dragging model to it. It's almost the same. You can see that these parts are basically the same thing, just a little guards and conditions here and there, but nothing serious, really. And I just, you know, put everything under a not dragging state and separated that from the dragging state, because when you're you know, just, just dragging a selection box over the list of items, you could be in a dragging state, and we don't want to allow any other manual selection to happen in that state, just something that the machine can do automatically using internal events. And everything that we just modeled together and live diagram will go under a not dragging state. So we would introduce a hierarchy. With that, the test model would have told you, you now magically have 240 different paths that are possible in your simple component that need to be tested. So imagine you're developing a component library, you model things using the state machines, you, you haven't modeled things with state machines, and somebody opens a bug request and tells you, hey, here is like the way I can, I don't know how to reproduce it, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, maybe you have to have the right uh, you know, sequence of events to generate it, and, uh, but this bug exists in your code. Out of 240 generated paths, if you didn't know that, manually, good luck finding that, really. It could lie in any of those paths. And rest in peace QA, if they want to reproduce that. It's just impossible. And you would be surprised how many possible paths there are in a large-scale React application, anything that you day-to-day -day work on. It's, it could be an order of millions, really. Depending on what you're trying to do, you might see you might want to get like, you know, simple paths or plans. It's like, a, it's like a map of cities if you think about it. It's like the states of your application are the cities on a Google map, and the events that you're sending are kind of like taking a you know, ride and going from one city to another. It's just easier if you see the map. Otherwise, if you blindly take on a road trip, good luck, right? Diagramming is great, guys. Really, really great. Um, I think diagramming is one of the possible futures for the web development. And that is something we're working on stately. We're betting on diagramming. Because when you diagram your problems, you know, again, regardless if it's a component library or application or anything, if you're diagramming, if you're drawing things, you're thinking about things up front without trying to solve that. Because usually if you rush into solving a problem, you try to come up with a, with a feature or, or like come up with a solution that might not extend well or be too limited for possible reasonable next steps of the feature. But when you diagram, you kind of are forced to see the boundaries of your problem, to learn the constraints of the problem you're solving, and then say, oh, OK, this is the whole picture. This is nice. So I, I know what I'm trying to do. And this is one of the limitations. Wow, it's nice that we caught it right now. You see the edge cases. And another thing great about diagramming is that you can always zoom in into a particular place in the diagram, focus on that, fix that, zoom out, move to another place, and try to solve other part of the problem. It's like you see all the things, 
and the whole visualization is in front of you, so you choose at what particular place of the problem you're trying to approach right now, and then you know, move on until you, you figure out all the parts. Then, of course, reasonably, you can come up with better plans and estimates, because we are all bad at estimates. And you would see different integrations, because when you're working on a single component, teeny tiny component in a React application, things might not get out of hand. But when you start integrating different stateful parts, and they try to talk it to each other and plug them onto one single entity, that's where the integrations get nasty, and you're missing out on things. That's why we have integration testing, to make sure integrations work. That's how nasty they are. But with diagramming, we can see them because they're just another event in the state machine or the entire system. And again, you can see the layers of your problem because problems are layered. And when you diagram them, you see all of the layers at once. Sometimes the, the layer is just the accessibility layer. Sometimes it's just the client side in general. Sometimes it's the back end, anything. This is what we're doing at the Stately AI. I was thinking to myself, building this talk, hey, if diagrams are so good, why, does, why just not everybody does the diagramming instead of programming thing? Why do we tackle stuff like the traditional way we do? Well, I don't know. Why you? Why do we do that? <laughs> but uh, honestly speaking, uh, we think at the Stately that diagramming is, the, is a great way for a future for, for development or programming in general. And we think that traditional diagramming wouldn't scale to real-world problems just because everything would make sense on pen and paper, but you can't really take that to practice. You can't execute that. That's why we're betting on executable diagrams. The diagrams in the stately that we're trying to build using the visual editor are the single source of truth. Because if things make sense in the diagram level, you should be able to just copy and paste it, put it somewhere else, and just execute that. Why not? Why do we have to you know, remodel something in a certain stack and language to just satisfy the model that you had on pen and paper? And what we do is that you, 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 with the visual editor at the stately, I'm not selling the product to you, by the way. I'm just selling the idea of diagramming to you, please. Just, just, I want you to understand that. I want that to be clear. You have to just diagram. Just draw stuff. I don't even care if you use a state machines. Just diagram. Diagram, and then get a model, like a runtime model, out of that, and then execute that. Uh, because diagrams are great. They can also export to many things. You, you know, diagram is the logic. So it, makes on, it only makes sense to export it to a PNG to be able to share it in the documentation. It only makes sense to export it to a test model to test it. It makes sense to export it to a runtime model, to JavaScript, to TypeScript, and to execute it. You can see diagram is kind of like the abstract logic you're trying to build, and everything is kind of like a side effect and afterthought you can get out of it somehow. Um, and diagrams are really multi-purpose, and go, they, they go ex across the stack, because anything can be you know, solved using diagramming. You can just see the boundaries of every problem. The problem doesn't care if it's in JavaScript or on the client side or the backend. Sometimes problems are the same. And you know, if you think using diagrams, you might actually be able to figure it out a lot faster. And another thing great about diagrams is that sometimes you can generate it too. You don't have to generally just draw boxes and arrows to get a diagram. We should be able to provide user stories to generate a diagram out of that. I want plain English. I want, I want to be able to, to you know, explain the features out of a software that I want in plain English, and you be smart enough, the tooling be smart enough to generate the diagram out of it and then execute it and make me a software. I want that magic for the future of development. And sometimes we code to get a diagram. That's how traditional state management was working with the state machines. Sometimes I want markdown. Sometimes I want plain text. Some, sometimes I just want voice. I want it to be accessible. I want, I want to tell you what I want, and I want the diagram to generate. And we want to, the diagrams to go to the next level. We want to generate live event sequences from what the application is doing right now. I want to be able to plug diagrams into my live application so that I know when the user is clicking on this button, I see that, hey, it's actually this particular user of this ID is taking this path in my model. So it would be really nice. I want it to be collaborative because we don't work alone. We work in teams. And I want it to be adapt adaptive. What does that mean? OK, if there are 240 ways to get from initial state of my application to the payment successful uh, state of my applications, I want to be able to optimize that. I want analytics to tell me what paths the users are taking so that I have a good way to focus on that and make them better. I don't want all the 240 paths to be optimized. And actually, this is one of the things that are in the plan. So we might be able to do that. Again, diagrams are just the gist of the logic of the software. 
and the runtime and the test and the documentation are just different representations of the same thing. We don't have to cater and babysit for all of them because they all kind of update and validate each other. We're maintaining tests, we're maintaining documentations, and they go stale all the time. We just have to just maintain a diagram. Thank you very much. Okay, we now have a 30 minute break. Make sure to get coffee. And if you haven't gotten your bag with your swag, uh, please get the bag over there. Just give them your name and you will get free shit. Everyone likes free shit. Enjoy, be back in 30.
just want to make sure this mic check that I got it working properly. Thank you. If you have a, please don't photograph me badge, just put your face like this, okay? <laughs> All right. I'd like to see if we can make this standing room only. So can we remove a bunch of the chairs? No? Okay. I'd love to have a, re a standing room only audience. I never get that. Okay, if you have not come in, I would urge you to start, I can see all three of you slowly coming in. Thank you, there we go. Okay, so we are at the last session today, and we're gonna have a session that's gonna be about an hour and a half, maybe more, uh, about mob programming. And from my understanding of mob programming, it's basically what we were doing to Farzad when we were yelling at him to fix his code, uh, and he would fix it. That's kind of my idea. <laughs> but I'm excited to see what's gonna come out. So. Enjoy, they'll introduce themselves and enjoy, and I'll see you in an hour and a half. Thank you. All righty, thank you, everybody. I'm going to place this uh, controller device in my back pocket. I'm Woody Zool. I've been software development uh, focused for 40 years. When I first started programming, I realized that the software. I bought a couple computers because the industry I was in, which was graphics, design, signage, I could see the industry was going to change to being very computer enabled. It was have been in 1982. So I bought a couple computers. The computers worked pretty good. The software didn't work very good. So I thought, maybe I can learn to write software. And my wife said, well, if these people are making a living writing software that doesn't work very good, you could probably make a living writing software that isn't very good. So I went ahead and started learning to program. I didn't start making my living with it till almost 15 or so years later, but I wrote a lot of software I would use for myself. About 1998, I stumbled upon this idea of pair programming that people were talking about. Some of you have seen pair programming. Two people sitting at one computer. And I was already old enough, you know, 45 years old, where uh, I would no longer say, that seems crazy, that can't work. I'd learned in my life that every time I say that, I'm gonna be proven wrong. So I instead said, that looks interesting, I'm gonna try to do that. So it took me about two years to learn how to do that well, and by 2001 or two, it became my preferred way of working. Two programmers at one computer. Uh, there were some benefits to it. A big benefit was, uh, 
it was two sets of eyes, two brains on the code. So we were getting higher quality code. It was easier to solve the problems and we were getting more done than we could have gotten done separately. I like those benefits. And then I went out to a job in late 19, well, mid-1999, where they put me on a team. And I was really excited to see how does that work. And so I went on the team, but they never did anything that you consider teamwork. Could you imagine uh, people getting onto a basketball court? You have basketball in Finland? We do that in the US. You throw a ball up in the air. If you got five people on the basketball court, and one of them is playing football, and one of them is playing tennis, and one of them is playing a basketball, we're not going to be playing the same game. We're not really a team. So I thought, why do they put me on a team and we're never doing anything like a team together? We're not teaming. And so uh, that started me thinking, why don't we do real teamwork in software development? And then every now and then I'd see teamwork. Like there's an emergency and everybody comes together in a big room, like maybe 20 people, and they talk about what are we going to do? And then they focus on that for a while, and when they're done solving the problem, they go back to working alone. So I start thinking maybe we can do this a little bit more. So I'm going to do a real quick introduction. What we're going to do today is actually try to demonstrate. I have a couple of volunteers, and we're going to ask for two more volunteers from the audience. So be thinking about that now. Are you willing to get up? come up in front of everybody else and have a chance of really making a fool of yourself? There's a couple people here, I'm sure, who are willing to do that. It'll actually be very simple. Matter of fact, I've had people do this that were as young as nine or 10 years old. I remember at one conference, a nine-year-old came up. If a nine-year-old can do it, maybe we can do it. We're gonna actually demonstrate how this works, at least in a minor way. So I've been doing this for, uh, since 2011, working as a team in my daily work. Until 2015, when the pressure came so high for me to speak at conferences and do workshops, that I switched into doing the workshops. So maybe I'll move over here, you get a more full-figured uh, photograph. <laughs> very candid, very candid. So um, I've become quite used to this, but starting in 2009, before we ever worked this way, we used to do something that I'm going to demonstrate, which we call a coding dojo, a style of coding dojo where we all work together uh, on some simple problem, but it's more of a social activity. Often I would go to a conference and we're sitting together, uh, like here, and sitting next to someone we've never met before, and when the conference is over, we still don't know them. But when we would do the coding dojo together, all of a sudden we're making friends. And it really turned out to be a wonderful experience, and I really enjoyed it. So I did as much of that as I could. A real quick introduction. Mob programming started for us in 2011 at Hunter Industries. We won't talk much about that, but it's a company where we started doing this, and now it's being done all over the world. Simply put, it's all the brilliant minds working together on the same thing at the same time, in the same space, and at the same computer, which is very much like pair programming, but with your whole team. Now, ideally, we would gather together all the skills and knowledge that we need to do our work so that we can work on everything we do directly from start to finish without having to go off the team to get knowledge that's missing. Now, that's an ideal situation. It doesn't happen often, but this is a picture of that exact thing. Let me see if I can get my pointer to work. Oh, I can. Let me see if I can get it a little better. Yep, here's a tester a product owner who happens to also be a coder, but uh, they worked on a different team and we were doing this work for them. So we were writing software for, for, the, for their team and we wanted to make sure that we had that knowledge sitting with us. I was a coder, another coder, a database expert, and two more coders. So everything we did is sort of code focused, but these coders aren't all equally skilled. We all have different skills. Matter of fact, his training was in AI and machine learning. My training was in a school of hard knocks, writing business software, a tester, another developer who was mostly familiar with the legacy code in the, in the company. Uh, we had maybe 30 or 40 apps we were maintaining that had been written over 20 years, 30 years period, and a kind of a new programmer who had been on the testing team and had converted to being a programmer. Uh, so we have uh, skills all different skills needed to write this software. If we had a question, we could answer it ourselves. This is a big part of it, so we can work directly on things from start to finish. 
I want to keep my uh, clock nearby. Okay. It's not five people watching one person coding. If, if I sat down here and started coding and you tried to follow along, that would be some kind of bizarre uh, coding theater that nobody would enjoy for very long unless we happen to be like the super most brilliant coder in the world and you wanted to see that person working. This is not five people watching one person coding. It's five people coding through one person sitting at the keyboard. And we'll demonstrate how that works. You need techniques to do this. And the technique that I used came from pair programming. When I first learned pair programming, they described it as driver navigator. Somebody's at the keyboard driving like you're driving a car and somebody's navigating like they have the map and they say uh, in three blocks make a left turn and then we'll go down about a mile. Now we don't give much more instruction than that when we're guiding someone with a map because if we give them too much information they'll forget it by the time we get there. It's too, too much to take in and we can't give them too little information like it was that right turn back there, you know? We will tell them just in time the right amount of information. That's what driver navigator is. And that works for a group. It worked with pair programming. We have the idea of the driver. The driver is at the keyboard acting as a smart input operator. They understand the language and the lingo that we're talking. They may or may not know how to code yet. It depends on what our goals are, but they're gonna learn as we go. So that person happens to be the tester, but he understood some things about coding. The rest of the team could be saying, okay, we're gonna need a drop down. And we're gonna put, fill it with the regions. So the person at the keyboard, if they know how to do a drop down and fill it with the regions, they just do it. But if they don't, we have to give them instructions, almost to the code level. But we usually try to keep the level very high, high level instructions. We need a drop down with the regions. And if the person at the keyboard can do it, they just do it. And if they can't, we give more details. So maybe they'll get to the region. Well, where do the regions come from? And somebody says, oh, there's a service for that. Or maybe somebody else says, um, oh, we need to do a database call to get that. Do people still do database calls? Do you do database calls? Or do you normally just call a service to get the data you need? Service? It's way more common now. When I've pr programmed, that was pre-SQL in most places. There wasn't even SQL in those days. Everybody on the team is there because of the knowledge they have. They're there to share the knowledge that they have to get us doing what we need to do. So if we have the product owner there and we have a question for the product owner, they're sitting there to help us. That's a rare situation, but that's what I try to get whenever I'm working this way. But we follow this guideline. For an idea to go from somebody's head into the computer, it must go through someone else's hands. That requires that we get good at some things, like communicating clearly, trying to understand, striving to understand, rather than attempting to um, push our ideas out, we try to each understand each other's ideas as we go. That means we want to share things in small pieces. We'll talk about that in a minute. It seems crazy. I love that word preposterous. I have a lot of trouble saying it, so I put the definition there. Contrary to reason or common sense. My father, who was an engineer, electrical, electronic engineer, he used to say, I don't care about common sense. I care about unconventional wisdom. I like that. Okay. It may seem crazy, but it's being done all over the world. I've seen now, uh, I've gotten emails or messages, or seen it in Twitter, or whatever, of people doing this everywhere. I haven't yet seen one from the South Pole, but hopefully someday maybe they'll be doing it there. Just quickly, you can see pictures of people all over the world, Boston, London, Alaska. Uh, pay attention, they all have slightly different setups. They, uh, but look how engaged everybody is. People often ask me, how do you keep people engaged doing this? I've never had a problem with that. We're moving fast. Imagine, that, again, we're playing basketball. What if you're not paying attention when you're playing basketball? What's gonna happen to you? Somebody's gonna hit you in the head with a basketball because they're gonna throw it to you thinking you're paying attention and you're not. Yeah, this is the same thing. So, more teams. This particular company in San Diego had t uh, 10, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, 10 teams 10 teams working this way. And this particular team was doing phone support. They were programmers who would take their turn at the support desk. So they're doing team support or mob 
support all over the world, all over the world. Of course, I did not ever coach this team because I was six years old and they never called me. I would have gone to help them because the first thing I would have told them is, get yourself some big monitors because these monitors they're using are non-existent. But anyways, that's enough of that. It can be done remotely. So we've been doing it remotely since 2011 because we had some team members that weren't there with us. Uh, we've learned a lot about that since then. So why would we work this way? I'm going to share a couple ideas. Um, knowledge sharing. We get a lot of knowledge sharing happening this way. Everybody on the team gets a more general understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Continuous code and design review. It's a funny thing. If we're doing design reviews, infrequently, we're not going to write software that people want to use. If we're doing code reviews infrequently, we're going to be writing software we need to do a lot of rework on, not refactoring. I'm talking about we have to change things because we didn't understand in the first place. By having many perspectives on the work, hopefully all the meaningful perspectives on the work. And we would get rapid feedback. This gives us ability to focus on the right things. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on the idea of doing this. I'm purely here to share this. Matter of fact, that second slide uh, that I had up there is basically, I can't tell you what to do. I just am sharing some things that we did. It enhances the flow of the work. We won't go into detail here, but it happens because we're eliminating cues and reducing inventory. Inventory is anything we've started working on that the customer is not yet using, and that is waste. Queuing is a waste. If we're waiting 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes of waste. And most companies, people are often waiting a day or two or a week or two to get an answer to a question that's blocking them. We would get better solutions and higher quality because of this. In the three and a half years I worked at Hunter, after we started doing this, we only had three bugs reported into our bug tracking system. There was an 18-month period where we didn't get a single bug. And we believe it's because we were using this bigger mind that comes from six or eight people, well, in our case, usually six or seven people working together at the same time. The work flows directly from start to finish. So something that would have taken days or weeks before is now getting done in two or three hours. We could just watch the stuff clicking off really rapidly. And lastly, we found it to be more fun, less stressful, and more engaging. So one thing I will warn you about, if you're doing mob programming and you've done it and you said, boy, it just exhausts me, we probably need to change how we're working. Pay attention to that. Don't let that stop you. That just means we got to pay attention to it being more, uh, less stressful, more relaxing. And it can be. Alrighty, so I'm going to talk about Wheel's Low really, really quickly. Wheel. This is a Finnish professor, passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, but this is really important. I've been always looking for why does this seem to work so well? So Wheel's law, his fundamental law, is communication usually fails except by accident. Now, right now, I'm communicating to you. I have no way to verify that you're understanding anything. If I were to ask you, do you understand? And you nod your head like this, I still don't know, did you understand? If you go like this, I still don't know if you didn't understand. There's no verification. This is really great. If communication can fail, it will. But when communication cannot fail, it still most usually is going to fail. Now, this is meant to be humorous. But these are observations that I think are kind of true. Look at this one. If communication seems to succeed as we intended it, there's been a misunderstanding. I think that's true. This one's very similar. If you're happy with your message, there's definitely been a failure to communicate. When I'm done with a talk like this, people ask, how did your talk go? I'll say, well, I don't really know because I had no way to prove that anybody understood anything. Look at this one, these next two together. If a message can be interpreted in several ways, it will be interpreted in the manner that maximizes the damage. Do any of you ever use Twitter? That's Twitter. This one's very similar. There is always someone who knows more than you what you meant with your message. <laughs> they won't even let you explain. 
There's two more I'll cover real quick. The more we communicate, the worse it gets. This is true, I find. Whenever somebody gives me a huge document, compared to a skimpy document, a small document, there's a lot more to misunderstand in the big document. Lastly, the more we communicate, the faster the misunderstanding spreads. You've seen Slack, have you ever heard of Slack? Okay, so that's enough of that. Why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? Because I think mob programming partly addresses this. Because we have extremely rapid feedback from the people who have to be paying attention. This means we prove our communication, and we'll see that as we demonstrate it today. So, that's the end of the talk. So I've tried to find the right way to say thank you. Does that look like thank you to you? Okay, what about that? Okay, and then we got this. That's the very, the very first slide I ever made with a, diff, a foreign language to me. I'm from San Diego, California. It was in 2013, and I went to do a talk in, um, in uh, Sweden. So, tak samek. And then also, I've been to Germany and Portugal and so many other places, so we'll end it there. We're going to bring up some folks, and we're going to do a demonstration of this. So we have a couple. Uh, please come forward, David and Laura. And then we need maybe two more uh, volunteers from the audience. Please come on up. And oh, look at this. So now we're going to have to arm wrestle for it. Who's going to win? We're going to arm wrestle. You know arm wrestle to see who wins. Um, Please come forward, yes. So. We might bring up one more person. We'll see how this goes. You notice here, we have something akin to a gender equality. Interesting. So I've often had it where I'm doing a workshop and I say, let's divide into teams where we're half men, half women. And it's rare to find a person who is half man, half woman, but Often the teams are going to be mostly men and a few women, so it's nice to see more women. So please, let's have a seat here. Uh, let's introduce each other. This is Laura. She has worked with me over the last few months, kind of helping put this together. And David. So David uh, and Laura both live here in Finland, but now we have some new team members. So what's your names? Uh, my name is Lynn. Lynn and? Yanka. Yanka. Can I see how that's spelled? Yanka, Polish. So we have a very international group, right? Because I'm from America, whatever that means. Uh, Finland, uh, Portugal, and I've, where maybe uh, you originate from? Uh, I'm originally from Vietnam. Vietnam? But living here. And living here now. I have a very good friend that I've spent many, many years programming with who is going to work in Vietnam right now, probably in the next month. And then you're from Poland originally. Okay, let's go ahead, if you don't mind, and take a seat here. So we'll have four people seated. Is this a good start? And let's go ahead and have um, one of you, two, take a seat at the computer. Which would you like to do? Is this good? So you're not a good typer? Is that what you're saying? You know where the, you know where the keys are, okay. <laughs> I can do it. This is a Finnish uh, keyboard. Oh, we're going to need to get it uh, permissionized. Yeah, I'll let you do this. You do it. You're going to need to get it turned on. So what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate a coding dojo. A coding dojo is different from mob programming. Uh, I started doing coding dojos. I learned about it from the software craftsmanship group in Paris, France in 2009, and the very first experience I had with it, which happened to be in the US, uh, I almost immediately fell in love with this. And we, I've built out the rules a little bit to make it uh, very easy to keep from becoming chaos. And it's, how, it's sort of an introduction to how mob programming works. So we're going to see, we're gonna, you're going to watch real live. We have two people who have practiced with me a little bit and two people I've never even met before. And we're going to see how this goes. So I'm actually going to remove one chair for starters and we might remove another chair in a moment. It's like musical chairs, right? I don't know if you, do you know that game here, musical chairs? You do it at a kid's party. 
there'll be five or six chairs or ten chairs, and the kids all sit down, and then they play the music, and they walk around, and they take one chair away. And then when the music stops, everybody sits down, and then whoever's still standing, they're out. So you do that until there's one person, and they win the prize. So, we think we're ready to start. So, I am going to act as the facilitator and the product owner. As a facilitator, whatever I say goes. I'm the final arbiter of any question. I will guide them through the process. We're going to do what's called an incremental kata, a very simple programming exercise. I will give an instruction up here, and then it will be the navigator's turn. With the coding dojo, we have one navigator. With mob programming, everybody except the driver is a navigator. So you can imagine, if you all got into the taxi, let's say there's five of us, four of us that got into the taxi, and here's the taxi driver ready to take off. And they say, where are we going? And somebody says, the football stadium. Somebody yells out, no, the airport. So he says, no, I want to go hiking. You're not going to get wherever. You're going to get in the taxi because you're going to want to go to the same place. So we need to be organized in the directions we're giving to the person at the keyboard. Now, the program that we're going to write is a very simple kata or exercise, and this is called uh, Roman numeral uh, conversion. We're going to convert Arabic numerals to Roman numerals. I always like to check, are there any ancient Romans here? Okay, because I'm going to insult you if you're an ancient Roman, because I think your numbering system was iffy. Um, I think with the Romans, all they cared was, did we collect the taxes, and do we have enough soldiers to take over all of Britain? If 40,000 is enough, isn't enough, let's send 400,000. So their numbering system didn't need to be too accurate, but that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start off by, with one problem, and we're going to have one navigator, and the navigator stands. And so at this time, we'll remove this chair so that there's no temptation to sit down. So he's, David's going to be our, our navigator, and he will guide Lynn. Hopefully I remembered everybody's names. He'll guide Lynn in doing the beginnings of this exercise. So uh, when I do the exercises, we always do test-driven. When you work and you do mob programming, you do whatever you want. You don't need to do test-driven. But when I do these exercises, I do test-driven. It really, you understand what I mean, test-driven development. Anybody can nod their head. Do you understand? Yeah, we never know. But test-driven is something I've done now for 20-plus years. It's very comfortable for me. The first thing in the conversion is going to be, if we input a 1, we'll get back an I. Hopefully that's big enough for everybody to see, but if you can't, use your iPhone, take a picture, and then enlarge it. Okay? So, I'll let you go ahead and start navigating. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing, so it's even go going to be worth uh, telling someone else what to do. Um, we have practiced this a bit, and uh, normally we like to start uh, writing the test first. Uh, so please, Lynn, bear with me and go to the file of the test. Yeah, bear with me. All right, uh, if you scroll a bit up, you have uh, here, here in the line five, you have the first test. Uh, so it's, uh, this is the test that we can see in the terminal that is failing. Uh, if you go a bit up in this, uh, scroll up in the terminal, you will see uh, why it's failing. It's expecting I. So how we are going to fix this test? So we have to please go to the converter file. So you see, we started with a little code first. I normally wouldn't, but we're limited on time. Please go ahead. And let's think about this, how we can pass this test. Uh, you don't have to think ahead and try to solve the whole problem. Of You just need to focus on the test. So if it's expecting an I, how will you fix this code? So you guide her. Please. You just tell her what okay. to do. Uh, right. Uh, I in the return. It has to be a string, cannot be a num. Yep. Uh, remove that space so there is only. And once that you save, Command S. Uh, great. Way! Okay. 
Now, I'd like to point out something. We now have code that does what, it has been, what is expected of it. If my boss came in right now and said, we got to ship something today, I would say, we can ship this. It only handles one case, but we can ship this. So we have a lot of confidence in this. So let's do the next requirement. Uh, Ready? I only practiced to here. I don't know. You don't know anymore. <laughs> if we input right. a two, I want to get back two eyes. Okay. So that's... let's do the simplest thing we can to make that pass. Always doing the simplest thing we can. I can do that, I think. Uh, Lynn, please. First, let's go back to the test. So we write the test, we see that fails, and then we fix it. Uh, so please copy and paste the line six to nine. Copy. Yeah, copy and paste it again. So we du duplicate this block of code six to it can be inside of the describe function, so six to nine, sorry, six to eight. Uh, it should be inside of the describe function. So you can use the numbering. So the line numbers are turned on, so we can say, please pass that in, or paste that in right after nine, yeah. or right after eight, eight. And, and do the last, uh, and then six to eight, you can copy and paste it in the line eight and a half, as Woody eight and a half. <laughs> taught me. That tells us to go right after All eight. Right. Eight and a half. Uh, let's customize the, those lines to fit to this requirement. You know, David doesn't need to give line by line, character by character instruction. Thank so you, Lynn. Until uh, Lynn needs it. The line 10 also has to change the you see? expectations. When you're working with a team this way, you get used to this really quickly. Really good. Now we can see the test failing, so this is a good thing. Uh, you still have 36 seconds, so make it pass. All right. Uh, let's. You know what to do, Lynn. <laughs> so what would let's you like create, to do? You guide her. Let's create an uh, if block, and we check that Arabic is... Uh, Tell her the line number to go yeah, to. Just, just before the line four. So there is then for sure... It will be fine. I would have said four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah. But you just you get shortcuts of communicating. It's like with anything. If Arabic. Arabic? Yeah, Arabic is the uh, parameter we're getting in the function. All right, there's our timer going off. So we rotate. So let's, oh, this is OK. So let me explain. Once we get good at this, it doesn't matter if we're right in the middle of something. Because we're going to be with this through the whole thing. So everybody stands. You sit at the, key, at the keyboard. You take the microphone. Uh, so Yanka takes the microphone. And she will guide the process now. All righty? So do you have an idea what to do? One, two, one, two. OK. Uh, so I imagine we, for now, it's going to be enough to go if Arabic is equal to one, uh, return I. Um, so you can move line five over to the previous one or make it a so, box. So, yeah, the, we let the person at the keyboard to do whatever coding they want to do. And later, mm -hmm. we have automatic formatter. We'll just let it format. And if we don't get the code we hoped, but it gives us the same results, it's probably good enough, right? And now, does below go if Arabic equal to uh, return ii? Yeah, now, the braces are weird on this keyboard. When we're doing the coding dojo, <laughs> the only person allowed to speak is the navigator. Please I'm, bear with us. The Finnish keyboard layout is kind of weird for, for us. So, <laughs> sorry for Yeah, that. what's with that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you can remove line 10 now because that's we don't need that anymore. Uh, oh, you, let's see if that works. This looks like it does. So we're not too worried about what happens when we didn't pass in a one or a two, right? That doesn't matter unless we have a requirement that requires that. But let's go ahead and add a number one, I mean, another one. Number three has to turn into three eyes. Now I'm going to ask that you do that the simplest way you possibly can. And then we'll look at doing it in a, uh, a less duplicate code style. So let's see how we do. All right, let's go over to the test. 
and add another test case. Uh, just replace two with three and I, I with I, I, I. Now that may be a little more information than was needed. So when we're navigating, we, are, we kind of adjust ourselves to see how much do they really need because we all heard the same requirement. So we adjust to see how much do you need. If you give too much information, it can become uh, annoying. If you get too little information, we always have to fill in the gaps. It's something we learn over time. Yeah, always run the test as soon as you can. And how would you like to solve that? The simplest way you can. Yeah, simplest way would be just to duplicate it again and change, well, you know what to do. <laughs> We should do a raffle to see here, who knows how many times I've done this exercise. I don't know if I could even count, but I'm expecting that to uh, pass as it did. So I'm gonna put it on pause, your turn on pause for a second if you don't mind. Please remain standing. So when we look at our uh, code now, we see we have what I would call duplicate code and we need to solve for that. My way of doing this, and everybody's different, but the people I learned from, particularly later in my career, when I got to work with some really brilliant test-driven development folks, they would see this as duplication that must be removed because there's an abstraction hidden here. Now, we may not come on that instantly but because it, it can take a little thinking. Now, the people who are now what I would call observing, and in mob programming, we don't have observers, but in the coding dojo, we do. The people observing, they're just watching. They're thinking about, what would I do when it's my turn? But it's your turn right now. So, Yanka, you have to think, what do you like to do? And David's not allowed to contribute either. In the coding dojo, this is what I found. If we allow too many people to contribute, it just turns into chaos. I tried this once with 50 people, and that was extreme chaos. So I've pared it down. So now I'm going to turn your time back on. You have a lot of time, two minutes and 18 seconds. All right. see, see what you can think. Uh, I'm thinking, let's go, if Arabic less than three. Um, so get rid of the two blocks. Oh, so uh, I'll put this on pause again. My instruction is going to be keep the code passing while you add, you, we're, what we're going to do now is refactor. So keep it passing while it's refactoring and start adding your new code. We don't delete code until we can delete code. Does that make sense? All right, I'm so going to force that as a rule, okay? Just don't press save, then the test doesn't run and we're still good. <laughs> All right, let's go at the top and let's go if, but surely we can just do if Arabic less than three and less or equal, yeah. Is there somebody help from the audience? Uh, three, 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 three. Yeah, uh, return. Um, I dot repeat um, Arabic. I, uh, so uh, yeah, like this, I, and then after that, dot repeat. And then in brackets, uh, Arabic. Yeah. So I would say now you can run the tests and then delete. It may not still pass after that, but let's see what happens. So now you could delete. Does that make sense to everybody? This is a rather minor example, but... Um... <laughs> it's time to rotate. So everybody moves one chair over. Now the only rule I have is if the person sitting down at the keyboard has not yet moved, don't sit at the keyboard. You wait until the person at the keyboard has left, then you can sit down. Otherwise, you're sitting on their lap, and that's not so good. So we're learning the keyboard. Now, Laura is in charge of taking this to the next step. Is there, so look at that brilliant solution. Did that not work well? That is really, really nice. Clean, simple. That's, uh, how long have you been coding in JavaScript. How many have been doing JavaScript more than 10 years? More than 10 years. More than 15 years. More than 20 years. That's the advantage of being really old. 
because I've been doing it for way over 20 years. When JavaScript first came out, and I used it, there wasn't such a thing as an asynchronous callback. You know what an asynchronous callback is, right? They didn't exist. When those came out, it was like, whoa, that's where all the power came. You all work with asynchronous callbacks, right? Nothing that you do would work without that, or has that changed? Somebody will have to set me straight afterwards, because I could be wrong. All righty, so we're ready to move on. You want to refactor anything? No, this is brilliant at this stage, so we are brilliant. Ready, for the, brilliant. ready for the next, next okay. requirement. So our beautiful solution, not quite up to this one. So let's start the timer, and Laura will tell us what to do. Okay, Janka, please, uh, let's write the test for this new requirement first. Now, remember, this is not mob programming. This is a coding dojo, a sort of a social programming. So there's no need to give any instructions if you think the person's going to do it, that, right? That Does it? Perfect for but me. at this point, we don't say, just solve for that. That's the job of the navigator. So once we give the instruction to write the test, now we have to be thinking, what are we going to do? Um, we could go back to the converter, and let's keep uh, adding very like simple case, just an if, if statement. But if it's for, it returns the hard-coded value. So this, I would commonly call this a guard clause because it's a case that's beyond the common case we have. So we guard for it. And normally, I would suggest that goes at the top of the function. It doesn't have to, but there's a, something to be thinking about. We could, we could uh, bet, is this going to pass or not? Is this going to pass? For Maybe sure, we right? We'll find it. out. Woo! Wonderful. So this is really simple, and a lot of you might be saying, well, why don't we just solve the whole problem? And the, the reason I do it this way is because we're not trying to learn how to solve this problem quickly. We're trying to learn how to interact as a group. You know, there will be times when we'll say, let's get to the solution quickly, but right now we're just trying to see what it's like to interact as a group. I want everybody to be paying attention to how do you feel as we go. Let's get to this one. A five is going to turn into a V. Okay, so let's make a test. Test case for it first. Yes. Now I have the habit of always saying whether I expect a test to pass or fail just before I run it. Because if you get a, a passing test the first time out, you probably didn't write a very useful test. But this we expected to fail, and it sure did. And how would you like to solve for it? Um, we can continue writing another if statement, yes. So while they're doing that, what is the right number of ifs to have in a method? What would somebody say? Appropriate number of ifs, zero. We're going to get there if we're here long enough. All righty, so it's passing. This is going awfully fast. Let's go ahead and do sick. Yeah, let's give them a hand. <laughs> Particularly Lynn and Yanka. This is the first time they've ever done this, and they're doing marvelously. Now, let's solve that the simplest way we can, and then we'll look for problems that we need to refactor. OK, so 6 e, uh, returns our, as we i. Let's make a test for that. It's a, a yes. This, again, it seems like such a simple exercise, but it's a good way to get used to this interaction. Yes. And as expected, failing. That's super good. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, do we start to see a pattern here? Um, let's make, Leah, let's do one more, one more case if, if for six. Brilliant. So there's our timer. So that should pass. Let's rotate. And now we're at a junction. 
because we have another kind of duplication happening. So Lynn, you're going to navigate this. Uh, I'm going to explain what I see as the problem, and I'm going to let you think about how you might want to solve it. I want everyone here, including the, the, the observers, pay attention to how you feel about what's happening in front of us. Okay, the duplication is happening here. This is my observation. We're handling five, which is represented by a V, on line 11, and we're handling five, which is represented by a V, on line 14. I see that as duplication. You kind of see that? We're handling the same thing twice. Again, we're handling an I on line 14, and we're also handling a line on maybe an I on line five, maybe. Can you show that, Laura? A line up above line five? Yeah, and we're handling, handling I's again. So we're handling the same problem twice, and that's duplication. So when I was first taught test driven development, you, you do the simplest thing you can, and then you look for a way to um, look for a way to get rid of the code smells. You understand code smells, I hope. The, the, the things that indicate there might be a problem. And I was taught duplication was the big one to watch for, so that's what this is about. There are some more that I think are even more important now, but that's what we need to deal with. So I'm gonna give you a chance to think about that and then uh, come, come up with some kind of an idea. What do you think we can do to, re well, we already removed the duplication of checking for one, two, and three, and now we've got to figure out things like six, seven, eight, and so on. Give it a thought. Can we assign V for something? You get to decide what to try. And you can do it out loud so everyone can hear. Um, yeah. But first of all, yeah. I, I take the role of the nine years old that you... Uh, You'll be the nine-year-old. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> I love this. I so as a nine-year-old... They are, the nine-year-old is free to think any way they want to. But when we become adults, we constrain our thinking. We have need to release the inner nine-year-old, which most of us have trouble, I have trouble doing. So, what would you like to try? So, I see that in the... Can you hold that up to um, you? I see the light 10, 11, so five would be V. So, light six, uh, I mean, um, light 13 and 14. That return V, um, VI, that V can be assigned to something. So it can become like a common uh, variable. I love what you just said. That V could be assigned to something, so it becomes commonly useful outside of lines 10 through 12. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I would call that an accumulator. You might have a different terminology you would use, because I'm pretty antique in my terminology. but. Can we fulfill that? Let's start with that. Um, so we can make a variable, like a, a constant. Um, I haven't come up with a proper um, solution, but, but that's the direction We'll learn by experimenting, to, yeah. right? So, so line th three and a half, that's where you would put the accumulator. Yeah. Um, say... V I, I don't know what the keyword const does. What does the keyword const do? Um, so I think you have variables. Um, and that's a variable? It is a variable. Okay. But it, it doesn't move. Um, like <laughs> human, <laughs> bear with me. Yeah, so uh, this is the, um, yeah, to, what do you think? I can't. Can don't I worry, you just, help? you just, you're, lo you're coding out loud, and that's perfectly fine. Um, V, like a letter V. No, that one V is fine. And then we put it to big letter V. Does it make sense? That's up to you. Nobody's going to guide you. You can't. People they're not going to help. Sure. Don't help. Okay. <laughs> um, and then probably we have to write some instead of if uh, in the line 10 or I think 12 maybe. Uh, can we go down a little bit? Hmm. Mm. I think instead of if that we can do some uh, decrement in the in the number six instead of that six we can do. Um, 
can we do like v plus one? Uh, no, I, I think in the if, but I might be wrong. The line number 15 instead of number six. Human, give me some courage. <laughs> like, I don't think that I'm the best coder in here, but I, I'm probably one of the bravest. <laughs> so I, first of yeah. all, we need to encourage Lynn. She's giving us a gift right now. That's the gift of seeing someone thinking out loud. And we often don't allow that to happen because it's very vulnerable. That you're brave enough to do that shows something about your character. That you're willing to think out loud when you don't know what to do. This is very valuable to us right now. So let's watch this happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe we hit control save and see what happened. I don't know. <laughs> so there is our, um, yeah. there's our timer, so we rotate. So now we're going to change our rules a little bit. We've been doing a coding dojo. And we started with David as the first navigator. And now he's back again, so we're going to change it. Let's see how our time is doing. I think we're kind of right. we got about a half hour to open this out to more of what I would call mob programming. With mob programming, the observers aren't forced to be quiet. I had to do that when I would do user groups with this, because otherwise everybody's shouting out their instructions. Go left. No, go right. Go straight. You know, we're going to get in an accident. We don't want to get in an accident. You would be, it'd be terrible to see that happen here. But now we're going to make it where it's more possible. But I want to ask an observation. When we were stumbling through things, how did that make you feel? How did it make you feel? Not so good. Can you put a word on that feeling? Anxious. Let's hear a couple more words. Frustrated. Mad. Okay, so I am the most easily frustrated, most anxious person you'll ever work with. I am just so, but when you're going to work with other people, you need to learn how to maintain a calm patience, not a kind of patience. So the purpose of the coding dojo for us was to have a calm way to learn together and we did this for six months before we even stumbled upon the idea of actually working this way. And we learned how to keep our mouths shut and be calm about it. So that otherwise we're shouting out instructions and we're going to get in an accident. So we're going to change it to mob programming because the very first day we did mob programming, we'd been doing something like this coding dojo once a week for three hours every Friday, just on simple exercises of things the team wanted to learn about. And after that, we, somebody came to the, one of our team members came to the rest of the team and said, I'm working on something that I'm really having trouble with. Can we all get together and give me some ideas of what to do? We all got together in a room. We looked up at the, she started showing us the code. This person who is showing us the code was the team lead when they hired me, they, she asked for me to come interview because she didn't want to become the manager of the team. They needed to hire a manager. She didn't want to be promoted to being a manager. She wanted to keep coding. So she came and said, Woody, would you please uh, apply for this job and you could become our manager? So she was the top person on the team and she was working on something that was too difficult. So she brought the team together. We started looking at it and almost immediately, somebody looked at the code and said, could you scroll down through that method? This is them scrolling down on their mouse. Could you scroll a little more? Could you scroll some more? What's wrong with that method? Shout it out. Too long. Nowadays, we think 8, 10, 12 lines is a long method. Used to be maybe 50. But in my day, it's been 20 or so, a screen's worth of lines. So that person stood up and said, let's just refactor this. Because we were learning this thing called read by refactoring. Now, that wasn't called that in those days. But what it basically means, instead of trying to read a mess, just start refactoring it. It will clean itself up, and then you'll understand it. So we started refactoring it. And it was exactly this process. We started following the coding dojo. But instead of limiting it to one person, so. David might say, well, let's extract out this block. 
and we extract it out using the automatic tool that you get with Java or whatever. And it comes, but it comes with some weird parameters. And somebody else on the team said, wait a second, we don't want to pass all that stuff around. They started interjecting instead of having to stay quiet. We automatically knew we were there to help each other. That's what this is about, is collaborating. And this happened for us automatically, but we had learned to keep our mouths shut unless it's meaningful for us to speak. And I think if we hadn't been practicing that, mob programming would never have happened. There was a, a, at least 10 different things that we had been practicing that led us to do this. We didn't invent this. It just happened for us. So now, David, you can accept help from others. We're not necessarily going to make the person uh, navigate in order. We'll still switch the driver every couple minutes. But now anybody can be a navigator at any time. I think right now we'll have David navigate. And I'm going to put this chair back. So whoever's navigating will stand up to navigate. But if they just want to inform David, like maybe they notice something, they can point it out. So now it's not required that you stay quiet. You have to stay quiet. Because the audience isn't part of this, okay? You're just observing. So if you really see something so desperate you just can't control yourself, then we'll get medical help for you. Okay. If you notice somebody sitting next to you and they're biting their lip and it starts a little bit bleeding, you know we have a problem. Okay? Alrighty. So David, I'm going to set your timer and we have exactly a half hour to see how this works. All right, Lena. Let's... Uh, I've been thinking... Um, we can create in the top of the function a, a variable like in the line four, maybe let... Uh, so what's the big idea? Uh, true. Let's create a variable um, that will be like a Roman, for example, and that Roman is going to, we're going to return it at, uh, later. So we are going to work with a variable to build the correct uh, Roman number. So I would put it in these terms. The we have an accumulator that will store the Roman number we're going to return. I think that's what you're saying, David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the accumulator, we are going to manipulate it through the function. And it's going to start being an uh, empty string. Uh, so it's, it's the default value at the beginning. And uh, the one that is failing is six. Yeah. No, sorry, it was seven, true? We, we don't have a failing test as such. What we have is a refactoring period. We're green, right. we can refactor. So let's go back to number six. Yeah. But it's still, we do have a failing test. Well, we do, but we didn't before because we had solved for it. We're refactoring, there should not be any failure. We've allowed it to become a failure. We probably need to get back to green right away. Yeah. Uh, but you can interject yeah. anytime you want. Just put it let's, on the mic. Let's go to to the case number where you used to be a six, let's put back the number six and see that the tests are passing. And uh, you see what we've done here, we've gotten back to a green state. When you're doing refactoring, it's not red, 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 then green again. When we're refactoring, we stay green. They call that green to green. So you write a failing test, you make it pass, now you're going to refactor, you keep it green. Nothing to do with mob programming as such. That's just TDD. So how would you like to deal yeah. with this? I'll put your timer back on. Yeah, the thing I was thinking that it, it will work better if we start to deal with the big numbers first, and then... Uh, so go ahead and guide to do that. Yeah, so if, we, if you co uh, move the lines of, of the case number six uh, to the top of the function, and yes, line number five, that's good. And instead of just returning the number, we will uh, decrement Arabic in the line six and a half. So, sorry, type Arabic. Uh, um, space minus, minus equal Six. Minus yeah, all together minus equal sp space six. And um, the in the next line the Roman is, is going to 
uh, get appended or con concatenated uh, uh, but still we don't want to return it so we, we can remove the return and Roman will be concatenated the um, the well yeah um, Roman plus equal uh, the string well I think it's, it's better to do, deal with uh, you can put the number six in the uh, VI in in Roman uh, but actually the eyes are going to be deal with them later. So right now you could at least prove it's still yeah. passing Let's and see. see if it will, because I don't think it's going to work. We just need, let's get it, let's keep it green. We're not returning Roman ah, that's yet. True. Let's return So Roman we could do that at the bottom. At the yeah. bottom. I'm giving a little more direction because I know how much time we have. I normally wouldn't interfere. I know in the bottom of the function, so if you go to the lines 18 and a half and return Roman there. Run the test. Can you so to error, please? So these are passing and this failing. It's still. Six is, uh, why, why so run, is it? run the test now, please. Yeah. Uh, command save to see if. Still is failing. Uh, what is returning? It is little down there the why it's failing. I have an hypothesis. Uh, you can talk, yeah. Because now we are not okay. anymore in the previous okay. pattern, now everybody can contribute. Isuas, if you could go back to the converter, we're trying to assign to a constant right at the top. So we need to change it to be a let Roman equals something. Instead of const, let's put let. Now that might be obvious to a lot of you, right? But this is sort of the advantage of this. If we're not familiar with it, somebody caught it. Now run okay, the test. What's it saying? Run the test. Let's see what you should show in the terminal. What exactly is uh, failing? Okay, a bit more down. It was the, a bit more. Okay, it's, it's empty string, so it's not entering in the if. Why is not? I think it's because the order of the. We have to refactor the function, and I think it start top big numbers and deal each step. We rotate now. Now, okay, normally, David could just continue uh, navigating. That's up to the team to decide. It's it, it just that whoever's sharing the idea, they're not going to be at the keyboard. But I would say this would be a good time to rotate. And then we'll have Yanka take, take control. So you would stand up, and you're going to navigate. Junk. And David will take the keyboard, and we'll just keep we're rotating the driver. Again, this is not a rule that you need to rotate. This is the way that we worked. I've seen teams do other ways. This is just one way. All right, I was thinking maybe go in a slightly different direction with this and just do a recursive call to it. Uh, like a recursive call and concatenate the result of that. So if, so like the idea is if we're between four and six, if we're five, return five, and then, and everything that's less than four, glue it before, something like that. Ah, oh, God, I don't know how to say it out loud. Um. So I'm, I'm gonna point something out. We have on line um, 10, a case that is going to truncate the code. It will go drop into there and run that, and since Arabic is zero, we're yeah. gonna get kind of nothing back. That's the result we're here, seeing here. So I'm acting as a super uh, uh, compiler or a <laughs> t test runner telling you what's actually happened. So what we need to do is understand what do we need to do with line uh, 10 so that no longer happens. 
and then we can move forward. With, I think your idea is brilliant, and I think that basic concept could work. That's okay. That's okay. Mm. I think we should get, get rid of Roman altogether. Get rid of the let. Uh, no, keep this. Get rid of Roman, and stop returning at it at the end. Like get rid of the variable altogether. The one we added at the top. David, she's telling you something different than what you're inputting. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, and let's um, let's get rid of the return at the bottom because obviously now that's that's no longer going to work. So at the bottom of the function, we're returning Roman. Let's get rid of this. And okay, go back to the top. And now what I'm thinking is something like... Did you run the tests? Every time we make a change, we run the tests. I expect to see a problem here. And you should read what the problem is. Yeah, okay. So make it return six, VI, uh, back on line six. Right. It'll always tell us what we did wrong. We good? Yeah, okay. <sighs> okay, back to green. Okay, so now I think the trick is going to be to make a recursive call. So let's go at the, let's move this block lines four to seven to the bottom of the function. And now, no, 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 no. Okay, let's keep it simple for now. Let's try to see the pattern here. Let's go, let's, instead of doing return vi, let's go return, uh, what's our function called again? Answer, yeah. Let's do return, return answer of um, Arabic minus five. <laughs> And then let's glue a V to the left of that. Are we are our tests passing? I would like to see the terminal a little bit. They're going to be passing in we're, a we're second. We're going to fail for a moment <laughs> while we're changing this one uh, bit. Right. So to the left of this, uh, let's go. Oh, we can do, uh, before that we can just uh, so move the cursor to. Uh, let's go, go answer of five plus answer of this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, let's just glue the strings together. Yeah, okay. We should still be passing. Are we not passing? Why not? What? <laughs> Negative, negative repeat. Is this it? So uh, it, it may not. Be oh, able to why, are we, on why are we? Why are we decrementing Arabic uh, up there on line fourteen? <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> you never wanted to see inside the mind of a programmer, but now you have. And this is something like I feel like this is sort of what we need to get this code into because. With, from what I remembered about Roman numbers, I don't know if I'm allowed to draw on that knowledge for the purpose of this exercise. Do whatever you want. Okay, so, because with, it's like you put the ones you subtract on the left and you put the ones you add on the right. So it's something like, um, need to, if we're less than five, we need to put the eyes on there. And if we're more than five, we need to put those eyes on there, something like that. Can you draw the idea that you have? Maybe. I'm going to tell you something I learned a long time ago. The power of a programmers standing and working at a whiteboard. What a great thing this can be. Or really bad, but we'll see. Okay, so if we're bigger than three. There's our 
timer. It's now, that like doesn't mean this. you have to stop navigating, but we are going to rotate the driver. So I think the question for the team now is, would you like to allow uh, Yanka to continue navigating for a while? In which case, uh, uh, Laura, you would become the driver. Again, a timer isn't necessary. I've worked with teams. We don't use a timer. A timer just how, happened to be how we did our coding dojos, and it grew into our mob programming practice. But I've worked with teams who don't use a timer. You just switch the driver out when somebody says, I don't want to type anymore. Or somebody else says, I'd like to type for a while. That's OK to do. OK, I think I know how we should do this. Let's go like, um, if it's less than five, let's glue the let's call ourselves recursively and do it on the left and add it, concatenate it onto the left. Yeah. So I'd like to hear the bigger picture. We're coding out loud. What's the big picture of what we're trying to do? So the big, big picture is this garbage I drew on the... Okay, so, <laughs> so the big picture is if it's, if it's um, greater than five, we're going to add something. But if it's less than five, we're going to glue gonna it onto the left. To it? So if a three would have a V on it? No, we need to put the block after those ones so that we don't match that. So we need to so, stick that onto the end. So yeah, the bigger picture is something we want to kind of have. In what case would we do this? Four. <laughs> so, and we already have a way of doing four. So I'm going to give a little guidance here. We have a lot of what I would consider duplicate code in here. And that's the big smell I'd be wanting to remove. But we're not going to worry about it. I think if you've got something here you think will work, I'd like to see what happens with it. Let's see what happens. OK, so let's move the if to the bottom of the function, because otherwise we're going to hit the, yeah. And let's move above this bit, maybe, yeah. Or under it, doesn't really matter. OK. And then now we return answer of Arabic minus five plus answer and uh, after the after the because we're concatenating the strings, yeah of five. I'm trying to still not sure how to. This should give us four, and then we can change the stuff after it to be if Arabic is greater than six. Or greater than five. Yeah, yeah, greater than five. Yeah. I was being part of her brain. <laughs> and this should buy us up to eight, which is some progress. Can we take a look uh, at the code that we have up above now? Yeah. So do we still need 10 through 12? Um, we need 10 through 12. We need V. Oh. We're, we're not doing, we don't need seven through nine. All right, so if we run a test for eight, we'll prove it's working correctly for eight. All right, let's go add a test for eight. Right, so we don't, I don't normally write a green test, but I, I'd like to see that this works, but I'm not sure that's really legitimate test driven. I'm sure it is. I'm not an expert. Uh, missing an, uh, yeah. But wherever we're going, I'm loving it. Yeah. So I, I would give you the next problem as your product yeah. owner. Don't do that. So we did eight, and eight goes to that. And so we're going to do nine now, which goes to IX. Can we do 10 first? You want to do 10 first? Because it's the pattern, you add it, like you subtract on the left. So I'm going to point out something here. You are all developers. Tell your product owner what to do. OK? That's what we just demonstrated. It'll be much easier if we do this, she said. So that's what we're doing. Oh, I accidentally got the wrong timer going here. So let, no, let's continue on. I, I, uh, I have a, we're getting near the end timer. That's not like the end of the world, just the end of this session. So we're good. This wasn't her timer. We're good. This was a different timer. Yeah, let's add it. Case for 10. Sorry for the mic breathing, guys. So I want you all to understand, you're not going to rush to put this into LinkedIn. We talked about, like, I now know how to convert Roman numerals. 
That, that's not something you want on your resume. The purpose of doing this simple exercise is so we can see the process. And let's add, add a straightforward case for, for 10. Oh, and we can get rid of 7, 8, 9, because that's no longer needed, I'm sure. So let's, let's, okay, let's add 10 first, then remove that, because otherwise we'll, our, our tests will fail. So just do if Arabic equals 10, uh, return x. Oh, it doesn't matter, I don't think. Well, so this is a good, so there was a point made. Oh, maybe it does. You have to push the button. Maybe it does, I'm sorry. Uh. No, I was asking if we should do the 10 in the bottom because then the logic um, follows. So that's a good feed, that's good information. So we're gonna continue with what was there, see if that passes, move it if we need to. But this is exactly the kind of interchange you want. Everybody's thinking about what's concerns to them and that's what we're doing here. Okay, let's go remove four, four first. So 12 uh, to whatever. No, 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 not this, just uh, the, the, the special case we have for and four. line 12. On line 12 and the next three lines, yeah. I believe we can get rid of this, I think. The, the ifs. How come? The seven, 16 to 18 should be handling that, shouldn't it? Um. Wait, five minus Arabic, I think. So on line 17. Yeah, on line 17, we need to do it, make it five minus Arabic, I think because we're going into negatives. Uh, not this one, the one on the left. So we're having a little bit of trouble communicating. We get used to this. So instead of Arabic minus five, it would be five minus Arabic. So if we say it in a full sentence, then we understand what we're trying to hear. But this is, we're talking about Weo's law. We instantly prove whether the communication happened or not. This still feels Thanks like a hack, that. but uh, sure. Um, we, this is how you code when you're doing it alone. We're just doing it as a team. So there's the timer for rotating the driver. Would somebody else like to, would you like, uh, I think that we're probably to the point where someone else understands how to navigate. So I've got to make a, a learning session out of this. Um, the goal of the next navigator is to continue the idea that we're already trying. If we get to a point where we're starting to see a lot of code smells, we might want to start saying, what can we do differently? But until then, so right now we have a bunch of duplicate, but I think a lot of you can see that we could probably turn a lot of this into a map eventually. There would be ways to get rid of the duplication so we don't have a bunch of ifs. How many ifs are appropriate? What a lot of people see nowadays is one decision per method is more than enough, and we would get there that way. But there's lots of ways to do it. So if you feel good handing off the navigation to someone else, and anyone else can now navigate, it's up to whoever wants to navigate that would do that. Um, I, so, just, I just kind of want to reflect on the code because um, we have already some function, but I'm not sure if we have a good logic here, as I said earlier. And, and just the more we write, it just bugs me a little bit in, in how we structure things. So maybe we can reflect again. Sure. And I can, you can go and... No, just look at it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have first smaller and equal to three, and then we have number 10 right there. I don't think that it's a very good place to put uh, equal to 10 right there. So maybe um, that line 16, yeah, it can go on the way down for now, I think. So we're thinking here of making it kind of just logically ordered. Yeah, just yeah. in that sense. I don't, I'm not recording or re... Right. Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. And... Ah, uh, it's true. Yeah, but um, because it's right in the middle, <laughs> it just bugs me. Um, so yeah. we're making a lot of changes without running any tests. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna probably need to slow down just a little bit. Where does that belong? Yeah, I don't know how people code in team in, in, in reality. So I think I just put my input input. Yeah, right so we, we see this, and is that the right place for that is the question. Um, 
Other team members can interject. Yeah. I think it can go up, but yeah, what do you think? Like um, up one step. Yeah. I, I like to think about it from bigger numbers to less numbers. So, mm, but uh, from bigger to small, I think there's a problem because he keep increasing the number, yeah. and we never have like a. So you you're gonna code like top bottom, true in that sense. So in this case, maybe at line eleven and a half, you would paste that, because the yeah. logic above line now a line fourteen is whatever's passed in. What do we do with this character? And then um, I think that it's a good time to uh, run the tests if you didn't already. So now we just we have the, law, the correct order and at the right place. Half of what coding is is doing things in the right order, right? Am I wrong about that? It's like a lot of it, you just got to do it in the right order. So we've got, <laughs> we've got only uh, seven minutes left, but are we ready to continue on? Do we want to try? something like um, an 11 or a 14? Yes. See what happens? I saw a not yes. Want to write a test for, let's do a test for nine because we still didn't um, deal with nine. Uh, so maybe the, yeah, then fix the line 27 instead. We tested the same thing, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the way. Um, yeah. We say but we should be nine? doing nine we, first. We said, let's, we said nine, yeah. let's do nine first. We can c just control. Because we haven't Z. we haven't coded for and nine yet. Control ship Z. <laughs> yeah. It's better, yeah. 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 Whoever invented these keyboards, they got to <laughs> I want to talk with them. <laughs> I wonder the same thing when I first moved to Finland. Um, well, not just nine. Finnish keyboards. Any keyboard. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. There you go, yeah. The order doesn't matter that much. Yeah. It'll run the tests in some order. Can we see the 31st line? I think it should be good. Yeah, I think it should That's be good. That's all correct. I think we need Shall to we see what do we, how do we want to yes. solve for that. Can we save and see? Oh, okay. And we should be. Can we see, yeah. Now I wonder, what's the logic for nine then? We don't have it. We just added the fact we don't have it. Like the extension, like the extension, something similar. Yeah. No? So David, do you want to navigate? Yeah, I, I can start. OK. I'm just, I'm just typing here. OK. Yep. I guess we don't want the driver it giving guidance. It enters the flow in the number, line number 17, where it's above five, yeah. but it's not 10. So I guess we could create a new if block. Mm, yeah, it can be in the line 12 and a half. Well, let's, let's hard code it first and then think about it. Uh, if arabic equal nine, then return, you know, So this is the way I typically would work. Just get it green and then think about it. Let's return the correct value. Tell her the new value. IX. Let's see the tests. Yeah, but it's true that I start to, to appear some code smells, a lot of duplication, so. I think sooner or later we have to think how to put this code more tighter. Yeah. Um, but it's passing. So I don't know if we should. I think we've think done about, enough coding. Yeah. Because we have four minutes left. Wow, well, we were having fun here. So we'll wrap it up. So here's a problem with this nobody wants to stop until it's done. Yes. Have you ever had it where this has actually happened to me? I'd come home because this is before I was programming for a living, I'd come home and get right to the computer and start programming. And my wife would come in. Uh, we worked together. We owned a business together. So she'd come in and say, I'm going to make some dinner. Oh, great. So then she comes in and says, dinner's ready. And I just keep going. I'll be right there. And then she'll come and say, I'm going up to bed. So it's like three hours later. 
I said, I'll be right up. And I just keep coding. And then she comes downstairs. She says, it's time to go to work. What about dinner? What about sleep? Have you ever had that happen to you? I just didn't even pay attention to the time. I went without dinner. I went without sleep. And now I have to go to work. At least I don't have to get dressed because I'm already ready to go. But this is sort of what happens. We don't want to stop until we get a good stopping spot. But we're going to stop here. All we've been demonstrating is how we can start interacting together. We need to have some techniques to use. We need to have some practices to follow. We need to learn to not talk all the time. We need to learn to talk when it's appropriate to talk. We have to learn not to change. Have you ever heard this saying, change horses in the middle of the stream? I'm not sure exactly where that came from, but the idea is I think if you're taking your wagon across the river and then you're going to change horses in the middle of the stream, not such a good thing to do. And so that's the thing. If we start in an idea, we take it to its logical end. And if we go, this isn't really getting us anywhere, then we try something else. I can see how this will grow for a while, but I also see some patterns developing. I like seeing patterns. So there, we have places to go with this. Now, some of you already know a better solution. But I bet you there's 50 solutions to this. My father used to say, there's a thousand right ways to do anything. We must never think ours is the one right way. And I think that really helps when we're trying to collaborate. I want to give a big hand to our volunteers. Thank you. For you, I have for you a present from Wunder, uh, one back for Lintu and for Janka. Thank There's you. There's two there. <laughs> Woody and Laura, they got theirs before. We that. got ours earlier. Thank you. But so thank you so very much. I've had a wonderful time here. I'm planning on being here, you know, the rest of the evening. If you have questions or want to talk to me or tell me what I'm wrong about, I'm happy to hear any of that. And also, uh, Follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn is really good because I'll follow you back. I, I've already following too pe many people in Twitter. But you can tell me what I meant by what I said. Okay, that would be really helpful to me. So thank you all very much. We can all take a bow. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Okay, yeah, uh, you're all free to go. There is gonna be a bunch of after parties. If you didn't sign up for the official one, join the Slack to find out all about it. And be back here tomorrow at nine. It was a pleasure to be your MC, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.